This is Audible. Brilliance Audio presents the unabridged recording of Dead House Gates by Stephen Erickson, performed by Ralph Lister. This novel is dedicated to two gentlemen, David Thomas Jr., who welcomed me to England with an introduction to a certain agent, and Patrick Walsh, the agent he introduced me to. There's been a lot of faith shown over the years, and I thank you both. Prologue What see you in the horizon's bruised smear that cannot be blotted out by your raised hand? The bridge burners, Tok the Younger. 1163rd year of burned sleep. Ninth year of the rule of Empress Lassine. Year of the Cull. He came shambling into judgment's round from the Avenue of Souls, a misshapen mass of flies. Seething lumps crawled on his body in mindless migration, black and glittering and occasionally falling away in frenzied clumps, that exploded into fragmented flight as they struck the cobbles. The thirsting hour was coming to a close, and the priest staggered in its wake, blind, deaf, and silent. Honouring his god on this day, the servant of Hood, lord of death, had joined his companions in stripping naked and smearing himself in the blood of executed murderers, blood that was stored in great amphorae lining the walls of the temple's nave. The brothers had then moved in procession out onto the streets of Unter to greet the god's sprites, enjoining the mortal dance that marked the season of Rot's last day. The guards lining the round parted to let the priest pass, then parted further for the spinning, buzzing cloud that trailed him. The sky over Unter was still more grey than blue, as the flies that had swept at dawn into the capital of the Malazan Empire now rose, slowly winging out over the bay toward the salt marshes and sunken islands beyond the reef. Pestilence came with the season of rot, and the season had come an unprecedented three times in the past ten years. The air of the round still buzzed, was still speckled as if filled with flying grit. Somewhere in the streets beyond, a dog yelped like a thing near death, but not near enough and close to the round central fountain, the abandoned mule that had collapsed earlier still kicked feebly in the air. Flies had crawled into the beast through every orifice, and it was now bloated with gases. The animal, stubborn by its breed, was now over an hour in dying. As the priest staggered sightlessly past, flies rose from the mule in a swift curtain to join those already enshrouding him. It was clear to Felicin, from where she and the others waited, that the priest of Hood was striding directly toward her. His eyes were ten thousand eyes, but she was certain they were all fixed on her. Yet even this growing horror did little to stir the numbness that lay like a smothering blanket over her mind. She was aware of it rising inside, but the awareness seemed more a memory of fear than fear now alive within her. She barely recalled the first season of rot she'd lived through, but had clear memories of the second one. Just under three years ago, she had witnessed this day secure in the family estate, in a solid house, with its windows shuttered and cloth sealed, with the braziers set outside the doors, and on the courtyard's high, broken glass-rimmed walls, billowing the acrid smoke of his style leaves. The last day of the season and its thirsting hour had been a time of remote revulsion for her, irritating and inconvenient, but nothing more. Then she had given little thought to the city's countless beggars and the stray animals bereft of shelter, or even to the poorer residents who were subsequently press-ganged into clean-up crews for days afterward. The same city, but a different world. Felicin wondered if the guards would make any move toward the priest as he came closer to the cull's victims. She and the others in the line were the charges of the Empress now, Lassine's responsibility, and the priest's path could be seen as blind and random, 
the imminent collision one of chance rather than design, although in her bones Felisa knew differently. Would the helmed guard step forward, seek to guide the priest to one side, lead him safely through the round? I think not, said the man, squatting on her right. His half-closed eyes, buried deep in their sockets, flashed with something that might have been amusement. Seeing you flicking in your gaze, guards to priest, a priest to guards. The big silent man on her left slowly rose to his feet, pulling the chain with him. Felician winced as the shackle yanked at her when the man folded his arms across his bare, scarred chest. He glared at the approaching priest, but said nothing. What does he want with me? Felician asked in a whisper. What have I done to earn a priest of Hood's attention? The squatting man rocked back on his heels, tilting his face into the late afternoon sun. Queen of dreams, is this self-centered youth I hear from those full, sweet lips, or just the usual stance of noble blood around which the universe revolves? Answer me, I pray, fickle queen. Felicen scowled. I felt better when I thought you were asleep, or dead. Dead men, do not squirt, lass. They sprawl. Hood's priest comes not for you, but for me. She faced him then, the chain rattling between them. He looked more of a sunken-eyed toad than a man. He was bald, his face webbed in tattooing, minute, black, square-etched symbols hidden within an overall pattern covering skin like a wrinkled scroll. He was naked but for a ragged loincloth, its dire faded red. Flies crawled all over him. Reluctant to leave, they danced on, but not, Felicin realized, to Hood's bleak orchestration. The tattooed pattern covered the man, the boar's face overlying his own, the intricate maze of script-threaded, curled fur winding down his arms, covering his exposed thighs and shins, and the detailed hooves etched into the skin of his feet. Felicen had, until now, been too self-absorbed, too numb with shock, to pay any attention to her companions in the chain line. This man was a priest of Fena, the boar of summer, and the flies seemed to know it, understand it enough to alter their frenzied motion. She watched with morbid fascination as they gathered at the stumps at the ends of the man's wrists, the old scar tissue the only place on him unclaimed by Fena. But the paths the sprites took to those stumps touched not a single tattooed line. The flies danced a dance of avoidance, but for all that they were eager to dance. The priest of Fena had been ankle-shackled last in the line. Everyone else had the narrow iron bands fastened around their wrists. His feet were wet with blood, and the flies hovered there but did not land. She saw his eyes flick open as the sun's light was suddenly blocked. Hood's priest had arrived. Chain stirred as the man on Felicen's left drew back as far as the links allowed. The war at her back felt hot. The tiles, painted with scenes of imperial pageantry, now slick through the thin weave of her slave tunic. Felicen stared at the fly-shrouded creature standing wordless before the squatting priest of Fena. She could see no exposed flesh, nothing of the man himself. The flies had claimed all of him, and beneath them he lived in darkness, where even the sun's heat could not touch him. The cloud around him spread out now, and Felicen shrank back as countless cold inset legs touched her legs crawling swiftly up her thighs. She pulled her tunic's hem close around her, clamping her legs tight. The priest of Fena spoke, his wide face split into a humorless grin. The thirsting hours, well past, acolyte. Go back to your temple. Hood's servant made no reply, but it seemed the buzzing changed pitch until the music of the wings vibrated in Felicen's bones. The priest's deep eyes narrowed, and his tone shifted. 
Ah, well now. Indeed, I was once a servant of Fena, but no longer, not for years. Fena's touch cannot be scrubbed from my skin. Yet it seems that while the boar of summer has no love for me, he has even less for you. Felicin felt something shiver in her soul as the buzzing rapidly shifted, forming words that she could understand. Secret to show now. Go on, then, the one-time servant of Fena growled. Show me. Perhaps Fena acted then, the swatting hand of a furious god. Felicin would remember the moment and think on it often. Or the secret was the mocking of immortals, a joke far beyond her understanding. But at that moment, the rising tide of horror within her broke free. The numbness of her soul seared away as the flies exploded outward, dispersing in all directions to reveal... No one. The former priest of Fainer flinched as if struck, his eyes wide. From across the round, half a dozen guards cried out, wordless sounds punched from their throats. Chains snapped as others in the line jolted as if to flee. The iron loops set in the wall snatched taut, but the loops held, as did the chains. The guards rushed forward, and the line shrank back into submission. Now, that, the tattooed man shakily muttered, was uncalled for. An hour passed, an hour in which the mystery, shock, and horror of Hood's priest sank down with Infelicin to become but one more lair, the latest but not the last in what had become an unending nightmare. An acolyte of Hood, who was not there. The buzzing of wings that formed words. Was that Hood himself? Felicin thought. Had the Lord of Death come to walk among mortals? And why stand before a once priest of Fainer? What was the message behind the revelation? But slowly the questions faded in her mind, the numbness seeping back, the return of cold despair. The Empress had culled the nobility, stripped the houses and families of their wealth, followed by a summary accusation and conviction of treason that had ended in chains. As for the ex-priest on her right, and the huge bestial man with all the makings of a common criminal on her left, clearly neither one could claim noble blood. She laughed softly, startling both men. Has Hood's secret revealed itself to you then, lass? the ex-priest asked. No. What do you find so amusing? She shook her head. I'd expected to find myself in good company, she thought. How's that for an upturned thought? There you have it. The very attitude the peasants hungered to tear down. The very same fuel the Empress has touched to flame. Child! The voice was that of an aged woman, still haughty but with the air of desperate yearning. Felicin closed her eyes briefly then straightened and looked along the line to the gaunt old woman beyond the thug. The woman was wearing her nightclothes, torn and smeared. With noble blood, no less, Felicin thought. Lady Gayson! The old woman reached out a shaking hand. Yes, the wife to Lord Hillrack, I am Lady Gayson! The words came as if she'd forgotten who she was, and now she frowned through the cracked makeup covering her wrinkles and her red shot eyes fixed on Felicin. I know you, she hissed. House of Paran, youngest daughter of Felicin. Felicin went cold. She turned away and stared straight ahead, out into the compound where the guards stood leaning on pikes, passing flasks of ale between them and waving away the last of the flies. A cart had arrived for the mule, four ash-smeared men clambering down from its bed with ropes and gaffs. Beyond the walls encircling the round rose Unter's painted spires and domes. 
She longed for the shadowed streets between them, longed for the pampered life of a week ago. Seabury barking harsh commands at her as she led her favourite mare through her paces. And she would look up as she guided the mare in a delicate, precise turn, to see the row of green-leafed leadwoods separating the riding ground from the family vineyards. Beside her, the thug grunted. <laughs> Hood's feet! The bitch has some sense of humour! Which bitch? Felicin wondered, but she managed to hold her expression even as she lost the comfort of her memories. The ex-priest stirred. Sisterly, spat, is it? He paused, then dryly added, Seems a bit extreme. The thug grunted again and leaned forward, his shadow draping Felicin. Defrocked priest, are you? Not like the Empress to do any temples a favour. She didn't. My loss of piety was long ago. I'm sure the Empress would rather I'd stayed in the cloister. As if she'd care, the thug said derisively as he settled back into his pose. Lady Gayson rattled. You must speak with her, Felician. An appeal. I have rich friends. The thug's grunt turned into a bark. Farther up the line, hag. That's where you'll find your rich friends. Felician just shook her head. Speak with her. It's been months. Not even when father died. A silence followed, dragging on approaching the silence that had existed before this spate of babble. But then the ex-priest cleared his throat, spat, and muttered, Not worth looking for salvation in a woman who's just following orders, lady. Never mind that one being this girl's sister. Felicin winced, then glared at the ex-priest. You presume? He ain't presuming nothing growled the thug. Forget what's in the blood. What's supposed to be in it by your slant on things? This is the work of the Empress. Maybe you think it's personal. Maybe you have to think that, being what you are. What I am? Felicin laughed harshly. What house claims you as kin? The thug grinned. Mm. The house of shame. What of it? Yours ain't looking any less shabby. As I thought, Felicin said, ignoring the truth of his last observation with difficulty. She glowered at the guards. What's happening? Why are we just sitting here? The ex-priest spat again. Their thirsting hours passed. The mob outside needs organising. He glanced up at her from under the shelf of his brows. The peasants need to be roused. We're the first girl, and the example's got to be established. What happens here in Unter is going to rattle every noble born in the Empire. Nonsense! Lady Gayson snapped. We shall be well treated. The Empress shall have to treat us well. The thug grunted a third time. What passed for laughter, Felicen realised, and said, If stupidity was a crime, lady, you would have been arrested years ago. The ogre's right. Not many of us are going to make it to the slave ships. This parade down Colonnade Avenue is going to be one long bloodbath. Mind you, he added, eyes narrowing on the guards. Old Boda ain't going to be torn apart by any mob of peasants. Felicin felt real fear stirring in her stomach. She fought off a shiver. Mind if I stay in your shadow, Boda? The man looked down at her. You're a bit plump for my tastes. He turned away, then added, But you do what you like. The ex-priest leaned close. 
thinking on it, girl, this rivalry of yours ain't in the league of tattletales and scratch fights. Likely your sister wants to be sure you... She's adjunct to Vore, Felice and cut in. She's not my sister anymore. She renounced our house at the call of the Empress. Even so, I've an inkling it's still personal. Felice scowled. How would you know anything about it? The man made a slight ironic bow. Thief once, then priest, now historian. I well know the tense position the nobility finds itself in. Felicin's eyes slowly widened, and she cursed herself for her stupidity. Even Bodin, who could not have helped overhearing, leaned forward for a searching stare. Heboric, he said. Heboric light touch. Hibaric raised his arms. As light as ever. You wrote that revised history, Felicen said. Committed treason. Hibaric's wiry brows rose in mock alarm. Gods forbid. A philosophic divergence of opinions. Nothing more. Lyca's own words at the trial. In my defence. Faina bless him. But the Empress wasn't listening, Bodin said, grinning. After all, you called her a murderer, and then had the gall to say she bungled the job. Found an illicit copy, did you? Bodin blinked. In any case, Hiboric continued to Felicin, It's my guess, your sister, the adjunct, plans on your getting to the slave ships, in one piece, your brother disappearing on Genabacus took the life out of your father. So I've heard, he added, grinning. But it was the rumours of treason that put spurs to your sister, wasn't it? Clearing the family name and all that. You make it sound reasonable, Hiboric. Felicen said, hearing the bitterness in her voice, but not caring any more. We differed in our opinions, Tavori and I, and now you see the result. Your opinions of what, precisely? She did not reply. There was a sudden stirring in the line. The guards straightened and swung to face the round's west gate. Felicen paled as she saw her sister. Adjunct Tavori now, heir to Lorne, who had died in Darugistan. Ride up on her stallion, a beast bred out of Paran's stables, no less. Beside her was the ever-present Tamba, a beautiful young woman whose long, tawny mane gave substance to her name. Where she'd come from was anyone's guess, but she was now Tavori's personal aide. Behind these two rode a score of officers and a company of heavy cavalry the soldiers looking exotic, foreign. Touch of irony, Hiboric muttered, eyeing the horse soldiers. Bodin jutted his head forward and spat. Red swords, the bloodless bastards. The historian threw the man an amused glance. Travelled well in your profession, Bodin? Seen the sea walls of Arran, have you? The man shifted uneasily, then shrugged. Stood a deck or two in my time, Ogre. Besides, he added, the rumour of them's been in the city a week or more. There was stirring from the Red Sword troop, and Felicen saw mailed hands close on weapon grips, peaked helms turning as one toward the adjunct. Sister Tavora, did our brother's disappearance cut you so deep? How great is failing, you must imagine, to seek this recompense. And then, to make your loyalty absolute, you chose between me and mother for the symbolic sacrifice. Didn't you realise that Hood stood on the side of both choices? At least mother is with her beloved husband now. 
She watched as Tavora scanned her guard briefly, then said something to Tamba, who edged her own mount toward the east gate. Bodin grunted one more time. Look lively. The endless hour's about to begin. It was one thing to accuse the Empress of murder. It was quite another to predict her next move. If only they'd heeded my warning. Hibaric winced as they shuffled forward, the shackles cutting hard against his ankles. People of civilized countenance made much of exposing the soft underbellies of their psyche. A feet and sensitive were the brands of finer breeding. It was easy for them, safe, and that was the whole point after all. A statement of coddled opulence that burned the throats of the poor more than any ostentatious show of wealth. Hibaric had said as much in his treatise, and could now admit a bitter admiration for the Empress and for Adjunct Tavora, Lassine's instrument in this. The excessive brutality of the midnight arrests, doors battered down, families dragged from their beds amidst wailing servants, provided the first layer of shock. Dazed by sleep deprivation, the nobles were trussed up and shackled, forced to stand before a drunken magistrate and a jury of beggars dragged in from the streets. It was a sour and obvious mockery of justice that stripped away the few remaining expectations of civil behaviour, stripped away civilization itself, leaving nothing but the chaos of savagery. Shock led on shock, Hiboric thought. A rending of those fine underbellies. Tavora knew her own kind, knew their weaknesses, and was ruthless in exploiting them. What could drive a person to such viciousness? The poor folk mobbed the streets when they heard the details, screaming adoration for their empress. Carefully triggered riots, looting and slaughter followed raging through the noble district, hunting down those few selected highborns who hadn't been arrested, enough of them to wet the mob's bloodlust, give them faces to focus on with rage and hate. Then followed the reimposition of order, lest the city take flame. The Empress made few mistakes. She had used the opportunity to round up malcontents and unaligned academics, to close the fist of military presence on the capital, drumming the need for more troops, more recruits, more protection against the treasonous scheming of the noble class. The seized assets paid for this martial expansion. An exquisite move, even if forewarned, rippling out with the force of imperial decree through the empire, the cruel rage now sweeping through each city. Bitter admiration. Hibaric kept finding the need to spit, something he hadn't done since his cut-purse days in the mouse quarter of Mala City. He could see the shock written on most of the faces in the chain line. Faces above nightclothes, mostly, grimy and filthy from the pits, leaving their wearers bereft of even the social armour of regular clothing. Dishevelled hair, stunned expressions, broken poses, everything the mob beyond the round lusted to see, hungered to flail. Welcome to the streets, Hibaric thought to himself as the guards prodded the line into motion, the adjunct looking on, straight in her high saddle, her thin face drawn in until nothing but lines remained. The slit of her eyes, the brackets around her uncurved, almost lipless mouth. Damn, but she wasn't born with much, was she? The looks went to her young sister, to the lass stumbling a step ahead of him. Habaric's eyes fixed on adjunct Tavora, curious, seeking something. A flicker of malicious pleasure, maybe, as her icy gaze swept the line and lingered for the briefest of moments on her sister. But the pause was all she revealed. Her recognition acknowledged, nothing more. The gaze swept on. The guards opened the east gate two hundred paces ahead, near the front of the chained line. A roar poured through that ancient arched passageway, a wave of sound that buffeted soldier and prisoner alike. 
bouncing off the high walls and rising up amidst an explosion of terrified pigeons from the upper eaves. The sound of flapping wings drifted down like polite applause, although to Haboric, it seemed that he alone appreciated that ironic touch of the gods. Not to be denied a gesture, he managed a slight bow. Hood, keep his damned secrets. Here, Vayner, you old sow, it's that itch I could never scratch. Look on now, closely. See what becomes of your wayward son. Some part of Felicen's mind held on to sanity, held with a brutal grip in the face of a maelstrom. Soldiers lined Colonnade Avenue in ranks three deep, but again and again the mob seemed to find weak spots in that bristling line. She found herself observing, clinically, even as hands tore at her, fists pummeled her, blurred faces lunged at her with gobs of spit. And even as sanity held within her, so too a pair of steady arms encircled her, arms without hands, the ends scarred and suppurating, arms that pushed her forward, ever forward. No one touched the priest, no one dared, while ahead was Baudin, more horrifying than the mob itself. He killed effortlessly. He tossed bodies aside with contempt, roaring, gesturing, beckoning. Even the soldiers stared beneath their ridged helmets, heads turning at his taunts, hands tightening on pike or sword hilt. Baudin, laughing Baudin, his nose smashed by a well-flung brick, stones bouncing from him, his slave tunic in rags and soaked with blood and spit. Every body that darted within his reach, he grasped, twisted, bent and broke. The only pause in his stride came when something happened ahead, some breach in the soldiery, or when Lady Gayson faltered. He'd grasp her arms under the shoulders, none too gently, then propel her forward, swearing all the while. A wave of fear swept ahead of him, a touch of the terror inflicted turning back on the mob. The number of attackers diminished, although the bricks flew in a constant barrage, some hitting, most missing. The march through the city continued. Felicin's ears rang painfully. She heard everything through a daze of sound, but her eyes saw clearly seeking and finding, all too often, images she would never forget. The gates were in sight when the most savage breach occurred. The soldiers seemed to melt away, and the tide of fierce hunger swept into the street, engulfing the prisoners. Felicin caught Hiborok's grunting words close behind her as he shoved hard. This is the one, then. Bodin roared. Bodies crowded in, Hands tearing, nails clawing. Felicin's last shreds of clothing were torn away. A hand closed on a fistful of her hair, yanked savagely, twisting her head around, seeking the crack of vertebrae. She heard screaming and realised it came from her own throat. A bestial snarl sounded behind her, and she felt the hand clench spasmodically. Then it was gone. More screaming filled her ears. A strong momentum caught them, pulling or pushing. She couldn't tell, and Hibaric's face came into view, spitting bloody skin from his mouth. All at once, a space cleared around Baudin. He crouched, a torrent of dock curses bellowing from his mashed lips. His right ear had been torn off, taking with it hair, skin and flesh. The bone of his temple glistened wetly. Broken bodies lay around him, few moving. At his feet was Lady Gayson. Baudin held her by the hair, pulling her face into view. The moment seemed to freeze, the world closing in to this single place. Baudin bared his teeth and laughed. I'm no whimpering noble, he growled, facing the crowd. What do you want? You want the blood of a noble woman? The mob screamed, reaching out eager hands. Baudin laughed again. <laughs> we pass through. You hear me? <laughs> he straightened, dragging Lady Gayson's head upward. Felicen couldn't tell if the old woman was conscious, 
Her eyes were closed, the expression peaceful, almost youthful, beneath the smeared dirt and bruises. Perhaps she was dead. Felicen prayed that it was so. Something was about to happen, something to condense this nightmare into a single image. Tension held the air. She's yours! Bodas screamed. With his other hand grasping the lady's chin, he twisted her head around. The neck snapped and the body sagged, twitching. Bodar wrapped a length of chain around her neck. He pulled it taut, then began sawing. Blood showed, making the chain look like a mangled scarf. Felicin stared in horror. Faina, have mercy, Herboric breathed. The crowd was stunned silent, withdrawing even in their bloodlust, shrinking back. A soldier appeared, helmetless, his young face white, his eyes fixed on Bodin, his steps ceasing. Beyond him the glistening peaked helms and broad blades of the red swords flashed above the crowd as the horsemen slowly pushed their way toward the scene. No movement save the sawing chain. No breath save Bodin's grunting snorts. Whatever riot continued to rage beyond this place, it seemed a thousand leagues away. Felicin watched the woman's head jerk back and forth, a mockery of life's animation. She remembered Lady Gayson, haughty, imperious, beyond her years of beauty, and seeking stature in its stead. What other choice? Many. But it didn't matter now. Had she been a gentle, kindly grandmother, it would not have mattered, would not have changed the mind-numbing horror of this moment. The head came away with a sobbing sound. Bonin's teeth glimmered as he stared at the crowd. We had a deal, he grated. Here's what you want, something to remember this day by. He flung Lady Gayson's head into the mob, a whirl of hair and threads of blood. Screams answered its unseen landing. More soldiers appeared, backed by the red swords, moving slowly, pushing at the still silent onlookers. Peace was being restored all along the line, in all places but this one violently, without quarter. As people began to die under sword strokes, the rest fled. The prisoners who had filed out of the arena had numbered around three hundred. Felicin, looking up the line, had her first sight of what remained. Some shackles held only forearms, others were completely empty. Under a hundred prisoners remained on their feet. Many on the paving stones writhed, screaming in pain. The rest did not move at all. Baudin glared at the nearest knot of soldiers. Likely timing, tinheads! Heboric spat heavily, his face twisting as he glared at the thug. Imagine you'd buy your way out, did you, Baudin? Give them what they want. But it was wasted, wasn't it? The soldiers were coming. She could have lived. Baudin slowly turned, his face a sheet of blood. To what end, priest? Was that your line of reasoning? She would have died in the hold anyway? Bonar showed his teeth and said slowly, I just hate making deals with bastards. Felicin stared at the three-foot length of chain between herself and Bodin. A thousand thoughts could have followed link by link. What she had been, what she was now. The prison she had discovered inside and out merged as vivid memory. But all she thought, all she said was this. Don't make any more deals, Bota. His eyes narrowed on her, her words and tone reaching him somehow, some way. Heboric straightened, a hard look in his eyes as he studied her. Felicin turned away, half in defiance, half in shame. A moment later the soldiers, having cleared the line of the dead, pushed them along, out through the gate, onto the east road toward the pier town called Luckless. 
where adjunct Tavora and her retinue waited, as did the slave ships of Arun. Farmers and peasants lined the road, displaying nothing of the frenzy that had gripped their cousins in the city. Felicin saw in their faces a dull sorrow, a passion born of different scars. She could not understand where it came from, and she knew that her ignorance was the difference between her and them. She also knew, in her bruises, scratches, and helpless nakedness, that her lessons had begun. Book One Raraku He swam at my feet, powerful arms in broad strokes sweeping the sand. So I asked this man, What seas do you swim? And to this he answered, I have seen shells and the like on this desert floor, so I swim this land's memory, thus honouring its past. Is the journey far? queried I. I cannot say, he replied, for I shall drown long before I am done. Sayings of the Fool, Thenis Buell Chapter One And all came to imprint their passage on the path, to send to the dry winds their cloying claim to ascendancy. The Path of Hands, Mesremb 1,164th year of Burns' sleep, 10th year of the rule of Empress Lassine, the 6th in the 7 years of Dreijna, the Apocalyptic. A corkscrew plume of dust raced across the basin, heading deeper into the trackless desert of the Panpotsen Odhan. Though less than 2,000 paces away, it seemed a plume born of nothing. From his perch on the mesa's wind-scarred edge, Mapo Runt followed it with relentless eyes the color of sand, eyes set deep in a robustly boned, pallid face. He held a wedge of emrag cactus in his bristle-backed hand, unmindful of the envenomed spikes as he bit into it. Juices dribbled down his chin, staining it blue. He chewed slowly, thoughtfully. Beside him, Icarium flicked a pebble over the cliff edge. It clicked and clattered on its way down to the boulder-strewn base. Under the ragged spirit walker robe, its orange faded to dusty rust beneath the endless sun. His grey skin had darkened into olive green, as if his father's blood had answered this wasteland's ancient call. His long braided black hair dripped black sweat onto the bleached rock. Mappo pulled a mangled thorn from between his front teeth. Your dye's running, he observed, eyeing the cactus blade a moment before taking another bite. Icarium shrugged. Doesn't matter anymore. Not out here. My blind grandmother wouldn't have swallowed your disguise. There were narrow eyes on us in early tan. I felt them crawling on my back, day and night. Tanos are mostly short and bow-legged, after all. Mappo pulled his gaze away from the dust cloud and studied his friend. Next time, he grunted, try belonging to a tribe where everyone's seven foot tall. Hikarium's lined, weather-worn face twitched into something like a smile, just a hint, before resuming its placid expression. Those who would know of us in seven cities surely know of us now. Those who would not might wonder at us, but that is all they will do. Squinting against the glare, he nodded at the plume. What do you see, Mappo? A flat head, long neck, black and hairy all over. If just that, I might be describing one of my uncles. But there's more. One leg up front and two in back. Ikarium tapped the bridge of his nose, thinking... So, not one of your uncles, an Aptorian? Mappo slowly nodded. The Convergence is months away. I'd guess Shadow Throne caught a whiff of what's coming, sent out a few scouts. And this one? Mappo grinned, exposing massive canines. A tad too far afield. Shaikh's pet now. 
He finished off the cactus, wiped his spatulate hands, then rose from his crouch. Arching his back, he winced. There had been, unaccountably, a mass of roots beneath the sand under his bedroll the night just passed, and now the muscles to either side of his spine matched every knot and twist of those treeless bones. He rubbed at his eyes. A quick scan down the length of his body displayed for him the tattered, dirt-crusted state of his clothes. He sighed. It's said there's a waterhole out there somewhere. With Shaikh's army camped around it. Mappo grunted. Ikarium also straightened, noting once again the sheer mass of his companion, big even for a trell, the shoulders broad and maned in black hair, the sinewy muscles of his long arms, and the thousand years that capered like a gleeful goat behind Mappo's eyes. Can you track it? If you like, Ikarium grimaced. How long have we known each other, friend? Mappo's glance was sharp, then he shrugged. Long? Why do you ask? I know reluctance when I hear it. The prospect disturbs you? Any potential brush with demons disturbs me, Ikarium. Shy as a hare is Mappo Trell. I am driven by curiosity. I know. The unlikely pair turned back to their small campsite tucked between two towering spires of wind-sculpted rock. There was no hurry. Ikarium sat down on a flat rock and proceeded to oil his longbow, striving to keep the hornwood from drying out. Once satisfied with the weapon's condition, he turned to his single-edged long sword, sliding the ancient weapon from its bronze-banded boiled leather scabbard, then setting an oiled whetstone to its notched edge. Mappo struck the hide tent, folding it haphazardly before stuffing it into his large leather bag. Cooking utensils followed, as did the bedding. He tied the drawstrings and hefted the bag over one shoulder, then glanced to where Ikarium waited, bow rewrapped and slung across his back. Ikarium nodded, and the two of them, half-blood Jaghut and full-blood Trell, began on the path leading down into the basin. Overhead, the stars hung radiant, casting enough light down onto the basin to tinge its cracked pan silver. The bloodflies had passed with the vanishing of the day's heat, leaving the night to the occasional swarm of cape moths and the bat-like reason lizards that fed on them. Mapo and Icarium paused for a rest in the courtyard of some ruins. The mud-brick walls had all but eroded away, leaving nothing but shin-high ridges laid out in a geometric pattern around an old, dried-up well. The sand covering the courtyard's tiles was fine and windblown, and seemed to glow faintly to Mappo's eyes. Twisted brush clung with fisted roots along its edges. The Panpots and Odhan and the Holy Desert Raraku that flanked it to the west were both home to countless such remnants from long-dead civilizations. In their travels, Mappo and Ikarim had found high tells, flat-topped hills built up of layer upon layer of city, situated in a rough procession over a distance of fifty leagues between the hills and the desert, clear evidence that a rich and thriving people had once lived in what was now dry, wind-blasted wasteland. From the holy desert had emerged the legend of Drajna the Apocalyptic, Mappo wondered if the calamity that had befallen the city-dwellers in this region had, in some way, contributed to the myth of a time of devastation and death. Apart from the occasional abandoned estate, such as the one they now rested in, many ruins showed signs of a violent end. His thoughts finding familiar ruts, Mappo grimaced. Not all pass can be laid at our feet, and we are no closer here and now, than we've ever been, nor have I any reason to disbelieve my own words. He turned away from those thoughts as well. Near the courtyard center stood a single column of pink marble, pitted and grooved on one side, where the winds borne out in Raraku blew unceasingly toward the Panpotsen hills. The pillars opposite side still retained the spiral patterning carved there by long-dead artisans. 
Upon entering the courtyard, Ikarium had walked directly to the six-foot-high column, examining its sides. His grunt told Mappo he had found what he had been looking for. And this one? the trell asked, setting his leather sack down. Ikarium came over, wiping dust from his hands. Down near the base, a scattering of tiny clawed hands. The Seekers are on the trail. Rats? More than one set? Divers, Ikarium agreed, nodding. Now, who might that be, I wonder? Probably Grillum. Hmm, unpleasant. Ikarium studied the flat plain stretching into the west. There will be others, soul taken and divers both. Those who feel near to ascendancy and those who are not yet seek the path nonetheless. Mappo sighed, studying his old friend. Faint dread stirred within him. Divers and soul taken, the twin curses of shape-shifting, the fever for which there is no cure. Gathering, here in this place. Is this wise, Ikarium? he asked softly. In seeking your eternal goal, we find ourselves walking into a most disagreeable convergence. Should the gates open, we shall find our passage contested by a host of bloodthirsty individuals all eager in their belief that the gates offer ascendancy. If such a pathway exists, Ikarium said, his eyes still on the horizon, then perhaps I shall find my answers there as well. Answers are no benediction, friend, Mappo thought. Trust me in this, please. You have still not explained to me what you will do once you have found them. Ikarium turned to him with a faint smile. I am my own curse, Mappo. I have lived centuries, yet what do I know of my own past? Where are my memories? How can I judge my own life? without such knowledge. Some would consider your curse a gift, Mappo said, a flicker of sadness passing across his features. I do not. I view this convergence as an opportunity. It might well provide me with answers. To achieve them, I hope to avoid drawing my weapons. But I shall, if I must. The trail sighed a second time and rose from his crouch. You may be tested in that resolve soon, friend. He faced southwest. There are six desert wolves on our trail. Ikarium unwrapped his antlered bow and strung it in a swift, fluid motion. Desert wolves never hunt people. No, Mappo agreed. It was another hour before the moon would rise. He watched Ikarium lay out six long, stone-tipped arrows, then squinted out into the darkness. Cold fear crept along the nape of his neck. The wolves were not yet visible, but he felt them all the same. They are six, but they are one. Divers. Better it would have been a soul taken, Mappo thought. Veering into a single beast is unpleasant enough, but into many... Ikarium frowned. One of power, then, to achieve the shape of six wolves. Do you know who it might be? I have a suspicion, Mappo said quietly. They fell silent, waiting. Half a dozen tawny shapes appeared out of a gloom that seemed of its own making, less than thirty strides away. At twenty paces, the wolves spread out into an open half-circle facing Mappo and Ikarium. The spicy scent of divers filled the still night air. One of the lithe beasts edged forward, then stopped as Ikarium raised his bow. Not six, Ikarium muttered, but one. I know him, Mappo said. A shame he can't say the same of us. He is uncertain. But he's taken a blood-spilling form. Tonight, Rylandarus hunts in the desert. 
Does he hunt us, or something else, I wonder? Ikarium shrugged. Who shall speak first, Mappo? Me, the Trell replied, taking a step forward. This would require guile and cunning. A mistake would prove deadly. He pitched his voice low and wry. Long way from home, aren't we? Your brother Treach had it in mind that he killed you. Where was that chasm? Dalhon? Or was it Li Hang? You were divers jackals then, I seem to recall. Rylandara spoke inside their minds, a voice cracking and halting with disuse. I am tempted to match wits with you and Trell before killing you. I might not be worth it, Mappo replied easily. With the company I've been keeping, I'm as out of practice as you, Rylandarus. The lead wolf's bright blue eyes flicked to Akarium. I have little wits to match, the jacket half-blood said softly, his voice barely carrying. And I am losing patience. Foolish. Charm is all that can save you. Tell me, Bowman, do you surrender your life to your companions, Wiles? Ikarim shook his head. Of course not. I share his opinion of himself. Rylandara seemed confused. A matter of expedience, then. The two of you travelling together. Companions without trust, without confidence in each other. The stakes must be high. I am getting bored, Mappo, Ikarium said. The six wolves stiffened as one, half lynching. Mappo, Runt, and Ikarium. Ah, we see. Know that we've no quarrel with you. Wits matched, Mappo said, his grin broadening a moment before disappearing entirely. Hunt elsewhere, Ryland Dyrus, before Ikarium does Treach a favour. Before you unleash all that I am sworn to prevent, Mappo thought. Am I understood? Our trail converges, the divers said, upon the spore of a demon of shadow. Not shadow any longer, Mappo replied. Shikes, the holy desert no longer sleeps. So, it seems, do you forbid us our hunt? Mappo glanced at Ikarium, who lowered his bow and shrugged. If you wish to lock jaws with an Aptorian, that is your choice. Our interest was only passing. Then, indeed, shall our jaws close upon the throat of the demon. You would make Shike your enemy? Mappo asked. The lead wolf cocked its head. The name means nothing to me. The two travellers watched as the wolves padded off, vanishing once again into a gloom of sorcery. Mappo showed his teeth, then sighed, and Ikarium nodded, giving voice to their shared thought. It will. Soon. The Wiccan horse soldiers loosed fierce cries of exultation as they led their broad-backed horses down the transport's gangplanks. The scene at the quayside of Hisar's imperial harbour was chaotic, a mass of unruly tribesmen and women, the flash of iron-headed lances rippling over black braided hair and spiked skullcaps. From his position on the harbour entrance tower parapet, Dyker looked down on the wild outland company with more than a little scepticism and with growing trepidation. Beside the Imperial Historian stood the High Fist's representative, Malik Rell, his fat, soft hands folded together and resting on his paunch, his skin the colour of oiled leather and smelling of iron perfumes. Malik Rell looked nothing like the chief advisor to the Seven Cities Commander of the Malazan Armies. A gestile priest of the Elder God of the Seas, Mael, his presence here to officially convey the High Fist's welcome to the new Fist of the Seventh Army was precisely what it appeared to be, a calculated insult. Although, Dyker amended silently, the man at his side had, in a very short time, risen to a position of power among the Imperial players on this continent. A thousand rumours rode the tongues of the soldiers, 
about the smooth, soft-spoken priest and whatever weapon he held over high-fist Pormqual. Each and every rumor no louder than a whisper, for Malik Rell's path to Pormqual's side was a tale of mysterious misfortune befalling everyone who stood in his way, and fatal misfortune at that. The political mire among the Malazan occupiers in seven cities was as obscure as it was potentially deadly. Dyker suspected that the new fist would understand little of veiled gestures of contempt, lacking as he did the more civilized nuances of the Empire's tamed citizens. The question that remained for the historian then was how long Coltane of the Crow Clan would survive his new appointment. Malik Rell pursed his full lips and slowly exhaled. Historian, he said softly, his Kadorian Falari accent faint in its sibilant roll. Pleased by your presence. Curious as well. Long from Arincourt. Now, he smiled, not showing his green-dyed teeth. Caution, bed of distant culling. Words like the lap of waves, Diker thought. The god Mael's formless affectation and insidious patience. This, my fourth conversation with Rel. Oh... How I dislike this creature. Diker cleared his throat. The Empress takes little heed of me, Gistal. Malik Rell's soft laugh was like the rattle of a snake's tail. <laughs> Unheeded historian or unheeding of history. Hint of bitterness at advice rejected or worse. Ignored. Be calmed. No crimes winging back from Unter's towers. Pleased to hear it, Dyker muttered, wondering at the priest's source. I remain in Hissar as a matter of research, he explained after a moment. The precedent of shipping prisoners to the Otataral mines on the island reaches back to the Emperor's time although he generally reserved that fate for mages. Mages! Ah, ah. Dyker nodded. Effective, yes, although unpredictable. The specific properties of Ototaral as a magic-deadening ore remain largely mysterious. Even so... Madness claimed most of those sorcerers, although it is not known if that was the result of exposure to the ore dust, or the deprivation from their warrens. Some mages among the next slave shipment. Some. Question soon answered then. Soon, Dyker agreed. The T-shaped key was now a maelstrom of belligerent Wiccans, frightened dock porters and short-tempered warhorses. A cordon of Hissar guard provided the stopper to the bottleneck at the dock's end, where it opened out onto the cobbled half-round. Of Seven Cities' blood, the guards had hitched their round shields and unsheathed their tulwars, waving the broad, curving blades threateningly at the Wiccans, who answered with barking challenges. Two men arrived on the parapet. Diker nodded greetings. Malik Rell did not deign to acknowledge either of them. A rough captain and the seventh lone surviving Kadra mage, both men clearly ranked too low for any worthwhile cultivation by the priest. Well, Culp, Diker said to the squat, white-haired wizard, your arrival may prove timely. Culp's narrow, sunburned face twisted into a sour scowl. Came up here to keep my bones and flesh intact, Diker. I'm not interested in becoming Coltane's lumpy carpet in his step up to the post. They're his people, after all. That he doesn't done a damn thing to quell this brewing riot doesn't bode well, I'd say. The captain at his side grunted agreement. Sticks in the throat, he growled. Half the officers here saw their first blood facing that bastard Coltane. And now here he is, about to take command. Hood's knuckles, he spat, 
Won't be any tears spilled if the Hissar guard cuts down Coltane and every one of his Wiccan savages right here at the quay. The Seventh don't need them. Truth, Malik Ral said to Dyka with veiled eyes. Behind the threat of uprisings. Continent here, a viper nest. Coltane, an odd choice. Not so odd, Dyker said, shrugging. He returned his attention to the scene below. The Wiccans closest to the Hissar guard had begun strutting back and forth in front of the armoured line. The situation was but moments away from a full-scale battle. The bottleneck was about to become a killing ground. The historian felt something cold clutch his stomach at seeing horn bows now strung among the Wiccan soldiers. Another company of guards appeared from the avenue to the right of the main colonnade, bristling with pikes. Can you explain that? Culp asked. Dyker turned and was surprised to see all three men staring at him. He thought back to his last comment, then shrugged again. Coltane united the Wiccan clans in an uprising against the Empire. The Emperor had a hard time bringing him to heel, as some of you know firsthand. True to the Emperor's style, he acquired Coltane's loyalty. How? Culp barked. No one knows, Dyker smiled. The Emperor rarely explained his successes. In any case, since Empress Lassine held no affection for her predecessor's chosen commanders, Coltane was left to rot in some backwater on Quantali. Then the situation changed. Ajank Lorne is killed in Darugistan. High Fist Dujek and his army turn renegade, effectively surrendering the entire Jenabakan campaign. And the year of Drajna approaches here in seven cities, prophesied as the year of rebellion. Lassie needs able commanders before it all slips from her grasp. The new adjunct, Tavora, is untested. So? Coltain, the captain nodded his scowl deepening, sent here to take command of the Seventh and put down the rebellion. After all, Dyker said dryly, who better to deal with insurrection than a warrior who led one himself? If mutiny occurs, scant his chances, Malik Rell said, his eyes on the scene below. Dyker saw half a dozen Talwas flash, watched the Wiccans recoil, and then unsheathed their own long knives. They seemed to have found a leader, a tall, fierce-looking warrior with fetishes in his long braids, who now bellowed encouragement, waving his own weapon over his head. Hood, the historian swore. Where on earth is Coltane? The captain laughed. The tall one with the lone long knife. Dyker's eyes widened. That madman is Coltane, he thought. The seventh's new fist. Ain't changed at all, I see, the captain continued. If you're going to keep your head as leader of all the clans, you'd better be nastier than all the rest put together. Why do you think the old emperor liked him so much? Beru Fend, Dyker whispered, appalled. In the next breath, an ululating scream from Coltane brought sudden silence from the Wiccan company. Weapons slid back into their sheaths. Bows were lowered. Arrows returned to their quivers. Even the bucking, snapping horses fell still, heads raised and ears pricked. A space cleared around Coltane, who had turned his back on the guards. The tall warrior gestured and the four men on the parapet watched in silence as with absolute precision... Every horse was saddled. Less than a minute later, the horse soldiers were mounted, guiding their horses into a close parade formation that would rival the Imperial elites. That, Dyker said, was superbly done. A soft sigh escaped Malik Rell. Savage timing, a beast's sense of challenge, then contempt. Statement for the guards. For us, as well? Coltane's a snake, the captain said, if that's what you're asking. If the High Commander Aaron thinks they can dance around him, they're in for a nasty surprise. 
Generous advice, Rel acknowledged. The captain looked as if he had just swallowed something sharp, and Dyker realized that the man had spoken without thought as to the priest's place in the high command. Culp cleared his throat. He's got them in troop formation. Guess the ride to the barracks will be peaceful after all. I admit, Dyker said wryly, that I look forward to meeting the Seventh's new fist. His heavy-lidded eyes on the scene below, Rel nodded. Agreed. Leaving behind the Skara Isles on a heading due south, the fisherboat set out into the Kanzu Sea, its triangular sail creaking and straining. If the gale held, they would reach the early tan coast in four hours. Fiddler's scowl deepened. The early tan coast, he thought. Seven cities. I hate this damned continent. Hated it the first time. Hate it even more now. He leaned over the gunwale and spat acrid bile into the warm green waves. Feeling any better? Crocus asked from the prow, his tanned young face creased with genuine concern. The old saboteur wanted to punch that face. Instead he just growled and hunched down deeper against the bark's hull. Kalam's laugh rumbled from where he sat at the tiller. Fiddler and water don't mix, lad. Look at him. He's greener than that damned winged monkey of yours. A sympathetic snuffling sound breathed against Fiddler's cheek. He pried open one bloodshot eye to find a tiny wizened face staring at him. Go away, maybe, Fiddler croaked. The familiar, once servant to Crocus's uncle, Mammoth, seemed to have adopted the sapper, the way stray dogs and cats often did. Kalam would say it was the other way around, of course. A lie, Fiddler whispered. Kalam's good at those. Like lounging around in Rutu Jalba for a whole damn week, he thought, on the off chance that a scray trader would come in. Book passage and comfort, eh, Fid? Not like the damned ocean crossing, oh no! And that one was supposed to have been in comfort, too. A whole week in Rutu Jalba. A lizard-infested, orange-brick cesspool of a city, then what? Eight Jakartas for this rag-stoppered sword in half ale casket. The steady rise and fall lulled Fiddler as the hours passed. His mind drifted back to the appallingly long journey that had brought them thus far, then to the appallingly long journey that lay ahead. We never do things the easy way, do we? he thought. He would rather that every sea dried up. Men got feet, not flippers. Even so, we're about to cross overland, over a fly-infested, waterless waste, where people smile only to announce they're about to kill you. The day dragged on, green-tinged and shaky. He thought back to the companions he'd left behind on Genobacchus, wishing he could be marching alongside them. Into a religious war, he thought. Don't forget that, Fid. Religious wars are no fun. The faculty of reasoning that permitted surrender did not apply in such instances. Still, the squad was all he'd known for years. He felt bereft out of its shadows. Just Kalam for old company, and he calls that land ahead home. And he smiles before he kills. And what's he in Quick Ben got planned they ain't told me about yet? There's more of those flying fish, Absalar said, her voice identifying the soft hand that had found its way to his shoulder. Hundreds of them. Something big from the deep is chasing them, Kalam said. Groaning, Fiddler pushed himself upright. Moby took the opportunity to reveal its motivation behind the day's cooing and crawled into the sapper's lap, curling up and closing its yellow eyes. Fiddler gripped the gunwale and joined his three companions in studying the school of flying fish a hundred yards off the starboard side. The length of a man's arm, the milky white fish were clearing the waves, sailing thirty feet or so, then slipping back under the surface. In the Kanzu Sea, flying fish hunted like sharks, the schools capable of shredding a bull whale down to bones in minutes. 
they used their ability to fly to launch themselves onto the back of a whale when it broke for air. What, in Mail's name, is hunting them? Kalam was frowning. Shouldn't be anything here in the Kanzu. Out in Seekers Deep, there's Denrabi, of course. Denrabi? Oh, that comforts me, Kalam. Oh, yes, indeed. Some kind of sea serpent? Crocus asked. Think of a centipede eighty paces long, Fiddler answered. Wraps up whales and ships alike, blows out all the air under its armoured skin, and sinks like a stone, taking its prey with it. They're rare, Kalam said, and never seen in shallow water. Until now, Crocus said, his voice rising in alarm. The Denrabi broke the surface in the midst of the flying fish, thrashing its head side to side, a wide, razor-like mouth, flensing prey by the score. The width of the creature's head was immense, as many as ten arm spans. Its segmented armor was deep green under the encrusted barnacles, each segment revealing long, chitinous limbs. Eighty paces long, Fiddler hissed. Not unless it's been cut in half. Kalam rose at the tiller. Ready with the sail, Crocus. We're going to run. Westerly. Fiddler pushed a squawking Moby from his lap and opened his backpack, fumbling to unwrap his crossbow. If it decides, we look tasty, Kalam. I know, the assassin rumbled. Quickly assembling the huge iron weapon, Fiddler glanced up and met Absala's wide eyes. Her face was white. The sapper winked. Got a surprise if it comes for us, girl. She nodded. I remember. The Denrabi had seen them. Veering from the school of flying fish, it was now cutting sinuously through the waves toward them. That's no ordinary beast, Kalam muttered. You smelling what I'm smelling, Fiddler? Spicy, bitter. Hood's breath! That's a soul taken! A what? Crocus asked. Shapeshifter, Kalam said. A rasping voice filled Fiddler's mind, and the expressions on his companions' faces told him they heard as well. Yartles, unfortunate for you to witness my passage. The sapper grunted. The creature did not sound at all regretful. It continued. For this, you must all die, though I shall not dishonor your flesh by eating you. Kind of you, Fiddler muttered, setting a solid quarrel in the crossbow's slot. The iron head had been replaced with a grapefruit-sized clay ball. Another fisher boat, mysteriously lost, the soul taken mused ironically. Alas! Fiddler scrambled to the stern, crouching down beside Kalam. The assassin straightened to face the Denrabi, one hand on the tiller. Soul taken, be on your way. We care nothing for your passage. I shall be merciful when killing you. The creature rushed the bark from directly astern, cutting through the water like a sharp hulled ship. Its jaws opened wide. You were warned, Fiddler said, as he raised the crossbow, aimed, and fired. The quarrel sped for the beast's open mouth. Lightning fast, the Denrabi snapped at the shaft, its thin, saw-edged teeth slicing through the quarrel and shattering the clay ball, releasing to the air the powdery mixture within the ball. The contact resulted in an instantaneous explosion that blew the soul taken's head apart. Fragments of skull and grey flesh raked the water on all sides. The incendiary powder continued to burn fiercely all it clung to, sending up hissing steam. Momentum carried the headless body to within four spans of the bark stern before it dipped down and slid smoothly out of sight, even as the last echoes of the detonation faded. Smoke drifted sideways over the waves. You picked the wrong fisherman, Fiddler said, lowering his weapon. Kalam settled back at the tiller, returning the craft to a southerly course. A strange stillness hung in the air. 
Fiddler disassembled his crossbow and repacked it in oilcloth. As he resumed his seat amidships, Moby crawled back into his lap. Sighing, he scratched it behind an ear. Well, Kalam? I'm not sure, the assassin admitted. What brought a soul taken into the Kansu Sea? Why did it want its passage secret? If Quick Ben was here, but he isn't, Fid. It's a mystery we'll have to live with, and hopefully we won't run into any more. Do you think it's related to... Kalam scowled. No. Related to what? Crocus demanded. What are you two going on about? Uh, just musing, Fiddler said. The soul taken was heading south, like us. So? Fiddler shrugged. So, nothing. Just that. He spat again over the side and slumped down. The excitement made me forget my seasickness. Now the excitement's faded. Damn it. Everyone fell silent, though the frown on the face of Crocus told the sapper that the boy wasn't about to let the issue rest for long. The gale remained steady, pushing them hard southward. Less than three hours after that, Absalar announced that she could see land ahead, and forty minutes later, Kalam directed the craft parallel to the Erlatan coastline, half a league offshore. They tacked west, following the cedar-lined ridge as the day slowly died. I think I see horsemen, Absalar said. Fiddler raised his head, joining the others in studying the line of riders following a coastal track along the ridge. I make them six in all, Kalam said. Second riders got an imperial pennon, Fiddler finished, his face twisting at the taste in his mouth. Messenger and lancer guard, heading for Erlitan, Kalam added. Fiddler turned in his seat and met his corporal's dark eyes. Trouble? Maybe. The exchange was silent, a product of years fighting side by side. Crocus asked, Something wrong? A Kalam? A Fiddler? The boy's sharp, Fiddler thought. Hard to say, Fiddler muttered. They've seen us, but what have they seen? Four fisherfolk in a bark, some scray family headed into the port for a taste of civilization. There's a village just south of the tree line, Kalam said. Keep an eye out for a creek mouth, Crocus, and a beach with no driftwood. The houses will be tucked leeward of the ridge, meaning inland. How's my memory, Fid? Good enough for a native, which is what you are. How long out of the city? Ten hours on foot. That close? That close. Fiddler fell silent. The Imperial messenger and his horse guard had moved out of sight, leaving the ridge as they swung south toward Erlitan. The plan had been to sail right into the Holy City's ancient crowded harbour, arriving anonymously. It was likely that the messenger was delivering information that had nothing to do with them. They'd given nothing away since reaching the Imperial port of Karakarang from Genabakis arriving on a Maranth Blue trader, having paid passage as crew. The overland journey from Karakarang across the Talgai Mountains and down to Rutu Jelba had been on the Tano Pilgrim Route, a common enough journey. And the week in Rutu Jelba had been spent inconspicuously lying low, with only Kalam making nightly excursions to the Wharf District, seeking passage across the Ototeral Sea to the mainland. At worst, a report might have reached someone official, Somewhere, the two possible deserters, accompanied by a Jenabakan and a woman, had arrived on Malazan territory. Hardly news to shake the imperial wasp nest all the way to Erlitan. So, likely Kalam was being his usual paranoid self. I see the stream mouth, Crocus said, pointing to a place on the shore. Fiddler glanced back at Kalam. Hostile land? How low do we crawl? Looking up at grasshoppers, Fid. Hood's breath. He looked back to the shore. I hate seven cities, he whispered. In his lap, Moby yawned, revealing a mouth bristling with needle-like fangs. Fiddler blanched. Cuddle up whenever you want, pup, he said, shivering. Kalam angled the tiller. Crocus worked the sail 
deft enough, after a two-month voyage across Seeker's Deep, to let the bark slip easily into the wind, the tattered sail barely raising a luff. Absalar shifted on the seat, stretched her arms, and flashed Fiddler a smile. The sapper scowled and looked away. Burn, shake me, he thought. I've got to keep my jaw from dropping every time she does that. She was another woman once, a killer, the knife of a god. She did things. Besides, she's with Crocus, ain't she? The boy's got all the luck, and the whores and Karakarang looked like poxed sisters from some gigantic poxed family, and all those poxed babies on their hips. He shook himself. Oh, fiddler. Too long at sea. Way too long. I don't see any boats, Crocus said. Up the creek, Fiddler mumbled, dragging a nail through his beard in pursuit of a knit. After a moment, he plucked it out and flicked it over the side. Ten hours on foot, he thought, then early tan, and a bath and a shave, and a cancerian girl with a saw comb, and the whole night free afterward. Crocus nudged him. Getting excited, Fiddler? You don't know the half of it. You were here during the conquest, weren't you? Back when Kalam was fighting for the other side, for the Seven Holy Faladen, and the Talani Mass marched for the Emperor, and... Enough. Fiddler waved a hand. I don't need reminding, and neither does Kalam. All wars are ugly, but that one was uglier than most. Is it true that you were in the company that chased Quickben across the holy desert Raraku, and that Kalam was your guide, only he and Quick were planning on betraying you all, but Whiskey Jack had already worked that out? Fiddler turned a glare on Kalam. One night in Rutu Jalba with the Jugger Falari rum, and this boy knows more than any imperial historian still breathing. He swung back to Crocus. Listen, son. Best you forget everything that drunken lout told you that night. The past is already hunting our tails. No point in making it any easier. Crocus ran a hand through his long black hair. Well, he said softly, if Seven Cities is so dangerous, why didn't we just head straight down to Quantali, to where Absalar lived, so we could find her father? Why all this sneaking around? And on the wrong continent at that... It's not that simple, Kalam growled. Why? I thought that was the reason for this whole journey. Crocus reached for Absalar's hand and clasped it in both of his, but saved his hard expression for Kalam and Fiddler. You both said you owed it to her. It wasn't right, and you wanted to put it right. But now I'm thinking it's only part of the reason. I'm thinking that you two have something else planned. That taking Absalar back home was just an excuse to come back to your empire, even though you're officially outlawed. And whatever it is you're planning, it's meant coming here, to Seven Cities, and it's also meant we have to sneak around, terrified of everything, jumping at shadows, as if the whole Malazan army was after us. He paused, drew a deep breath, then continued. We have a right to know the truth, because you're putting us in danger, and we don't even know what kind or why or anything. So, out with it. Now. Fiddler leaned back on the gunwale. He looked over at Kalam and raised an eyebrow. Well, Corporal, it's your call. Give me a list, Fiddler, Kalam said. The Empress wants Tarujistan. The sapper met Crocus's steady gaze. Agreed? The boy hesitated, then nodded. Fiddler continued. What she wants, she usually gets sooner or later. Call it precedent. Now, she's tried to take your city once, right, Crocus? And it cost her adjunct lawn, two imperial demons, and high fist to Jake's loyalty, not to mention the loss of the bridge burners. Enough to make anyone sting. Fine, but what's that got to do? Don't interrupt! Corporal said make a list. I'm making it. You followed me so far? Good. Darugistan eluded her once, but she'll make certain next time. Assuming there is a next time. Well, Crocus was scowling, why wouldn't there be? You said she gets what she wants. And you're loyal to your city, Crocus? Of course. 
So, you'd do anything you could to prevent the Empress from conquering it? Well, yes, but... Sir? Fiddler turned back to Kalam. The burly, black-skinned man looked out over the waves, sighed, then nodded to himself. He faced Crocus. It's this, lad. Time's come. I'm going after her. The Daru boy's expression was blank, but Fiddler saw Absalar's eyes widen, her face losing its color. She sat back suddenly, then half smiled, and Fiddler went cold upon seeing it. I don't know what you mean, Crocus said. After who? The Empress? How? He means, Absalar said, still smiling a smile that had belonged to her once long ago, when she'd been someone else. That he's going to try and kill her. What? Crocus said, almost pitching himself over the side. You? You and a seasick sapper with a broken fiddle strapped to his back? Do you think we're going to help you in this insane, suicidal... I remember, Hapsala said suddenly, her eyes narrowing on Kalam. Crocus turned to her. Remember what? Kalam. He was a Faladin's dagger, and the claw gave him command of a hand. Kalam's a master assassin, Crocus, and Quickben... Is three thousand leagues away, Crocus shouted. He's a squad mage, for hood's sake. That's it, a squally little squad mage. Not oh, quite, Fiddler said. And being so far away doesn't mean a thing, son. Quick bends our shaved knuckle in the hole. You what in the where? Shaved knuckle, as in the game of knuckles. A good gambler's usually using a shaved knuckle as in cheating in the casts, if you know what I mean. As for Hull, that'd be Quick Ben's Warren, the one that can put him at Kalam's side in the space of a heartbeat, no matter how far away he happens to be. So, Crocus, there you have it. Kalam's going to give it a try, but it's going to take some planning, preparation, and that starts here, in seven cities. You want Darugistan free forevermore? The Empress Lassine must die. Crocus slowly sat back down. But why seven cities? Isn't the Empress in Quantali? Because, Kalam said, as he angled the fisher boat into the creek mouth, and the oppressive heat of the land rose around them. Because, lad, seven cities is about to rise. What do you mean? The assassin bared his teeth. Rebellion. Fiddler swung around and scanned the fetid undergrowth lining the banks. And that, he said to himself, with a chill clutching his stomach, is the part of this plan that I hate the most. Chasing one of Quick Ben's wild ideas, with the whole countryside going up in flames. A minute later they rounded a bend and the village appeared, a scattering of wattle and daub huts in a broken half-circle facing a line of skiffs pulled onto a sandy beach. Kalam nudged the tiller and the fisher boat drifted toward the strand. As the keel scraped bottom, Fiddler clambered over the gunwale and stepped onto dry land, Moby now awake and clinging with all fours to the front of his tunic. Ignoring the squawking creature, Fiddler slowly straightened. Well, he sighed as the first of the village's mongrel dogs announced their arrival. It's begun. Chapter 2 To this day, it remains easy to ignore the fact that the Aran High Command was rife with treachery, dissension, rivalry, and malice. The assertion that the Aran High Command was ignorant of the undercurrents in the countryside is, at best, naive, at worst, cynical in the extreme. The Shaikh Rebellion, Kalaran The red ochre handprint on the wall was dissolving in the rain, trickling roots down along the mortar between the fired mud bricks. Hunched against the unseasonal downpour, Diker watched as the print slowly disappeared, wishing that the day had broken dry, that he could have come upon the sign before the rain obscured it, that he could have then gained a sense of the hand that had made its mark here, on the outer wall of the old Falard Palace in the heart of Hissar. 
The many cultures of seven cities seethed with symbols, a secret pictographic language of oblique references that carried portentous weight among the natives. Such symbols formed a complex dialogue that no Malazan could understand. Slowly, during his many months resident here, Dyker had come to realize the danger behind their ignorance. As the year of the Drajna approached, such symbols blossomed in chaotic profusion, every wall in every city a scroll of secret code. Wind, sun and rain assured impermanence, wiping clean the slate in readiness for the next exchange. And it seems they have a lot to say these days, he thought. Dyker shook himself, trying to loosen the tension in his neck and shoulders. His warnings to the High Command seemed to be falling on deaf ears. There were patterns in these symbols, and it seemed that he alone among all the Malazans had any interest in breaking the code, or even in recognizing the risks of maintaining an outsider's indifference. He pulled his cowl further over his head in an effort to keep his face dry, feeling water trickle on his forearms as the wide cuffs of his Talaba cloak briefly opened to the rain. The last of the print had washed away. Dyker pushed himself into motion, resuming his journey. Water ran in ankle-deep torrents down the cobbled slopes beneath the palace walls, gushing down into the gutters bisecting each alley and causeway in the city. Opposite the immense palace wall, awnings sagged precariously above closet-sized shops. In the chill shadows of the holes that passed for storefronts, doer-faced merchants watched Dyker as he passed by. Apart from miserable donkeys and the occasional sway-backed horse, the streets were mostly empty of pedestrian traffic. Even with the rare wayward current from the Sahul Sea, Hisar was a city born of inland drylands and deserts. Though a port and now a central landing for the empire, the city and its people lived with a spiritual back to the sea. Dyker left behind the close ring of ancient buildings and narrow alleys surrounding the palace wall, coming to the Drajna colonnade that ran straight as a spear through Hisar's heart. The Galdinda trees lining the colonnade's carriage track swam with blurred motion as the rain pelted down on their ochre leaves. Estate gardens, most of them unwalled and open to public admiration, stretched green on either side. The downpour had stripped flowers from their shrubs and dwarf trees, turning the cobbled walkways white, red and pink. The historian ducked as a gusting wind pressed his cloak tight against his right side. The water on his lips tasted of salt, the only indication of the angry sea a thousand paces to his right. Where the street named after the storm of the apocalypse narrowed suddenly, the carriage path became a muddy track of broken cobbles and shattered pottery, the tall, once royal nut trees giving way to desert scrub. The change was so abrupt that Dyker found himself up to his shins in dung-stained water before he'd realized he'd come to the city's edge. Squinting against the rain, he looked up. Off to his left, hazy behind the sheets of water, ran the stone wall of the imperial compound. Smoke struggled upward from behind the wall's fortified height. On his right, and much closer, was a chaotic knot of hide tents, horses and camels and carts, a trader camp, newly arrived from the Sial Godhan. Drawing his cloak tighter against the wind, Dyker swung to the right and made for the encampment. The rain was heavy enough to mask the sound of his approach from the tribe's dogs as he entered the narrow, mud-choked pathway between the sprawling tents. Dyker paused at an intersection. Opposite was a large, copper-stained tent, its walls profusely cluttered with painted symbols. Smoke drifted from the entrance flap. He crossed the intersection, hesitating only a moment before drawing the flap to one side and entering. A roar of sound carried on waves of hot, steam-laden air buffeted the historian as he paused to shake the water from his cloak. Voices shouting, cursing, laughing on all sides, the air filled with Durhang smoke and incense, roasting meats, sour wine and sweet ale, closed in around Dyker as he took in the scene. Coins rattled and spun in pots where a score of gamblers had gathered off to his left. 
In front of him, a tapu weaved swiftly through the crowd, a four-foot-long iron skewer of roasted meats and fruit in each hand. Daika shouted the tapu over, raising a hand to catch the man's eye. The hawker quickly approached. Goat, I swear! The tapu exclaimed in the coastal Debral language. Goat, not a dog, does I? Spell for yourself, and only a clipping to pay for such delicious fare. Would you pay so little, it does in Pali? Born on the plains of Dal Hon, Dyker's dark skin matched that of the local Debral. He was wearing the Talaba sea cloak of a merchant trader from the inland city of Dosin Pali, and spoke the language without hint of an accent. To the Tapu's claim, Daika grinned. For Doug, I would, Tapu Harul. He fished out two local crescents, the equivalent of a base clipping of the imperial silver Jakarta. And if you imagine the Mesla are freer with their silver on the island, you are a fool and worse. Looking nervous, the tapu slid a chunk of dripping meat and two soft amber globes of fruit from one of the skewers, wrapping them in leaves. Beware, Mesla spies, Dosai, he muttered. Words can be twisted. Words are their only language, Dyker replied with contempt as he accepted the food. Is it true, then, that a scarred barbarian now commands the Mesla army? A man with a demon's face, does I? The tapu wagged his head. Even the Mesla fear him. Pocketing the crescents, he moved off, raising the skewers once more over his head. A goat, not dog! Dyker found a tent wall to put his back against and watched the crowd as he ate his meal in local fashion, swiftly, messily. Every meal is your last, encompassed an entire seven cities philosophy. Grease smeared on his face, and dripping from his fingers, the historian dropped the leaves to the muddy floor at his feet, then ritually touched his forehead in a now outlawed gesture of gratitude to a fallard whose bones were rotting in the silty mud of Hissar Bay. The historian's eyes focused on a ring of old men beyond the gamblers, and he walked over to it, wiping his hands on his thighs. The gathering marked a circle of seasons, wherein two seers faced one another and spoke a symbolic language of divination in a complicated dance of gestures. As he pushed into a place among the ring of onlookers, Dyka saw the seers within the circle, an ancient shaman whose silver-barbed, skin-threaded face marked him as from the Sempk tribe, far inland, and opposite him a boy of about fifteen. Where the boy's eyes should have been, were two gouged pits of badly healed scar tissue. His thin limbs and bloated belly revealed an advanced stage of malnutrition. Dyker realized instinctively that the boy had lost his family during the Malazan conquest and now lived in the alleys and streets of Hissar. He had been found by the circle's organizers, for it was well known that the gods spoke through such suffering souls. The tense silence among the onlookers told the historian that there was power in this divination. Though blind, the boy moved to keep himself face to face with the Sempk seer, who himself slowly danced across a floor of white sand in absolute silence. They held out their hands toward each other, inscribing patterns in the air between them. Dyker nudged the man beside him. What has been foreseen? he whispered. The man, a squat local with the scars of an old Hissar regiment, poorly obscured by mutilating burns on his cheeks, hissed warningly through his stained teeth. Nothing less than the spirit of Dreitzner, whose outline was mapped by their hands. A spirit seen by all here. A ghostly promise of fire. Dyke sighed. Would that I had witnessed that. You shall. See, it comes again. The historian watched as the weaving hands seemed to contact an invisible figure, leaving a smear of reddish light that flickered in their wake. The glow suggested a human shape, and that shape slowly grew more defined. A woman whose flesh was fire. She raised her arms, and something like iron flashed at her wrists 
and the dancers became three as she spun and writhed between the seers. The boy suddenly threw back his head, words coming from his throat like the grinding of stones. Two fountains of raging blood, face to face. The blood is the same, the two are the same, and salty waves shall wash the shores of Raraku. The holy desert remembers its past. The female apparition vanished. The boy toppled forward, thumping stiff as a board onto the sand. The Sempxia crouched down, resting a hand on the boy's head. He is returned to his family, the old shaman said in the silence of the circle. The mercy of Drajna, the rarest of gifts granted to this child. Hardened tribesmen began weeping, others falling to their knees. Shaken, Dyker pulled back as the ring slowly contracted. He blinked sweat from his eyes, sensing that someone was watching him. He looked around. Across from him stood a figure shrouded in black hides, a goat's head hood pulled up, leaving the face in shadow. A moment later, the figure looked away. Dyker quickly moved from the stranger's line of sight. He made for the tent flap. Seven Cities was an ancient civilization, steeped in the power of antiquity, where ascendants once walked on every trader track, every footpath, every lost road between forgotten places. It was said the sands hoarded power within their susurrating currents, that every stone had soaked up sorcery like blood, and that beneath every city lay the ruins of countless other cities, older cities, cities that went back to the First Empire itself. It was said each city rose on the backs of ghosts, the substance of spirits thick like layers of crushed bone, that each city forever wept beneath the streets, forever laughed, shouted, hawked wares and bartered and prayed and drew first breaths that brought life and the last breaths that announced death. Beneath the streets there were dreams, wisdom, foolishness, fears, rage, grief lust and love and bitter hatred. The historian stepped outside into the rain, drawing in lungfuls of clean, cool air as he once more wrapped cloak about him. Conquerors could overrun a city's walls, could kill every living soul within it, fill every estate and every house and every store with its own people, yet rule nothing but the city's thin surface, the skin of the present, and would one day be brought down by the spirits below, until they themselves were but one momentary lair among many. This is an enemy we can never defeat, Dyker believed. Yet history tells the stories of those who would challenge that enemy again and again. Perhaps victory is not achieved by overcoming that enemy, but by joining it becoming one with it. The Empress has sent a new fist to batter down the restless centuries of this land. Had she abandoned Coltane, as I'd suggested to Malik Rel? Or had she just held him back in readiness, like a weapon forged and honed for one specific task? Dyker left the encampment, once more hunched beneath the driving rain. Ahead loomed the gates of the Imperial compound. He might well find some answers to his questions within the next hour, as he came face to face with Coltane of the Crow Clan. He crossed the rutted track, sloshing through the murky puddles filling the horse and wagon ruts, then ascended the muddy slope toward the gatehouse. Two cowled guards stepped into view as he reached the gate's narrow side passage. No petitions today, Dossai one of the Malazan soldiers said. Try tomorrow. Dyker unclasped the cloak, opened it to reveal the imperial diadem pinned to his tunic. The fist has called a council, has he not? Both soldiers saluted and stepped back. The one who'd spoken earlier smiled apologetically. Didn't know you were with the other one, he said. What other one? He came in just a few minutes ago, historian. Yes, 
Of course. Diker nodded to the two men, then passed within. The stone floor of the passage bore the muddy tracks of a pair of moccasins. Frowning, he continued on, coming to the inside compound. A roofed causeway followed the wall to his left, leading eventually to the side postern of the squat, unimaginative headquarters building. Already wet, Diker ignored it, electing to cross the compound directly toward the building's main entrance. In passing, he noticed that the man who had preceded him had done the same. The pulled prints of his steps betrayed a bow-legged gait. The historian's frown deepened. He came to the entrance where another guard appeared, who directed Diker to the council room. As he approached the room's double doors, he checked for his predecessor's footprints, but there were none. Evidently, he'd gone to some other chamber within the building. Shrugging, Diker opened the doors. The council room was low-ceilinged, its stone walls unplastered but washed in white paint. A long marble table dominated, looking strangely incomplete in the absence of chairs. Already present were Malik Rell, Culp, Coltane, and another Wiccan officer. They all turned at the historian's entrance, Rell's brows lifting in mild surprise. Clearly he'd been unaware that Coltane had extended to Diker an invitation. Had it been the new fist's intention to unbalance the priest, a deliberate exclusion? After a moment, the historian dismissed the thought. More likely the result of a disorganized new command. The chairs had been specifically removed for this council, as was evident in the tracks their legs had left through the white dust on the floor. The discomfort of not knowing where to stand or how to position oneself was evident in both Malik Rell and Culp. The gistile priest of Male was shifting weight from one foot to the other, sweat on his brow reflecting the harsh glare of the lantern set on the tabletop, his hands folded into his sleeves. Culp looked in need of a wall to lean against, but was clearly uncertain how the Wiccans would view such a casual posture. Inwardly smiling, Diker removed his dripping cloak, hanging it from an old torch bracket beside the doors. He then turned about and presented himself before the new fist, who stood at the nearest end of the table, his officer on his left, a scowling veteran whose wide, flat face seemed to fold in on itself diagonally in a scar from right jawline to left brow. I am Diker, the historian said, Imperial Historian of the Empire. He half bowed. Welcome to Hissa, Fist. Up close, he could see that the war leader of the Crow Clan showed the weathering of forty years on the North Wiccan plains of Guantali. His lean, expressionless face was lined, deep brackets around the thin, wide mouth, and squint tracks at the corners of his dark, deep-set eyes. Oiled braids hung down past his shoulders, knotted with crow feather fetishes. He was tall, wearing a battered vest of chain over a hide shirt, a crow feather cloak hanging from his broad shoulders down to the backs of his knees. He wore a rider's leggings, laced with gut up the outer sides to his hips. A single horn-handled long knife jutted out from under his left arm. In answer to Diker's words, he cocked his head. When I last saw you, he said in his harsh Wiccan accent, you lay in fever on the Emperor's own cot, about to rise and walk through the hooded one's gates. He paused. Bolt was the young warrior whose lance ripped you open, and for his effort a soldier named Dujek kissed Bolt's face with his sword. Coltane slowly turned to smile at the scarred Wiccan at his side. The grizzled horseman's scowl remained unchanged as he glared at Diker. After a moment, he shook his head and swelled his chest. I remember an unarmed man. The lack of weapons in his hands turned my lance at the last moment. I remember Dujek's sword that stole my beauty, even as my horse bit his arm, crushing bone. I remember that Dujek lost that arm to the surgeons, fouled as it was with my horse's breath. Between us, I lost the exchange, for the loss of an arm did nothing to damage Dujek's glorious career, while the loss of my beauty left me with but the one wife that I already had. 
And was she not your sister, Bult? She was, Coltain, and blind. Both Wiccans fell silent, the one frowning and the other scowling. Off to one side, Culp voiced something like a strangled grunt. Diker slowly raised an eyebrow. I am sorry, Bolt, he said. Although I was at the battle, I never saw Coltain, nor you. In any case, I had not noticed any particular loss of your beauty. The veteran nodded. One must look carefully, it's true. Perhaps, Malik Rell said, time to dispense with the pleasant trees, entertaining as they are, and begin this council. When I'm ready, Coltane said casually, still studying Diker. Bolt grunted. Tell me, historian, what inspired you to enter battle without weapons? Perhaps I lost them in the melee. But you did not. You wore no belt, no scabbard, you carried no shield. Diker shrugged. If I am to record the events of this empire, I must be in their midst, sir. Shall you display such reckless zeal in recording the events of Coltane's command? Zeal? Oh, yes, sir. As for reckless... He sighed. Alas, my courage is not as it once was. These days I wear armor when attending battle, and a short sword and shield, and helm. Surrounded by bodyguards, and at least a league away from the heart of the fighting. The years have brought you wisdom, Bolt said. In some things I am afraid, Dyker said slowly. Not enough. He faced Coltane. I would be bold enough to advise you, Fist, at this council. Coltane's gaze slid to Malik Rell as he spoke. And you fear the presumption, for you will say things I will not appreciate. Perhaps, in hearing such things, I shall command Bolt to complete the task of killing you. This... Tells me much, he continued, of the situation at Arran. I know little of that, Diker said, feeling sweat trickle beneath his tunic. But even less of you, Fist. Coltane's expression did not change. Diker was reminded of a cobra slowly rising before him, unblinking, cold. Question, Malik Rell said. Has the council begun? Not yet, Coltane said slowly. We await my warlock. The priest of Mael drew a sharp breath at that. Off to one side, Culp took a step forward. Diker found his throat suddenly dry. Clearing it, he said, Was it not at the command of the Empress, in her first year on the throne, that all Wiccan warlocks be, um, rooted out? Was there not a subsequent mass execution? I have a memory of seeing Unter's outer walls. They took many days to die, Bolt said, hung from spikes of iron until the crows came to collect their souls. We brought our children to the city walls to look upon the tribal elders whose lives were taken from us by the short-haired women's command. We gave them memory scars to keep the truth alive. An empress, Diker said, watching Coltane's face, whom you now serve. The short-haired woman knows nothing of Wiccan ways, Bult said. The crows that carried within them the greatest of the warlock souls returned to our people to await each new birth. And so the power of our elders returned to us. A side entrance Diker had not noticed before slid open. A tall, bow-legged figure stepped into the room, face hidden in the shadow of a goat's head cowl, which he now pulled back revealing the smooth visage of a boy no more than ten years old. 
The youth's dark eyes met the historian's. This is Somo Enath, Coltane said. Somo Enath, an old man, was executed at Unta, Culp snapped. He was the most powerful of the warlocks. The Empress made sure of him. It said he took eleven days on the wall to die. This one is not Somo Enath, this is a boy. Eleven days, Bult grunted. No single crow could hold all of his soul. Each day there came another, until he was all gone. Eleven days, eleven crows. Such was Somo's power, his life will, and such was the honor accorded him by the black-winged spirits. Eleven came to him. Eleven. Elder sorcery, Malik Rell whispered. Most ancient scrolls hint at such things. This boy is named Somo Enath. Truly, the warlock reborn? The Rivi of Genabarchus have similar beliefs, Dyka said. A newborn child can become the vessel of a soul that has not passed through Hood's gates. The boy spoke, his voice reedy but breaking, on the edge of manhood. I am Somo Enath, who carries in his breastbone the memory of an iron spike. Eleven crows attended my birth. He hitched his cloak behind his shoulders. This day I came upon a ritual of divination and saw there among the crowd the historian Dyker. Together we witnessed a vision sent by a spirit of great power, a spirit whose face is one among many. This spirit promised Armageddon. I saw her as he did, Dyker said. A trader caravan has camped outside the city. You were not discovered as the Malathan? Malek asked. He speaks the tribal language well, Somo said, and makes gestures announcing his hatred of the Empire, well enough of countenance and in action to deceive the natives. Tell me, historian, have you seen such divinations before? None so obvious, Dyker admitted, but I have seen enough signs to sense the growing momentum. The new year will bring rebellion. Bold assertion, Malik Rell said. He sighed, clearly uncomfortable with standing. The new fist would do well to regard with caution such claims. Many are the prophecies of this land, as many as there are people, it seems. Such multitudes diminish the veracity of each. Rebellion has been promised in seven cities each year since the Malazan conquest. What has come of them? Not. The priest has hidden motives, Somo said. Dyker found himself holding his breath. Malik Rell's round, sweat-sheen face went white. All men have hidden motives, Coltane said, as if dismissing his warlock's claim. I hear counsel of warning and counsel of caution. A good balance. These are my words. The mage who yearns to lean against walls of stone views me as an adder in his bedroll. His fear of me speaks for every soldier in the Seventh Army. The fist spat on the floor, his face twisting. I care nothing for their sentiments. If they obey my commands, I in turn will serve them. If they do not, I will tear their hearts from their chests. Do you hear my words, Kadra Mage? Culp was scowling. I hear them. I am here, Rell's voice was almost shrill, to convey the commands of High Fist Pormquel. Before or after the High Fist's official welcome? Even as he spoke, Dyker regretted his words, despite Bult's bark of laughter. In response, Malik Rell straightened. High Fist Pormquel welcomes Fist Coltane to Seven Cities and wishes him well in his new command. The Seventh Army remains as one of the three original armies of the Malathan Empire, 
and the High Fist is confident that Fist Coltain will honour their commendable history. I care nothing for reputations, Coltain said. They shall be judged by their actions. Go on. Trembling, Rel continued. The High Fist Pormquel has asked me to convey his orders to High Fist Coltain. Admiral Nock is to leave Hissar Harbor and proceed to Arran as soon as his ships are resupplied. High Fist Coltain is to begin preparations for marching the Seventh Overland to Arran. It is the High Fist's desire to review the Seventh prior to its final stationing. The priest produced a sealed scroll from his robes and set it on the tabletop. Such are the High Fist's commands. A look of disgust darkened Coltane's features. He crossed his arms and deliberately turned his back on Malik Rell. Bolt laughed without humour. <laughs> The High Fist wishes to review the army. Presumably the High Fist has an attendant High Mage, perhaps a Hand of the Claw as well. If he wishes to review Coltane's troops, he can come here by Warren. The Fist has no intention of outfitting this army to march 400 leagues so that Pormqual can frown at the dust on their boots. Such a move will leave the eastern provinces of seven cities without an occupying army. At this time of unrest, it will be viewed as a retreat, especially when accompanied by the withdrawal of the Sahul fleet. This land cannot be governed from behind the walls of Arran. Defying the High Fist's command? Rel asked in a whisper. Eyes glittering like blooded diamonds on Coltane's broad back. The fist whirled. I am counseling a change of those commands, he said, and now await a reply. Reply I shall give you, the priest rasped. Coltane sneered. Bolt said, You, you are a priest, not a soldier, not a governor. You are not even recognized as a member of the high command. Rell's glare flicked from fist to veteran. I am not. Indeed, not by Empress Lassine, Bolt cut in. She knows nothing of you, priest, apart from the high fist's reports. Understand that the Empress does not convey power upon people whom she does not know. High fist Pormqual employed you as his messenger boy, and that is how the fist shall treat you. You command nothing. Not Coltane, not me, not even a lonely mess cook of the seventh. I shall convey these words and sentiments to the High Fist. No doubt. You may go now. Rel's jaw dropped. Go. We are done with you. Leave. In silence, they watched the priest depart. As soon as the doors closed, Diker turned to Coltane. That may not have been wise, Fist. Coltane's eyes looked sleepy. Bolt spoke, not I. Diker glanced at the veteran. The scarred Wiccan was grinning. Tell me of Pormqual, Coltane said. You have met him? The historian swung back to the Fist. I have. Does she govern well? As far as I have been able to determine, Diker said, he does not govern at all. Most edicts are issued by the man you, Bolt, just expelled from this council. There are a host of others behind the curtain, mostly noble-born wealthy merchants. They are the ones primarily responsible for the cuts in duty taxation on imported goods and the corresponding increases in local taxes on production and exports, with exemptions, of course, in whatever export they themselves are engaged in. The imperial occupation is managed by Malazan merchants, a situation unchanged since Pormqual assumed the title of High Fist four years ago. Bolt asked, 
who was high fist before him. Cartheron Crust, who drowned one night in Arran Harbor. Culp snorted. Crust could swim drunk through a hurricane, but then he went and drowned just like his brother Urko. Neither body was ever found, of course. Meaning? Culp grinned at Balt, but said nothing. Both Crust and Urko were the Emperor's men, Diker explained. It seems they shared the same fate as most of Kellenved's companions, including Tok the Elder and Amaron. None of their bodies were ever found either. The historian shrugged. Old history now. Forbidden history, in fact. You assume they were murdered at Lassine's command, Bolt said, baring his jagged teeth. But imagine a circumstance where the Empress's most able commander simply disappeared, leaving her isolated, desperate for able people. You forget, historian, that before Lassine became Empress, she was close companions with Crust, Urko, Amaron, Dasim, and the others. Imagine her now alone, still feeling the wounds of abandonment. And her murder of the other close companions, Kellenved and Dancer, was not something she imagined would affect her friendship with those commanders? Diker shook his head, aware of the bitterness in his voice. They were my companions too, he thought. Some errors in judgment can never be undone, Bolt said. The Emperor and Dancer were able conquerors, but were they able rulers? We'll never know, Diker snapped. The Wiccan sigh was almost a snort. No, but if there was one person close to the throne, capable of seeing what was to come, it was Lassine. Coltane spat on the floor once again. That is all to say on the matter, historian. Record the words that have been uttered here, if you do not find them too sour a taste. He glanced over at a silent Sormo Enath, frowning as he studied his warlock. Even if I choked on them, Diker replied, I would recount them nonetheless. I could not call myself a historian if it were otherwise. Very well, then. The fist's gaze remained on Sormo Enath. Tell me, historian, what hold does Malik Rel have over Pormqual? I wish I knew, Fist. Find out. You are asking me to become a spy. Coltane turned to him with a faint smile. And what were you in the trader's tent, Diker? Diker grimaced. I would have to go to Aaron. I do not think Malik Rell would welcome me to inner councils any more. Not after witnessing his humiliation here. In fact, I warrant he has marked me as an enemy now, and his enemies have a habit of disappearing. I shall not disappear, Coltane said. He stepped closer, reached out and gripped the historian's shoulder. We shall disregard Malik Rell, then. You will be attached to my staff. As you command, Fist, Diker said. This council is ended. Coltane spun to his warlock. Somo, you shall recount for me this morning's adventure, later. The warlock bowed. Diker retrieved his cloak, and followed by Culp, left the chamber. As the doors closed behind him, the historian plucked at the Kadra mage's sleeve. A word with you, in private. My thoughts, exactly, Culp replied. They found a room further down the hallway, cluttered with broken furniture, but otherwise unoccupied. Culp shut and locked the door, then faced Diker, his eyes savage. He's not a man at all. He's an animal, and he sees things like an animal. And Bolt, Bolt reads his master's snarling and raised hackles and puts it all into words. I've never heard such a talkative Wiccan as that mangled old man. Evidently, Diker said dryly, Coltane had a lot to say. 
I suspect even now the priest of Mail is planning his revenge. Aye, but it was Bolt's defence of the Empress that shook me. Do you countenance his argument? Dyker sighed. That she regrets her actions and now feels in full the solitude of power? Possibly. Interesting, but its relevance is long past. Has that scene confided in these Wiccan savages, do you think? Coltain was summoned to an audience with the Empress, and I'd guess that Bolt is as much as sown to his master's side. But what occurred between them in Lassine's private chambers remains unknown. The historian shrugged. They were prepared for Malik Rel. That much seems clear. And you, Culp, what of this young warlock? Young? The cadre mage scowled. That boy has the aura of an ancient man. I could smell on him the ritual drinking of mare's blood, and that ritual marks a warlock's time of iron. His last few years of life, the greatest flowering of his power. Did you see him? He fired a dart at the priest, then stood silent, watching its effect. Yet you claimed it was all a lie. <laughs> no need to let Sormo know how sensitive my nose is, and I'll continue treating him as if he was a boy, an imposter. If I'm lucky, he'll ignore me. Diker hesitated. The air in the room was stale, tasting of dust when he drew breath. Culp, he finally said. Hi, historian. What do you ask of me? It has nothing to do with Coltane, or Malik Rel, or Somo Enath. I require your assistance. In what? I wish to free a prisoner. The cadre mage's brows rose. In Hissar's jail? Historian, I have no clout with the Hissar guard. No, not in the city jail. This is a prisoner of the Empire. Where is this prisoner kept? He was sold into slavery, Culp. He's in the Ototeral mines. The cadre mage stared. Hood's breath, Dyker, you're asking the help of a mage? You imagine I would willingly go anywhere near those mines? Ototeral destroys sorcery, drives mages insane. No closer than a dory off the island's coast, Dyker cut in. I promise that, Culp. To collect the prisoner and then what? Rowing like a fiend with a docile war gallery in hot pursuit? Dyker grinned. Something like that. Culp glanced at the closed room, then studied the wreckage in the room as if it had not noticed it before. What chamber was this? Fist Torlom's office, Dyker answered, where the Dreichnai assassin found her that night. Culp slowly nodded. And was our choosing it an accident? I certainly hope so. So do I, historian. Will you help me? This prisoner? Uh, who? Heboric Light Touch. Culp slowly nodded a second time. Let me think on it, Dyker. May I ask what gives you pause? Culp scowled. The thoughts of another traitorous historian loose in the world? What else? The holy city of Erlitan was a city of white stone, rising from the harbour to surround and engulf a vast, flat-topped hill known as Genrab. It was believed that one of the world's first cities was buried within Genrab, and that in the compacted rubble waited the throne of the Seven Protectors, which legend held was not a throne at all, but a chamber housing a ring of seven raised daises, each sanctified by one of the ascendants who set out to found seven cities. Erlitan was a thousand years old, but Genrab, the ancient city, now a hill of crushed stone, was believed to be nine times that. An early Falad of Erlitan had begun extensive and ambitious building on the flat top of Genrab to honour the city buried beneath the streets. The quarries along the north coast were gutted, whole hillsides carved out, the ten-ton white blocks of marble dressed and transported by ship to Erlitan's harbour, then pulled through the lower districts to the ramps leading to the hill's summit. 
Temples, estates, gardens, domes, towers, and the Falard Palace rose like the gems of a virgin crown on Gen Rab. Three years after the last block had been nudged into place, the ancient buried city shrugged. Subterranean archways collapsed beneath the immense strains of the Falard crown. Walls folded, foundation stones slid sideways into streets packed solid with dust. Beneath the surface, the dust behaved like water, racing down streets and alleys into gaping doorways beneath floors, all unseen in the unrelieved darkness of Jenrab. On the surface, on a bright dawn marking an anniversary of the Falard rule, the crown sagged, towers toppled, domes split in clouds of white marble dust, and the palace dropped unevenly, in some places no more than a few feet, in others over twenty armspans down into flowing rivers of dust. Observers in the lower city described the event. It was as if a giant invisible hand had reached down to the crown, closing to gather in every building, crushing them all while pushing down into the hill. The cloud of dust that rose turned the sun into a copper disc for days afterward. Over 30,000 people died that day, including the Falard himself, and of the 3,000 who dwelt and worked within the palace, but one survived. A young cook's helper, who was convinced that the beaker he had dropped on the floor a moment before the earthquake, was to blame for the entire catastrophe. Driven mad with guilt, he stabbed himself in the heart while standing in the lower city's Merica round, his blood flowing down to drench the paving stones where Fiddler now stood. His blue eyes narrowed. The sapper watched a troop of red swords ride hard through a scattering crowd on the other side of the round. Swathed in thin bleached linen robes, the hood pulled up and over his head in the manner of a Graal tribesman. He stood motionless on the sacred paving stone with its faded commemorative script, wondering if the rapid thumping of his heart was loud enough to be heard by the crowds moving nervously around him. He cursed himself for risking a wander through the ancient city. Then he cursed Kalam for delaying their departure until he'd managed to make contact with one of his old agents in the city. Besla Ebdin, a voice near him hissed. Malazan Lapdogs was an accurate enough translation. The Red Swords were born of seven cities, yet avowed absolute loyalty to the Empress. Rare, if at the moment unwelcome, Pragmatists in a land of fanatical dreamers, the Red Swords had just begun an independent crackdown on the followers of Dreijna in their typical fashion, with sword edge and lance. Half a dozen victims lay unmoving on the bleached stones of the round, amid scattered baskets, bundles of cloth and food. Two small girls crouched beside a woman's body near the dried-up fountain. Sprays of blood decorated nearby walls. From a few streets away, the alarms of the Erleton Guard were ringing, the city's fist having just been informed that the Red Swords were once again defying his inept rule. The savage riders continued their impromptu, indiscriminate slaughter up a main avenue leading off from the round, and were soon out of sight. Beggars and thieves swooped in on the felled bodies, even as the air filled with wailing voices. A hunchbacked pimp gathered up the two girls and hobbled out of sight up an alleyway. A few minutes earlier, Fiddler had come near to having his skull split wide open upon entering the round and finding himself in the path of a charging red sword. His soldier's experience launched him across the horse's path, forcing the warrior to swing his blade to his shield side, and a final duck beneath the swishing sword took the sapper past and out of reach. The red sword had not bothered pursuing him, turning instead to behead the next hapless citizen, a woman desperately dragging two children from the horse's path. Fiddler shook himself, breathing a silent curse. Pushing through the jostling crowd, he made for the alley the pimp had used. The tall, leaning buildings to either side shrouded the narrow passage in shadow. Rotting food and something dead filled the air with a thick stench. There was no one in sight as Fiddler cautiously padded along. He came to a sidetrack between two high walls, barely wide enough for a mule and shin-deep in dry palm leaves. Behind each high wall was a garden, the tall palm trees entwining their fronds like a roof twenty feet overhead. 
Thirty paces on the passage came to a dead end, and there crouched the pimp, one knee holding down the youngest girl, while he pressed the other girl against the wall, fumbling at her leggings. The pimp's head turned at the sound of Fiddler striding through the dried leaves. He had the white skin of a scray and showed blackened teeth in a knowing grin. Growl, she's yours for a half Jakarta. Once I've broken her skin, the other will cost you more being younger. Fiddler stepped up to the man. I buy, he said. Make wives. Two Jakartas. The pimp snorted. I'll make twice that in a week. Sixteen Jakartas. Fiddler drew the growl long knife he'd purchased an hour earlier and pressed the edge against the pimp's throat. Two Jakartas? And my mercy, Cimarron. Done, growl, the pimp grated, eyes wide. Done, by the hooded one. Fiddler drew two coins from his belt and tossed them into the leaves. Then he stepped back. I take them now. The Cimarron fell to his knees, scrabbling through the dried fronds. Take them, growl, take them. Fiddler grunted, sheathing the knife and gathering one girl under each arm. Turning his back on the pimp, he walked out of the alley. The likelihood that the man would attempt any treachery was virtually non-existent. Graal tribesmen often begged for insults to give cause for their favourite activity, pursuing vendettas. And it was reputedly impossible to sneak up on one from behind, so none dared try. For all that, Fiddler was thankful for the thick carpet of leaves between him and the pimp. He exited the alleyway. The girls hung like oversized dolls in his arms, still numbed with shock. He glanced down at the face of the older one. Nine, maybe ten years of age, she stared up at him with wide, dark eyes. Safe now, he said. If I set you down, can you walk? Can you show me where you live? After a long moment, she nodded. They had reached one of the tortuous tracks that passed for a street in the lower city. Fiddler set the girl down, cradling the other in the crook of his arm. She seemed to have fallen asleep. The older child immediately grasped his robes to keep from being pushed away by the jostling crowd, then began tugging him along. Home? Fiddler asked. Home, she replied. Ten minutes later, they passed beyond the market district and entered a quieter residential area, the dwellings modest but clean. The girl guided Fiddler toward a side street. As soon as they reached it, children appeared, shouting and rushing to gather around them. A moment later, three armed men burst from a garden gate. They confronted Fiddler with talwars raised as the crowd of children dispersed on all sides, suddenly silent and watchful. Nahal Gra, Fiddler growled. The woman fell to a red sword. A Cimarral took these two. I bought them. Unbroken. Three Jakartas. Two corrected one of the men, spitting on the cobbles at Fiddler's feet. We found the Cimarron. Two to buy, one more to deliver. Unbroken. Three. Fiddler gave them a hard grin. Fair price. Cheap for Graal honour. Cheap for Graal protection. A fourth man spoke from behind Fiddler. Pay the Graal, you fools. A hundred gold Jakartas would not be too much. The nurse and the children were under your protection, yet you fled when the red swords came. If this growl had not come upon the children and purchased them, they would now be broken. Pay the coin and bless this growl with the Queen of Dreams' favour. Bless him and his family for all time. The man slowly stepped around. He wore the armour of a private guard with a captain's insignia. His lean face was scarred with the hatch symbol of a veteran of Egatan, and on the backs of his hands were the pitted tracks of incendiary scars. His hard eyes held fiddlers. I ask for your trader name, Graal, so that we may honour you in our prayers. Fiddler hesitated, then gave the captain his true name, the name he had been born with long ago. The man frowned upon hearing it, but made no comment. One of the guards approached with coins in hand. Fiddler offered the sleeping child to the captain. It is wrong that she sleeps, he said. The grizzled veteran received the child with gentle care. We shall have the house healer attend to her. Fiddler glanced around. 
Clearly the children belonged to a rich, powerful family, yet the abodes within sight were all relatively small, the homes of minor merchants and craft workers. Will you share a meal with us, Graal? the captain asked. The children's grandfather will wish to see you. Curious Fiddler nodded. The captain led him to a low postern gate in a garden wall. The three guardsmen moved ahead to open it. The young girl was the first through. The gate opened into a surprisingly spacious garden, the air cool and damp with the breath of an unseen stream trickling through the lush undergrowth. Old fruit and nut trees canopied the stone-lined path. On the other side rose a high wall constructed entirely of murky glass. Rainbow patterns glistened on the panes, beaded with moisture and mottled with mineral stains. Fiddler had never before seen so much glass in one place. A lone door was set in the wall, made of bleached linen stretched over a thin iron frame. Before it stood an old man dressed in a wrinkled orange robe. The deep, rich ochre of his skin was set off by a shock of white hair. The girl ran up to embrace the man. His amber eyes held steadily on Fiddler. The sapper dropped to one knee. I beg your blessing, Spirit Walker, he said in his harshest gruel accent. The Tano priest's laughter was like blowing sand. <laughs> I cannot bless what you are not, sir, he said quietly. But please, join me and Captain Turker in a private repast. I trust these guardians will prove eager to regain their courage in taking care of the children, here within the garden's confines. He laid a weathered hand on the sleeping child's forehead. Salal protects herself in her own way. Captain, tell the healer she must be drawn back to this world, gently. The captain handed the child over to one of the guards. You heard the master. Quickly now. Both children were taken through the linen door. Gesturing, the Tano spirit walker led Fiddler and Turka to the same door at a more sedate pace. Inside the glass-walled room squatted a low iron table with shin-high, hide-bound chairs around it. On the table were bowls holding fruits and chilled meat stained red with spices. A crystal carafe of pale yellow wine had been unstoppered and left to air. At the carafe's base, the wine sediment was two fingers thick desert flower buds, and the carcasses of white honeybees. The wine's cool, sweet scent permeated the chamber. The inner door was solid wood, set in a marble wall. Small alcoves set within that wall held lit candles displaying flames of assorted colors. Their flickering reflections danced hypnotically on the facing glass. The priest sat down and indicated the other chairs. Please be seated. I am surprised that a Malazan spy would so jeopardize his disguise by saving the lives of two Erli children. Do you now seek to glean valuable information from a family overwhelmed by gratitude? Fiddler drew his hood back, sighing. I am Malazan, he acknowledged, but not as a spy. I am disguised to avoid discovery by Malazans. The old priest poured the wine and handed the sapper a goblet. You are a soldier. I am. A deserter? Fiddler winced. Not by choice. The emperor saw fit to outlaw my regiment. He sipped the flowery sweet wine. Captain Turker hissed. A bridge burner. A soldier of one arms host. You are well informed, sir. The Tano spirit walker gestured toward the bowls. Please, if, after so many years of war, you are seeking a place of peace, you have made a grave error in coming to seven cities. So I gathered, Fiddler said, helping himself to some fruit, which is why I am hoping to book passage to Quantali as soon as possible. The Kanzu fleet has left Erlitan, the captain said. Few are the trader ships setting forth on oceanic voyages these days. High taxes. And the prospect of riches that will come with a civil war, Fiddler said, nodding. Thus, it must be overland, at least down to Arran. Unwise, the old priest said. 
I know. But the Tano spirit walker was shaking his head. Not simply the coming war. To travel to Aran, you must cross the Panpotsam Odhan, skirting the holy desert Raraku. From Raraku, the whirlwind of the apocalypse will come forth, and more, there will be a convergence. Fiddler's eyes narrowed. The soul taken Denrabi. As in a drawing together of ascendant powers? Just so. What will draw them? A gate. The prophecy of the path of hands. Soul taken and divers. A gate promising something. They are drawn as moths to a flame. Why would shapeshifters have any interest in a warren's gate? They are hardly a brotherhood, nor are they used as a sorcery, at least not in any sophisticated sense. Surprising depth of knowledge for a soldier. Fiddler scowled. Soldiers are always underestimated, he said. I've not spent fifteen years fighting imperial wars with my eyes closed. The emperor clashed with both Treach and Rylandaris outside Li Heng. I was there. The Tano spirit walker bowed his head in apology. I have no answers to your questions, he said quietly. Indeed, I do not think even the soul taken and divers are fully aware of what they seek. Like salmon, returning to the waters where they were born, they act on instinct, a visceral yearning, and a promise only sensed. He folded his hands together. There is no unification among shapeshifters. Each stands alone. This path of hands, he hesitated, then continued, is perhaps a means to ascendancy for the victor. Fiddler drew a slow, unsteady breath. Ascendancy means power. Power means control. He met the spirit walker's tawny eyes. Should one shapeshifter attain ascendancy? Domination of its own kind, yes. Such an event would have repercussions. In any case, friend, the wastelands could never be called safe. But the months to come shall turn the Odan into a place of savage horror. This much I know with certainty. Thank you for the warning. Yet it shall not deter you. I am afraid not. Then it befalls me to offer you some protection for your journey. Uh, Captain, if you would be so kind. The veteran rose and departed. An outlawed soldier, the old priest said after a moment, who will risk his life to return to the heart of the emperor that has sentenced him to death. The need must be great. Fiddler shrugged. The bridge burners are remembered here in seven cities, a name that is cursed yet admired all the same. You are honorable soldiers fighting in a dishonorable war. It is said the regiment was honed in the heat and scorched rock of the holy desert Raraku, in pursuit of a fallard company of wizards. That is a story I would like to hear sometime, so that it may be shaped into song. Fiddler's eyes widened. A spirit walker's sorcery was sung. No other rituals were required. Although devoted to peace, the power in Atano's song was said to be immense. The sapper wondered what such a creation would do to the bridge burners. The Tano spirit walker seemed to understand the question, for he smiled. Such a song has never before been attempted. There is in a Tano song the potential for ascendancy, but can an entire regiment ascend? Truly, a question deserving an answer. Fiddler sighed. Had I the time... I would give you that story. It would take but a moment. What do you mean? The old priest raised a long-fingered, wrinkled hand. If you were to let me touch you, I would know your history. The sapper recoiled. Ah. The Tano spirit walker sighed. You fear I would be careless with your secrets. 
I fear that your possessing them would endanger your life, nor are all of my memories honourable. The old man tilted his head back and laughed. If they were all honourable, friend, you would be more deserving of this robe than I. Forgive me my bold request, then. Captain Turker returned, carrying a small chest of weathered wood the colour of sand. He set it down on the table before his master, who raised the lid and reached inside. Raraku was once a sea, the Tano said. He withdrew a bleached white conch shell. Such remnants can be found in the holy desert, provided you know the location of the ancient shores. In addition to the memory song contained within it of that inland sea, other songs have been invested. He glanced up, meeting Fiddler's eyes. My own songs of power. Please accept this gift in gratitude for saving the lives and honour of my granddaughters. Fiddler bowed as the old priest set the conch shell into his hands. Thank you, Tarno Spirit Walker. Your gift offers protection, then? Of a sort, the priest said, smiling. After a moment, he rose from his seat. We shall not keep you any longer, Bridgeburner. Fiddler quickly stood. Captain Tucker will see you out. He stepped close and laid a hand on Fiddler's shoulder. Kimlock Spirit Walker thanks you. The conch shell in his hands, the sapper was ushered from the priest's presence. Outside in the garden, the water-cooled air plucked at the sweat on Fiddler's brow. Kimlock, he muttered under his breath. Turker grunted beside him as they walked the path to the back gate. His first guest in eleven years. Do you comprehend the honour bestowed upon you, Bridgeburner? Clearly, Fiddler said dryly. He values his granddaughters. Eleven years, you say? Then his last guest would have been... High Fist Dujek One Arm of the Malazan Empire, negotiating the peaceful surrender of Karakarang, the holy city of the Tano cult. Kimlock claimed he could destroy the Malazan armies utterly, yet he capitulated, and his name is now legendary for empty threats. Turka snorted. He opened the gates of his city because he values life above all things. He took the measure of your empire and realized that the death of thousands meant nothing to it. Malaz would have what it desired, and what it desired was Karakarang. Fiddler grimaced. With heavy sarcasm, he said, And if that meant bringing the Talani mass to the holy city, to do to it what they did to Arun, then we would have done just that. <laughs> I doubt even Kimlock's sorcery could hold back the Talani mass. They stood at the gate. Turka swung it open, old pain in his dark eyes. As did Kimlock, he said. The slaughter at Arran revealed the Empire's madness. What happened during the Arran Rebellion was a mistake, Fiddler snapped. No command was ever given to the Logros to land I mass. Turka's only reply was a sour, bitter grin as he gestured to the street beyond. Go in peace, Bridgeburner. Irritated, Fiddler left. Moby squealed in delight, launching itself across the narrow room to collide with Fiddler's chest in a frenzied flap of wings and clutching limbs. Swearing and pushing the familiar away as it attempted a throat-crushing embrace, the sapper crossed the threshold, closing the door behind him. I was starting to get worried, Kalam rumbled from the shadows, filling the room's far end. Got distracted. Trouble? He shrugged, stripping off his outer cloak to reveal the leather-bound chain surcoat beneath. Where are the others? In the garden, Kalam replied wryly. On his way over, Fiddler stopped by his backpack. He crouched and set the Tano shell inside, pushing it into the bundle of a spare shirt. Kalam poured him a jug of watered wine as the sapper joined him at the small table, then refilled his own. Well? A cusser in an eggshell, Fiddler said, drinking deep before continuing. 
The walls are crowded with symbols. I'd guess no more than a week. Then the streets run red. We've horses, mules and supplies. We should be nearing the Oathound by then. Safer out there. Fiddler eyed his companion. Kalam's dark, bearish face glistened in the faint daylight from the cloth-covered window. A brace of knives rested on the pitted tabletop in front of the assassin, a whetstone beside them. Maybe, maybe not. The hands on the walls? Fiddler grunted. You noticed them. Symbols of insurrection are plenty. Meeting places announced, rituals to Drajna advertised. I can read all of that as well as any other native. But those unhuman handprints are something else entirely. Kalam leaned forward, picking up a knife in each hand. He idly crossed the blued blades. They seem to indicate a direction. South. Pan Potts and Odham, Fiddler said. It's a convergence. The assassin went still. His dark eyes on the blades crossed before him. That's not a rumour I've heard yet. It's Kimlock's belief. Kimlock? Kalam cursed. He's in the city? So it's said. Fiddler took another mouthful of wine. Telling the assassin of his adventures and his meeting with the spirit walker would send Kalam out through the door. And Kimlock to Hood's gates. Kimlock, his family, his guards, everyone. The man sitting across from him would take no chances. Another gift to you, Kimlock. My silence, Fiddler thought. Footsteps sounded in the back hallway, and a moment later Crocus appeared. It's as dark as a cave in here, he complained. Where's Absalar? Fiddler demanded. In the garden. Where else? The Daru thief snapped back. The sapper subsided. Remnants of his old unease still clung to him. When she was out of sight, trouble would come from it. When she was out of sight, you watched your back, he thought. It was still hard to accept that the girl was no longer what she'd been. Besides, if the patron of assassins chose once more to possess her, the first warning we'd get would be a knife blade across the throat. He needed the taut muscles of his neck, sighing. Crocus dragged a chair to the table, dropped into it, and reached for the wine. We're tired of waiting, he pronounced. If we have to cross this damned land, then let's do it. There's a steaming pile of rubbish behind the garden wall, clogging up the sewage gutter, crawling with rats. The air's hot and so thick with flies, you can barely breathe. We'll catch a plague if we stay here much longer. Let's hope it's the blue tongue, then, Kalam said. What's that? Your tongue swells up and turns blue, Fiddler explained. What's so good about that? You can't talk. The stars bristled overhead, the moon yet to rise as Kalam made his way toward Jenrab. The old ramps climbed to the hill's summit like a giant's stairs, gap tooth where the chiseled blocks of stone had been removed for use in other parts of Erlatan. Tangled scrub filled the gaps, long, wiry roots anchored deep in the slope's fill. The assassin scrambled lithely over the rubble, staying low so that he would make little outline against the sky, should anyone glance up from the streets below. The city was quiet. Its silence unnatural. The few patrols of Malazan soldiery found themselves virtually alone, as if assigned to guard a necropolis, the haunt of ghosts and scant elts. Their unease had made them loud as they walked the alleys, and Kalam had been able to avoid them with little effort. He reached the crest, slipping in between two large limestone blocks that had once formed part of the summit's outer wall. He paused, breathing deep the dusty night air, and looked down on the streets of Erlitan. The Fist's Keep, once the home of the city's holy Falad, rose dark and misshapen above a well-lit compound, like a clenched hand rising from a bed of coals. 
Yet within that stone edifice, the military governor of the Malazan Empire cowered, shutting his ears to the heated warnings of the Red Blades, and whatever Malazan spies and sympathizers had not yet been driven out or murdered. The entire occupying regiment was holed up in the keep's own barracks, having been called in from the outlying garrison forts strategically placed around Early Tan's circumference. The keep could not accommodate such numbers. The well was already foul, and soldiers slept on the Bailey's flagstones under the stars. In the harbour, two ancient Falari triremes were moored off the Malazan Mole, and a lone, undermanned company of marines held the Imperial docks. The Malazans were under siege, with not a hand yet raised against them. Kalam found within himself conflicting loyalties. By birth he was among the occupied, but he had, by choice, fought under the standards of the Empire. He'd fought for Emperor Kellenved, And Dasem Altor, and Whiskey Jack, and Dujek Wanam, he thought. But not Lassine. Betrayal cut those bonds long ago. The Emperor would have cut the heart out of this rebellion with its first beat. A short but unremitting bloodbath, followed by a long peace. But Lassine had left the old wounds to fester, and what was coming would silence Hood himself. Kalam swung back from the hill's crest. The landscape before him was a tumbled maze of shattered limestone and bricks, sinkholes and knotted shrubs. Clouds of insects hovered over black pools. Bats and reason darted among them. Near the center rose the first three levels of a tower, tilted with roots snaking down from a drought-twisted tree on its top. The moor of a doorway was visible at its base. Kalam studied it for a time, then finally approached. He was ten paces from the opening when he saw a flicker of light within. The assassin withdrew a knife, tapped the pommel twice against a block, then crossed to the doorway. A voice from its darkness stopped him. No closer, Kalam Mekha! Kalam spat loudly. Mabra, you think I don't recognize your voice? Vile risen like you never wander far from their nest, which is what made you so easy to find, and following you here was even easier. I have important business to attend to, Mabra growled. Why have you returned? What do you want of me? My debt was with the bridge burners, but they are no more. Your debt was with me, Kalam said. And when the next Malazan dog with the sigil of a burning bridge finds me, he can claim the debt as well? And the next? And the next after that? Oh, no, Cal... The assassin was at the doorway before Mebra realized it, lunging into the darkness, a hand flashing out unerringly to grip the spy by the throat. The man squawked, dragged from his feet as Kalam lifted him and threw him against a wall. The assassin held him there, a knife point pricking the hollow above his breastbone. Something the spy had been clutching to his chest fell, slipping between them to thud heavily at their feet. Kalam did not spare it a glance, his eyes fixed on Mabra's own. The dead, he said. Mabra is an honorable man! The spy gasped. Pays every debt! Pays yours! Kalam grinned. The hand you've just closed on that dagger at your belt had best remain where it is, Mabra. I see all that you plan. There in your eyes. Now look into mine. What do you see? Mabra's breath quickened. Sweat trickled down his brow. Mercy! he said. Galam's brows rose. A fatal misreading. No, no, I ask for mercy, Kalam. In your eyes I see only death, Mabra's death. I shall repay the debt, my old friend. I know much, all that the fist needs to know. I can deliver Oditan into his hands. No doubt, Kalam said, releasing his grip on the man's throat and stepping back. Mabra slid down the wall into a feeble crouch. But leave the fist to his fate. The spy looked up, in his eyes a sudden cunning. You are outlawed, with no wish to return to the Malazan fold. 
You are seven cities once again. Kalam, may the seven bless you. I need the signs, Mabra. Safe passage through the Otan. You know them? The symbols have bread. I know the old ones, and those will get me killed by the first tribe that finds me. Passage is yours with but one symbol, Kalam. Across the breadth of seven cities, I swear it. The assassin stepped back. What is it? You are Dryden's child, a soldier of the apocalypse. Make the whirlwind gesture. Do you recall it? Suspicious, Kalam slowly nodded. Yet I have seen so many more, so many new symbols. What of them? Amidst the cloud of locusts, there is but one, Mabra said. How best to keep the red blades blind? Please, Kalam, you must go. I have repaid the debt. If you have betrayed me, Adephon ben Dalat shall know of it. Tell me, could you escape Quick Ben with his warrens unveiled? Mute, his face pale as the moonlight, Mabra shook his head. The whirlwind. Yes, I swear by the seven. Do not move, Kalam commanded. One hand on the long knife at his belt, the assassin stepped forward, crouched and collected the object that Mabra had dropped earlier. He heard the spy's breath catch and smiled. Perhaps I will take this with me, as guarantee. Please, Kalam, silence! The assassin found himself holding a muslin-wrapped book. He pulled the dirt-stained cloth away. Oh, it's breath, he whispered. From the high fist vaults at Arran, into the hands of an early spy. He looked up and met Mabra's eyes. Does Pormqual know of the theft of that which is to unleash the apocalypse? The little man grinned, displaying a row of sharp silver-capped teeth. The fool could have his silk pillow stolen from under him and would not know it. You see, Kalam, if you take this as guarantee, every warrior of the apocalypse will be hunting you. The holy book of Trijna has been freed and must return to Raraku, where the seeress will raise the whirlwind, Kalam finished. The ancient tome felt heavy as a slab of granite in his hands. Its better in hide binding was stained and scarred, the lambskin pages within smelling of lanolin and bloodbury ink. And on those pages, words of madness, and in the holy desert waits Shaikh the seeress, the rebellion's promised leader, Kalam thought. You shall tell me the final secret, Mabra, the one the carrier of this book must know. The spy's eyes widened with alarm. This cannot be your hostage, Kalam. Take me in its stead, I beg you. I shall deliver it into the holy desert, Raraku, Kalam said, into Shaikh's own hands, and this shall purchase my passage, Mabra. And should I detect any treachery, should I see any single soldier of the apocalypse on my trail, the book is destroyed. Do you understand me? Mabra blinked sweat from his eyes, then jerked a nod. You must ride a stallion the color of sand, your blood blended. You must wear a talabra of red, each night, you must face your trail, on your knees, and unwrap the book and call upon Drajna. That, and no more, not another word, for the whirlwind goddess shall hear and obey, and all signs of your trail shall be obliterated. You must wait an hour in silence, then wrap the book once again. It must never be exposed to sunlight, for the time of the book's awakening belongs to Shaikh. I shall now repeat those instructions. No need, Kalam growled. Are you truly an outlaw? Is this not proof enough? Deliver into Shaikh's hands the Book of Drajna, and your name shall be sung to the heavens for all time, Kalam. Betray the cause, 
and your name shall ride spit into the dust. The assassin shrouded the book once more in its muslin wrap, then tucked it into the folds of his tunic. Our words are done. Blessings of the seven, Kalar Mecca. With a grunt his only reply, Kalar moved to the doorway, pausing to scan outside. Seeing no one under the moonlight, he slipped through the opening. Still crouched against the wall, Mabra watched the assassin leave. He strained to hear telltale sounds of Kalam crossing the rocks, bricks and rubble, but heard nothing. The spy wiped sweat from his brow, tilted his head back against the cool stone, and closed his eyes. A few minutes later, he heard the rustle of armor at the tower's entrance. You saw him? Mabra asked, eyes still shut. A low voice rumbled in reply. Lostara follows him. He has the book. Mabra's thin mouth widened in a smile. Not the visitor I anticipated. Oh no, I could never have imagined such a fortuitous guest. That was Kalam Mecca. The bridge burner. Kiss of hood, Mabra. Had I known, we would have cut him down before he'd taken a step from this tower. And you tried, Mabra said. You and Aralt and Lostara would now be feeding your blood to Jen Rob's thirsty roots. The large warrior barked a laugh, stepping inside. Behind him, as the spy had guessed, loomed Aralt Arpat, guarding the entrance, tall and wide enough to block most of the moonlight. Tene Baralta rested his gauntleted hands on the sword pommels on either side of his hips. What of the man you first approached? Mabra sighed. As I told you, we would likely have needed a dozen nights such as this one. The man took fright, and is probably halfway to Gadanisban by now. He uh, reconsidered, as any reasonable man would. The spy rose to his feet, brushing the dust from his talaba. I cannot believe our luck, Baralta. Tene Baralta's mailed hands was a blur as it flashed out and struck Mabra, the spurred links raking deep gashes across the man's face. Blood spattered the wall. The spy reeled back, hands to his torn face. You are too familiar, Baralta said calmly. You have prepared Kalam, I take it. The proper instructions? Mabra spat blood, then nodded. You shall be able to trail him unerringly, Commander. All the way to Shaikh's camp. Yes, but I beg you be careful, sir. If Kalam senses you, he will destroy the book. Stay a day behind him, even more. Tene Baralta removed a fragment of Bedarin hide from a pouch at his belt. The calf yearns for its mother, he said. And seeks her without fail, Mabra finished. To kill Shaikh, you shall need an army, Commander. The Red Blade smiled. That is our concern, Mabra. Mabra drew a deep breath, hesitating, then said, I ask only one thing, sir. You ask? I beg, Commander. What is it? Kalam lives. Your wounds are uneven, Mabra. Allow me to caress the other side of your face. Hear me out, Commander. The bridge burner has returned to seven cities. He claims himself a soldier of the apocalypse. Yet is Kalam one to join Shaikh's camp? Can a man born to lead content himself to follow? What is your point? Kalam is here for another reason, Commander. He sought only safe passage across the Panpotsam Odom. He takes the book because to do so will ensure that passage. The assassin is heading south. Why? I think that is something the Red Blades and the Empire would know. And such knowledge can only be gained while he yet breathes. You have suspicions? Aaron. Tene Baralta snorted. To slip a blade between Pormqua's ribs? We would all bless that, Mabra. Kalam cares nothing for the high fist. Then what does he seek at Aaron? I can think of only one thing, Commander. 
A ship bound for Malas. Hunched, his face pulsing with pain, Mabra watched with hooded eyes as his words sank roots into the Red Blade Commander's mind. After a long moment, Tene Baralta asked in a low voice, What do you plan? Although it cost him, Mabra smiled. Like massive limestone slabs, each resting against the other, the cliffs rose from the desert floor, the height of four hundred armspans. Gouged across the weathered face were deep fissures, and tucked inside the largest of these, a hundred and fifty armspans above the sands, was a tower. A single arched window showed black against the bricks. Mappo sighed shakily. I see no obvious approach, but there must be one. He shot a glance back at his companion. You believe it is occupied? Ikarium rubbed the crusted blood from his brow, then nodded. He half slid the sword from its sheath, frowning at the fragments of flesh still snagged on the notched edge. The divers had caught them unawares, a dozen leopards the color of sand, streaming from a gully bed less than ten paces to their right as the two travelers prepared to make camp. One of the beasts had leaped onto Mappo's back, jaws closing on the nape of his neck, the fangs punching through the trell's tough hide. It had attacked him as if he was an antelope, trying to bite down on his windpipe as it dragged him down. But Mappo was no antelope. Though the canines sank deep, they found only muscle. Enraged, the trell had reached over his head and torn the animal from his shoulders. Gripping the snarling leopard by its skin and neck and hips, he had slammed it hard against the boulder, shattering its skull. The other eleven had closed in on Ikarium. Even as Mappo flung his attacker's body aside and whirled, he saw four of the beasts lying motionless around the half-blood jaghut. Fear gripped the trell suddenly as his gaze fell on Ikarium. How far? How far has the jag gone? Beru, bless us, please. One of the other beasts had wrapped its jaws around Ikarium's left thigh, and Mappo watched the warrior's ancient sword chop downward, decapitating the leopard. In a macabre detail, the head held on briefly, a blood-gushing lump protruding from the warrior's leg. The surviving cats circled. Mappo lunged forward, hands closing on a lashing tail. He bellowed as he swung the squalling creature through the air. Writhing, the leopard sailed seven or eight paces until it struck a rock wall, snapping its spine. It was already too late for the divers. Realizing its error, it tried to pull away, but Icarium was unrelenting. Giving voice to a keening hum, the jag plunged among the five remaining leopards. They scattered, but not quickly enough. Blood fountained, sheared flesh thudded into the sand. Within moments, five more bodies lay still on the ground. Ikarium whirled, seeking more victims, and the trail took half a step forward. After a moment, Ikarium's high-pitched keening fell away, and he slowly straightened from his crouch. His stony gaze found the trail, and he frowned. Mappo saw the beads of blood on Ikarium's brow. The eerie sound was gone. Not too far. Safe. God's below this path, Mappo thought. I am a fool to follow. Close. All too close. The scent of divers' blood so copiously spilled would draw others. The two had quickly repacked their camp gear and set off at a swift pace. Before leaving, Ikarian withdrew a single arrow from his quiver which he stabbed into the sand in full view. They travelled at a dog trot through the night. Neither was driven by fear of dying. For both of them, it was killing that brought a greater dread. Mappo prayed that Ikarium's arrow would prove sufficient warning. Dawn brought them to the eastern escarpment. Beyond the cliffs rose the range of weathered mountains that divided Raraku from the Panpotsum Nodum. Something had ignored the arrow and was trailing them, perhaps a league behind. The trell had sensed it an hour earlier, a soul taken, and the form it had taken was huge. 
Find us the ascent, Ikarium said, stringing his bow. He set out his remaining arrows, squinting back along their trail. After a hundred paces, the shimmering heat that rose like a curtain obscured everything beyond. If the soul taken came into view and charged, the jag had time to loose half a dozen arrows. The warrens carved into their shafts could bring down a dragon, but Ikarium's expression made it clear he was sickened by the thought. Mappo probed at the puncture wounds on the back of his neck. The torn flesh was hot, septic, and crawling with flies. The muscles ached with a deep throb. He pulled a blade of Jagura cactus from his pack and squeezed its juices onto the wounds. Numbness spread, allowing him to move his arms without the stabbing agony that had had him bathed in sweat over the last few hours. The trail shivered with sudden chill. The cactus juice was so powerful it could be used only once a day, lest the numbing effect spread to the heart and lungs. And if anything, it would make the flies thirstier. He approached the cleft in the rock face. Trail were plains dwellers. Mappo had no special skill in climbing, and he was not looking forward to the task ahead. The fissure was deep enough to swallow the sun's morning light, and narrow at the base, barely the width of his shoulders. Ducking, he slipped inside, the cool, musty air triggering another wave of shivering. His eyes quickly adjusting, he made out the fissure's back wall six paces away. There were no stairs, no handholds. Tilting his head, he looked up. The cleft widened higher up, but was unrelieved until it reached what he took to be the base of the tower. Nothing so simple as a dangling, knotted rope. Growling in frustration, Mappo stepped back into the sunlight. Ikarium stood facing their trail, with arrow knocked and bow raised. Thirty paces from him was a massive brown bear, down on all fours, swaying, nose lifted and testing the wind. The soul taken had arrived. Mappo joined his companion. This one is known to me, he said quietly. The jag lowered his weapon, releasing the bowstring's tension. He is sembling, he said. The bear lurched forward. Mappo blinked against the sudden blurring of his vision. He tasted grit, nostrils twitching at the strong, spicy smell that came with the change. He felt an instinctive wave of fear, a dusty dryness making swallowing difficult. A moment later, the assembling was complete, and a man now strode toward them, naked and pale under the harsh sunlight. Mappo slowly shook his head. When masked... The soul taken was huge, powerful, a mass of muscle. Yet now in his human form, Mesrem stood no more than five feet in height, was almost hairless and thin to the point of emaciation, narrow-faced and shovel-toothed. His small eyes, the colour of garnet, shone within wrinkled nests of humour that drew his mouth into a grin. Map trail my nose told me it was you. It's been a long time, Mess Rem. The soul taken was eyeing the jag. Aye, north of Demold it was. Those unbroken pine forests better suited you, I think, Mappo said, his memories drawn back to that time for a moment, those freer days of massive trellish caravans and the great journeys undertaken. The man's grin fell away. That it did. And you, sir, must be Icarium, maker of mechanisms and now the bane of divers and soul taken. Know that I am greatly relieved you have lowered your bow. There was racing thunder in my chest when I watched you take aim. Icarium was frowning. I would be bane to no one were the choice mine, he said. We were attacked without warning, he added the words sounding strangely uncertain. Meaning you had no chance to warn the hapless creature. Pity the pieces of his soul. I, however, am anything but precipitous, cursed only with a curious nose. What scent is joined with the trails, I wondered, so close to Jaghut blood, yet different? Now that my eyes have given me answer, I can resume the path. 
Do you know where it takes you? Mappo asked. Mesram stiffened. You have seen the gates? No. What do you expect to find there? Answers, old friend. Now I shall spare you the taste of my veering by putting some distance between us. Do you wish me well, Mappo? I do, Mesremp, and add a warning. We crossed paths with Rylandaras four nights ago. Be careful. Something of the savage bear glittered in the soul taken's eyes. I shall look out for him. Mappo and Ikarian watched the man walk away, disappearing behind an outcrop of rock. Madness lurked within him, Ikarium said. The trail flinched at those words. Within them all, he sighed. I've yet to find an ascent, by the way. The cave reveals nothing. The sound of shod hooves reached them, slow and plodding. From a trail paralleling the cliff face, a man on a black mule appeared. He sat cross-legged on a high wood saddle, shrouded in a ragged dirt-stained talaba. His hands, which rested on the ornate saddle horn, were the color of rust. A hood hid his features. The mule was a strange-looking beast, its muzzle black, the skin of its ears black, as were its eyes. No lightning of its ebon hue was anywhere visible, with the exception of dust and spatters of what might have been dried blood. The man swayed on the saddle as they approached. No way in, he hissed. But the way out, it's not yet the hour. A life given for a life taken. Remember those words, remember them. You are wounded. You are bright with infection. My servant will tend to you. A caring man with salty hands, one wrinkled, one pink. Do you grasp the significance of that? Not yet. Not yet. So few guests. Uh, but I have been expecting you. The mule stopped opposite the cleft, swinging a mournful gaze on the two travellers as its rider struggled to pull his legs from their crossed position. Wimpers of pain accompanied the effort until his frantic attempts overwhelmed his balance and, with a squeal of dismay, the man toppled, thumping into the dust. Seeing crimson red bloom through the Talaba's weave, Mappo stepped forward. You bear your own wounds, sir. The man writhed on the ground like an upended tortoise, his legs still trapped in their cross position. His hood fell back, revealing a large hawk nose, tufts of wiry grey beard, a tattooed bald pate, and skin like dark honey. A row of perfect white teeth showed in his grimace. Mappo knelt beside him, squinting to see signs of the wound that had spilled so much blood. A smell of iron was pungent in the trell's nose. After a moment, he reached under the man's cloak and withdrew an unstoppered bladder. Grunting, he glanced over at Icarium. Not blood. Paint. Red ochre paint. Help me, you oaf, the man snapped. My legs! Bemused, Mappo helped the man unlock his legs, every move a listing moans. As soon as they were free, the man sat up and started beating his own thighs. Servant! Wine! Wine! Damn your wood-rotted brain! I am not your servant, Mappo said coolly, stepping back. Nor do I carry wine when crossing a desert. Not you, barbarian! The man glared about. Where is he? Who? Servant, of course! He thinks carrying me about is his only task. Ah, there! Following the man's gaze, the troll frowned. That is a mule, sir. I doubt he could manage a wineskin well enough to fill a cup. Mappo grinned at Icarium, but the jag was paying no attention to the proceedings. He had unstrung his bow and now sat on a boulder, cleaning his sword. Still sitting on the ground, the man collected a handful of sand and flung it at the mule. Startled, the beast brayed and bolted toward the cleft, disappearing into the cave. 
With a grunt, the man clambered to his feet and stood wobbling, hands held before him, plucking at each other in some kind of nervous tick. Mostly rude greeting of guests, he said, attempting a smile. Most, most rude greeting was meant, meaning this apologies and kindly gestures, very important. I am so sorry for temporary collapse of hospitality. Oh, yes, I, I am. I would have more practice if I wasn't the master of this temple. An acolyte is obliged to fawn and scrape, and later to mutter and gripe with his comrades in misery. Hmm. Ah, here comes servant. A wide-shouldered, bow-legged man in black robes had emerged from the cave, carrying a tray bearing a jug and clay cups. He wore a servant's veil over his features, with only a thin slit for his eyes, which were deep brown. Daisy, fool! Did you see any cobwebs? Servant's accent caught Mappo by surprise. It was Malazan. None, Miss Garal. Call me by my title. High Priest. Wrong! High Priest is Garal Pust of the Tessim Temple of Shadow. Idiot! You are servant, which makes me... Master. Indeed! Miss Garal turned to Mappo. We rarely talk, he explained. Ikarium joined them. This is Tessem, then. I was led to believe it was a monastery, sanctified to the Queen of Dreams. They left, Iskaral snapped, took their lanterns with them, leaving only shadows. Clever jag, but I was warned of that, oh yes. You two are sick as undercooked pigs. Servant has prepared your chambers, and broths of healing herbs, roots, potions, and elixirs. White parolt, emulor, traub. Those are poisons, Mappo pointed out. Are they? Oh, no wonder the pig died. It's almost time. Shall we prepare to ascend? Lead the way, Ikarim invited. A life given for a life taken. Follow me. None can outwit Iskaral Pust. The high priest faced the cleft with a fierce squint. They waited for what Mappo had no idea. After a few minutes, the trail cleared his throat. Will your acolytes send down a ladder? Acolytes? I have no acolytes. No opportunity for tyranny. Very sad. No muttering and grumbling behind my back. Few satisfying rewards for this high priest... If not for my god's whispering, I wouldn't bother. Be assured of that. And I trust you will take that into account with all I have done and am about to do. I see movement in the fissure, Ikarium said. Iskaral grunted. Bokarala! They nest on this cliffside. Foul, mewling beasts. Always interfering, sniffing at this and that. Pissing on the altar, defecating on my pillow. They are my plague. They have singled me out. And why? I've not skinned a single one, nor cooked their brains to scoop out of their skulls in civilised repast. No snares, no traps, no poison. Yet still they pursue me. There is no answer to this. I despair. As the sun sank further... The Bokarala grew bolder, flapping from perch to perch high on the cliff wall, scampering with their hands and feet along cracks in the stone, seeking the risen as the small flying lizards emerged for their night feeding. Small and simian, the Bokarala were winged like bats, tailless with hides mottled tan and brown. Apart from long canines, their faces were remarkably human. From the tower's lone window, a knotted rope tumbled down. A tiny round head poked out to peer down at them. Now, of course, Iskaral added, a few of them have proved useful. Mappo sighed. He'd been hoping for some sorcerous means of ascent to appear, something worthy of a high priest of shadow. So, now we climb. Most certainly not, Iskaral replied with indignation. Servant climbs, then pulls us up. He would be a man of formidable strength to manage me, the Trell said, and Ikarium, too. 
Servant set down the tray he had been holding, spat on his hands, and walked over to the rope. He launched himself upward with surprising agility. Iskaral crouched by the tray and poured wine into the three cups. Servants, half Bokoral. Long arms, muscles like iron. Makes friends with them. Probable source of all my ills. Iskaral collected a cup for himself and gestured down at the tray as he straightened. Fortunate for servant, I am such a gentle and patient master. He swung to check on the man's climb. Hurry, you snub-tailed dog! Servant had already reached the window and was now clambering through it and out of sight. Aminas's gift is servant, a life given for a life taken. One hand old, one hand new. This is true remorse. You'll see. The rope twitched. The high priest quaffed down the last of his wine, flung the cup away, and scrambled toward the rope. Too long exposed. Vulnerable. Quickly now. He wrapped his hands around a knot, set his feet atop another. Pull! Are you deaf? Pull! Iskaral shot upward. Pulleys, Ikarium said. Too fast to be otherwise. The pain returning to his shoulders, Mappo winced, then said, Not what you were expecting, I take it. Tessem, Ikarium said, watching the priest vanish through the window. A place of healing. Solitary reflection, repository of scrolls and tomes, and insatiable nuns. Insatiable? The jag glanced at his friend, an eyebrow rising. Indeed. Oh, sad demise. Very. In this instance, Mappo said as the rope tumbled back down, I think solitary reflection has addled a brain. Battling wits with Bokarala, and the whisperings of a god most hold as himself insane. Yet there is power here, Mappo, Ikarium said in a low voice. Aye, the Trell agreed as he approached the rope. A warren opened in the cave when the mule entered. Then why does the high priest not use it? I doubt we'll find easy answers to Iskaral Pust, friend. Best hold tight, Mappo. Aye. Ikarim reached out suddenly, rested a hand on Mappo's shoulder. Friend. Aye? The jag was frowning. I am missing an arrow, Mappo. More, there is blood on my sword, and I see upon you dreadful wounds. Tell me, did we fight? I recall nothing. The trell was silent a long moment, then he said, I was beset by a leopard while you slept, Ikarium. Made some use of your weapons. I did not think it worthy of mention. Ikarium's frown deepened. Once again, he slowly whispered, I have lost time. Nothing of worth, friend. You would tell me otherwise? There was a look of desperate pleading in the jag's grey eyes. Why would I not, Ikarium? Chapter 3 The Red Blades were, at this time, preeminent among those pro-Malazan organizations that arose in occupied territories. Viewing themselves as progressive in their embrace of the values of imperial unification, this quasi-military cult became infamous with their brutal pragmatism when dealing with dissenting kin. Lives of the Conquered, Ilem Trouth Felician lay unmoving beneath Beneth until, with a final shudder, he was done. He pushed himself off and grabbed a handful of her hair. His face was flushed under the grime, and his eyes gleamed in the lamp glow. You'll learn to like it, girl, he said. The edge of something savage always rose closer to the surface immediately after he'd lain with her. She knew it would pass. I will, she said. Does he get a day of rest? Beneth's grip tightened momentarily, then relaxed. Aye, he does. He moved away, began tying up his breeches. 
though I don't much see the point. The old man won't last another month. He paused, his breath harsh as he studied her. Hood's breath, girl, but you're beautiful. Show me some life next time. I'll treat you right. Get you soap, a new comb, lousebane. You'll work here in twistings, that's a promise. Show pleasure, girl. That's all I ask. Soon, she said, once it stops hurting. The day's eleventh bell had sounded. They were in the third reach off Twisting's far shaft. The reach had been gouged out by the rot legs and was barely high enough to crawl for most of its quarter-mile length. The air was close and stank of ototeral dust and sweating rock. Virtually everyone else would have reached near light by now, but Beneth moved in Captain Sarlok's shadow and could do as he pleased. He had claimed the abandoned reach as his own. It was Felicin's third visit. The first time had been the hardest. Beneth had picked her within hours of her arrival at Skullcup, the mining camp in the Dossin pit. He was a big man, bigger than Bodin, and though a slave himself, he was master of every other slave, the guard's inside man, cruel and dangerous. He was also astonishingly handsome. Felicin had learned fast on the slave ship, she had nothing but her body to sell, but it had proved a valuable currency. Giving herself to the ship guards had been repaid with more food for herself, Hibaric, and Boda. By opening her legs to the right men, she had managed to get herself and her two companions chained on the keel ramp, rather than in the sewage-filled water that sloshed shin-deep beneath the hold's walkway. Others had rotted in that water. Some had drowned when starvation and sickness so weakened them that they could not stay above it. Hebaric's grief and anger at the price she paid had at first been difficult to ignore, filling her with shame. But it had paid for their lives, and that was a truth that could not be questioned. Bodin's only reaction had been, and continued to be, a regard without expression. He watched her as would a stranger, unable to decide who or what she was. Yet he had held to her side, and now stood close to Beneth as well. Some kind of arrangement had been made between them. When Beneth was not there to protect her, Bodin was. On the ship she had learned well the tastes of men, as well as those of the few women guards who'd taken her to their bunks. She thought she'd be prepared for Beneth, and in most ways she was. Everything but his size. Wincing, Felicin pulled on her slave tunic. Beneth watched her, his high cheekbones harsh ridges beneath his eyes, his long curly black hair glistening with whale oil. I'll give the old man deep soil, if you like, he said. You do that? He nodded. For you, I'll change things. I won't take any other woman. I'm king of Skull Cup. You'll be my queen. Bodan will be your personal guard. I trust him. And Hiboric? Beneth shrugged. Him? I don't trust. And he's not much use. Pulling the carts is about all he can do. The carts. Or a plough at deep soil. His gaze flickered at her. But he's your friend. So I'll find something for him. Felicin dragged her fingers through her hair. It's the cards that are killing him. If you've sent him to deep soil just to pull a plough, it's not much of a favour. Beneth's scowl made her wonder if she'd pushed too far. You've never pulled a cart full of stone, girl. Pulled one of those up through half a league of tunnels, then going back down and pulling another one, three, four times a day. Compare that to dragging a plough through soft, broken soil. Damn it, girl. If I'm to move the man off the carts, I've got to justify it. Everyone works in Skull Cup. That's not the whole story, is it? He turned his back on her in answer and began crawling up the reach. I've Canny's wine awaiting us and fresh bread and cheese. Beulah's made a stew for the guards and we've got a bowl each. Felicin followed. The thought of food made her mouth water. If there was enough cheese and bread, she could save some for Hiboric. 
though he insisted that it was fruit and meat that was needed. But both were worth their weight in gold and just as rare in Skull Cup. He'd be grateful enough for what she brought him, she knew. It was clear that Sawak had received orders to see the historian dead. Nothing so overt as murder. The political risks were too great for that. Rather, the slow, wasting death of poor diet and overwork. That he had no hands gave the pit captain sufficient reason to assign Hiboric to the cards. Daily, he struggled at his harness, hauling hundreds of pounds of broken rock up the deep mine to the shaft's near light. In every other harness was an ox. The beasts each hauled three carts, while Hiboric pulled but one, the only acknowledgement the guards made to his humanity. Beneth was aware of Sawak's instructions. Felicen was certain of that. The King of Skullcup had limits to his power for all his claims otherwise. Once they reached the main shaft, it was four hundred paces to Twisting's near light. Unlike Deepmine, with its thick, rich, and straight vein of Ototeral running far under the hills, Twisting's followed a folded vein, rising and diving, buckling and turning through the limestone. Unlike the iron mines on the mainland, Ototeral never ran down into true bedrock. Found only in limestone, the veins ran shallow and long, like rivers of rust between compacted beds filled with fossil plants and shellfish. Limestone is just the bones of things once living, Hibarak had said their second night in the hovel they'd claimed off Spit Row, before Beneth had moved them to the more privileged neighborhood behind Bula's Inn. I'd read that theory before, and am now myself convinced. So now I'm led to believe that Ototeril is not a natural ore. That's important? Bodin had asked. If not natural, then what? Hiboric grinned. Ototeril, the bane of magic, was born of magic. If I was less scrupulous a scholar, I'd write a treatise on that. What do you mean? Felicin asked. He means, Bodan said, he'd be inviting alchemists and mages to experiment in making their own Ototeril. Is that a problem? Those veins we dig, Hiboric explained, they're like a layer of once melted fat, a deep river of it sandwiched between layers of limestone. This whole island had to melt to make those veins. Whatever sorcery created Ota Terrell proved beyond controlling. I would not want to be responsible for unleashing such an event all over again. A single Malazan guard waited at Near Light's gate. Beyond him stretched the raised road that led into the pit town. At the far end, the sun was just setting beyond the pit's ridgeline, leaving Skull Cup in its early shadow, a pocket of gloom that brought blessed relief from the day's heat. The guard was young, resting his van-braced forearms on the crossblades of his pike. Beneth grunted. Where's your mate, Pella? The docile pig wandered off, Beneth. Maybe you can tune Sawak's ear. Who knows he's not hearing us? The docile regulars have lost all discipline. They ignore the duty rosters, spend all their time tossing coins at Beulah's. There's seventy-five of us, and over two hundred of them, Beneth. And all this talk of rebellion? Explain it to Sawak. You don't know your history, Beneth said. The docile have been on their knees for three hundred years. They don't know any other way to live. First, it was mainlanders, then Falari colonists, now you Malazans. Calm yourself, boy, before you lose face. History comforts the dull-witted, the young Malazan said. Beneth barked a laugh as he reached the gate. And whose words are those, Pella? Not yours. The guard's brows rose. I forget your corollary sometimes, Beneth. Those words? Imprakelenved. Pella's gaze slid to Felicin with a hint of sharpness. Dyker's Imperial Campaigns, Volume 1. Your Malazan, Felicin. Do you recall what comes next? She shook her head, bemused by the young man's veiled intensity. I've learned to read faces, Felicin thought. Beneth, 
senses nothing. I'm not familiar with Dyker's works, Pella. Worth learning, the guard said with a smile. Sensing Beneth's growing impatience at the gaze, Felicen stepped past Pella. I doubt there's a single scroll in Skull Cup, she said. Maybe you'll find someone's memory worth dragging a net through, eh? Felicen glanced back with a frown. The boy flirting with you, Beneth asked from the ramp. Be gentle, girl. I'll think on that, Felicen told Pella in a low voice before resuming her walk through the Twisting's Gate. Joining Beneth on the raised road, she smiled up at him. I don't like nervous types. He laughed. <laughs> that puts me at ease. Blessed Queen of Dreams, make that true, she thought. Rubble-filled pits lined the raised road until it joined the other two roads at the Three Fates Crossing, a broad fork that was flanked by two squat docile guardhouses. North of Twisting's Road and on their right as they approached the forks was Deep Mine Road. To the south and on their left ran Shaft Road, leading to a worked-out mine where the dead were disposed of each dusk. The body wagon was nowhere to be seen, meaning it had been held up on its route through the pit town, with more than the usual number of bodies being brought out and tossed onto its bed. They crossed the fork and continued onto Work Road. Past the north dust eye guardhouse was Sinker Lake, a deep pool of turquoise-coloured water stretching all the way to the north pit wall. It was said the water was cursed, and to dive into it was to disappear. Some believed a demon lived in its depths. Habaric asserted that the lack of buoyancy was a quality of the lime-saturated water itself. In any case, few slaves were foolish enough to try and escape in that direction for the pit wall was as sheer on the north side as it was on the others, forever weeping water over a skin of deposits that glimmered like wet, polished bone. Hebaric had asked Felicin to keep an eye on Sinker's Lake's water level, in any case, now that the dry season had come, and as they walked Work Road, she studied the far side as best she could in the dim light. A line of crust was visible a hand span above the surface. The news would please him though she had no idea why. The notion of escape was absurd. Beyond the pit was lifeless desert and withered rock, with no drinkable water in any direction for days. Those slaves who somehow made it up to the pit edge and then eluded the patrols on Beetle Road, the track that surrounded the pit, had left their bones in the desert's red sands. Few got that far and the spikes named Salvation Row on the sheer wall of the tower at Rust Ramp displayed their failure for all to see. Not a week went past without a new victim appearing on the tower wall. Most died before the first day was through, but some lingered longer. Work Road ran its worn cobbles past Beulah's Inn on the right and the row of brothels on the left before opening out into Rat Hole Round. In the round centre rose Sawak's Keep, a hexagonal tower of cut limestone three stories high. Only Beneth, among all the slaves, had ever been inside. Twelve thousand slaves lived in Skull Cup, the vast mining pit thirty leagues north of the island's lone city on the south coast, Dosin Pali. In addition to them and the three hundred guards, there were locals, prostitutes for the brothels, serving staff for Beulah's Inn and the gambling halls, a caste of servants who had bound their lives and the lives of their families to the Malazan soldiery, Hawkers for the struggling market that filled Rat Hole Round on rest day, and a scattering of the banished, the destitute, and the lost, who'd chosen a pit town over the rotting alleyways of Dosin Pali. The stew will be cold, Beneth muttered as they approached Beulah's Inn. Felicin wiped sweat from her brow. That will be a relief. You're not used to the heat. In a month or two, You'll feel the chill of night, just like everyone else. These early hours still hold the day's memory. I feel the cold of midnight and the hours beyond, Beneth. Move in with me, girl. I'll keep you warm enough. He was already on the edge of one of his sudden dark moods. She said nothing, hoping he would let it go for the moment. 
Be careful of what you refuse, Beneth rumbled. Beulah would take me to her bed, she said. You could watch, perhaps join in. She'd be sure to warm the bowls for us, even second helpings. She's old enough to be your mother, Beneth growled. And you, my father, she thought. But she heard his breathing change. She's round and soft and warm, Beneth. Think on that. She knew he would, and the subject of moving in with him would drift away. For this night, at least, she thought. Eboric's wrong. There's no point in thinking about tomorrow. Just the next hour. Each hour. Stay alive, Felician, and live well if you can. One day, you'll find yourself face to face with your sister, and an ocean of blood pouring from Tavora's veins won't be enough, though all they hold will suffice. Stay alive, girl. That's all you must do. Survive each hour, the next hour. She slipped her hand into Beneth's as they reached the inn's door and felt in it the sweat born of the visions she had given him. One day, face to face, sister. Hibaric was still awake, bundled in blankets and crouched beside the hearth fire. He glanced up as Felicin climbed into the room and locked the floor hatch. She collected a sheepskin wrap from a chest and pulled it around her shoulders. Would you have me believe you've come to enjoy the life you've chosen, girl? Nights like these, and I wonder. I thought you'd be tired of judgments by now, Hiboric, Felicin said as she collected a wineskin from a peg and picked through a pile of gourd shells seeking a clean one. I take it Bodan's not back yet. Seems even the minor chore of cleaning our cups is beyond him. She found one that would pass without too close an inspection and squeezed wine into it. That will dry you out, Hiboric observed. Not your first of the night either, I'd wager. Don't father me, old man. The tattooed man sighed. Who'd take your sister anyway, he muttered. She wasn't satisfied with seeing you dead. She'd rather turn her fourteen-year-old sister into a whore. If Faina has heard my prayers, Tavora's fate will exceed her crimes. Felicin drained half the cup, her eyes veiled as she studied Tiboric. I entered my sixteenth year last month, she said. His eyes looked suddenly very old as he met her gaze for a moment before returning his attention to the hearth. Felicin refilled the cup, then joined Hiboric at the square, raised fireplace. The burning dung in the groundstone basin was almost smokeless. The pedestal the basin sat on was glazed and filled with water. Kept hot by the fire, the water was used for washing and bathing, while the pedestal radiated enough heat to keep the night's chill from the single room. Fragments of docile spun rug and reed mats cushioned the floorboards. The entire dwelling was raised on stilts five feet above the sands. Sitting down on a low wooden stool, Felicin pushed her chilled feet close to the pedestal. I saw you at the carts today, she said, her words slightly slurred. Gunnip walked beside you with a switch. Hibaric grunted. That amused them all day, Gunnip telling his guards he was swatting flies. Did he break skin? Aye, but Fainus tracks heal me well, you know that. The wounds, yes, uh, but not the pain. I can see, Hiboric. His glance was wry. Surprised you can see anything, lass. Is that Durhang I smell, too? <laughs> Careful with that. The smoke will pull you into a deeper and darker shaft than deep mine could ever reach. Felician held out a pebble-sized black button. I deal with my pain. You deal with yours. He shook his head. I appreciate the offer, but not this time. You hold there in your hand a month's pay for a docile guard. I'd advise you to use it in trade. 
She shrugged, returning the dohang to the pouch at her belt. I've nothing I need that Beneth won't give me already. All I need do is ask. And you imagine he gives it to you freely? She drank. As good as. You're being moved, Haboric, to deep soil, starting tomorrow. No more Gunnip and his switch. He closed his eyes. Why does thanking you leave such a bitter taste in my mouth? My wine-soaked brain whispers hypocrisy. She watched the colour leave his face. Oh, Felicin, too much Durhang, too much wine, she thought. Do I only do good for Hiboric, to give me salt for his wounds? I've no wish to be so cruel. She withdrew from beneath her tunic the food she had saved for him, leaned forward and placed the small wrapped bundle in his lap. Sinker Lake has dropped another hand's width. He said nothing, eyes on the stumps at the ends of his wrists. Felicin frowned. There was something else she wanted to tell him, but her memory failed her. She finished the wine and straightened, running both hands back through her hair. Her scalp felt numb. She paused, seeing Haborak surreptitiously glance at her breasts, round and full under the stretched tunic. She held the pose a moment longer than was necessary, then slowly lowered her arms. Beulah has fantasies of you, she said slowly. It's the possibilities that intrigue her. It would do you some good, Hiboric. He spun away off the stool, the untouched food bundle falling to the floor. Hood's breath, girl! She laughed, watching him sweep aside the hanging that separated his cot from the rest of the room, then clumsily yank it back behind him. After a moment, her laughter fell away, and she listened to the old man climb onto his cot. I'd hoped to make you smile, Hiboric, she wanted to explain, and I didn't want my laughter to sound so hard. I'm not what you think I am. Am I? She retrieved the wrapped food and placed it on the shelf above the basin. An hour later, with Felicin lying awake on her cot and Iboric on his, Bodan returned. He stoked up the hearth, moving about quietly. Not drunk. She wondered where he'd been. She wondered where he went every night. It would not be worth asking him. Boda had few words for anyone, and even fewer for her. After a moment, she was forced to reconsider as she heard the man flick a finger against Haborak's divider. He responded promptly with low words she could not make out, and Bodan whispered something back. The conversation continued a minute longer, then Bodan softly grunted his laugh grunt and moved off to his own bed. The two were planning something, but it was not this that shook her. It was that she was being excluded. A flash of anger followed this realization. I've kept them alive, she thought. I've made their lives easier since the transport ship. Beulah's right. Every man's a bastard, good enough only to be used. Very well. See for yourselves what Skullcap is for everyone else. I'm done with favors. I'll see you back on the carts, old man, I swear it. She found herself fighting tears and knew she would do nothing of the sort. She needed Beneth, that was true enough, and she'd pay to keep him. But she needed Hiboric and Bodin as well, and a part of her clung to them as a child to parents, denying the hardness that everywhere else filled her world. To lose that, to lose them, would be to lose everything. Clearly they thought that she'd sell their trust as readily as she did her own body. But it wasn't true. I swear, it's not true. Felicin stared up into the darkness, tears streaming from her eyes. I'm alone. <laughs> There's just Beneth now. Beneth and his wine and his durhang and his body. She still ached between her legs from when Beneth had finally joined her and Beulah on the innkeeper's huge bed. It was, she told herself, simply a matter of will to turn pain into pleasure. 
survive each hour. The Quayside Market had begun drawing the morning crowds, reinforcing the illusion that this day was no different from any other. Chilled with a fear that even the rising sun could not master, Diker sat cross-legged on the sea wall, his gaze travelling out over the bay into Sahul Sea, willing the return of Admiral Nock and the fleet. But those were orders even Coltane could not countermand. The Wiccan had no authority over the Malazan warships, and Porm Qual's recall had seen the Sahul fleet depart Hissar's harbour this very morning for the month-long journey to Arun. For all the pretense of normality, the departure had not gone unnoticed by Hissar's citizens, and the morning market was increasingly shrill with laughter and excited voices. The oppressed had won their first victory, and all that would distinguish it from those to follow was its bloodlessness, or so ran the sentiment. The only consolation Diker could consider was that the Gistal high priest Malik Rel had departed with the fleet. It was not a difficult thing, however, to imagine the report the man would prepare for Pormqual. A Malazan sail in the strait caught his eye, a small transport coming in from the northeast. Dossin Pali on the island, perhaps, or from farther up the coast, he thought. It would be an unscheduled arrival, making Diker curious. He felt a presence at his side and glanced over to see Culp clambering up onto the wide, low wall, dangling his legs down to the cloudy water ten paces below. It's done, he said, as if the admission amounted to a confession of foul murder. Word has been sent in. Assuming your friend is still alive, he'll receive his instructions. Thank you, Culp. The maid shifted uneasily. He rubbed at his face, squinting at the transport ship as it entered the harbour. A patrol dory approached the craft as the crew struck the lone sail. Two men in glinting armour stood on deck, watching as the dory came alongside. One of the armoured men leaned over the gunwale and addressed the harbour official. A moment later, the dory's oarsmen were swinging the craft around with obvious haste. Diker grunted. Did you see that? Aye, Culp growled. The transport glided toward the Imperial Pier, pushed along by a low bank of oars that had appeared close to the hull's waterline. A moment later, the pier-side oars withdrew back into the ship. Dockmen scrambled to receive the cast lines. A broad gangplank was being readied, and horses were now visible on the deck. Red blades, Diker said, as more armoured men appeared on the transport, standing alongside their mounts. From Dossin Pali, Culp said. I recognise the first two, Baria Cetral and his brother Mesca. They have another brother, Otto. He commands the Aaron Company. The Red Blades, the historian mused. They've no illusions about the state of affairs. Words come that they are attempting to assert control in other cities. And here we are to witness a doubling of their presence in Hissar. I wonder if Coltane knows. A new tension filled the market. Heads had turned and eyes now observed as Baria and Mesca led their troops onto the pier. The Red Blades were equipped and presented for war. They bristled with weapons, with full chain leggings and the slitted visors on their helms lowered. Bows were strung, arrows loosened in their quivers. The horse blades were unsheathed and jutting from their mount's forelegs. Culp spat nervously. Don't like the look of this! he muttered. It looks as if... They intend to attack the market, Culp said. This isn't just for show, Diker. Fainer's hoof! The historian glanced at Culp, his mouth dry. You've opened your warren. Not replying, the mage slid off the seawall, eyes on the red blades, who were now mounted and lining up at pier's end, facing five hundred citizens who had fallen silent and were now backing away filling the aisles between the carts and awnings. The contraction of the crowd would trigger panic, which was precisely what the Red Blades intended. Lances dangling from loops of rawhide around their wrists, the Red Blades knocked arrows, the horses quivering under them, but otherwise motionless. The crowd seemed to shiver in places, as if the ground was shifting beneath it. 
Diker saw figures moving, not away, but toward the facing line. Culp took half a dozen steps toward the red blades. The figures pushed through the last of the crowd, pulling away their Talaba cloaks and hoods, revealing leather armor with stitched black iron scales. Long knives flashed in gloved hands. Dark eyes in tanned, tattooed Wiccan faces held cold and firm on Baria and Mesca Cetral and their warriors. Ten Wiccans now faced the forty-odd red blades, the crowd behind them as silent and as motionless as statues. Stand aside! Baria bellowed, his face dark with fury. Or die! The Wiccans laughed with fearless derision. Pushing himself forward, Diker followed Culp as the mage strode hurriedly toward the Red Blades. Mesker snapped out a curse upon seeing Culp approach. His brother glanced over, scowling. Don't be a fool, Baria! The mage hissed. The commander's eyes narrowed. Fling magic at me, and I'll cut you down, he said. Now at closer range, Dyker saw the Ototeral links interwoven in Baria's chain armor. We shall cut this handful of barbarians down, Mesker growled, then properly announce our arrival in Hissar, with the blood of traitors. And five thousand Wiccans will avenge the deaths of their kin, Culp said, and not with quick sword strokes. No, you'll be hung still alive from the seawall spikes for the seagulls to play with. Coltane's not yet your enemy, Baria. Sheathe your weapons and report to the new fist, Commander. To do otherwise will be to sacrifice your life and the lives of your soldiers. You ignore me, Mesker said. Baria is not my keeper, mage. Culp sneered. Be silent, pup. Where Barrier leads, Mesker follows. Or will you now cross blades with your brother? Enough, Mesker, Barrier rumbled. His brother's talwar rasped from its scabbard. You dare command me? The Wiccans shouted encouragement. A few brave souls in the crowd behind them laughed. Mesker's face was sickly with rage. Barrier sighed. Brother... This is not the time. A mounted troop of Hissar guard appeared above the heads of the crowd, pushing along the aisles between the market stalls. A chorus of hoots sounded to their left, and Diker and the others turned to see three score Wiccan bowmen with arrows knocked and bows drawn on the red blades. Baria slowly raised his left hand, making a twisting gesture. His warriors lowered their own weapons. Snarling with disgust, Meska slammed his tulwar back into its wooden scabbard. Your escort has arrived, Culp said dryly. It seems the fist has been expecting you. Diker stood at the mage's side and watched as Baria led the red blades forward to meet the Hisari troop. The historian shook himself. Hood's breath, Culp. That was a chancy cast of the knuckles. The man grunted. You can always count on Mesca Cetral, he said. As brainless as a cat and just as easy to distract. For a moment there, I was hoping Baria would accept the challenge. Whatever the outcome, there'd be one less Cetral, and that's an opportunity missed. Those disguised Wiccans, Diker said, were not part of any official welcome. Coltrane had infiltrated the market. A cunning dog is Coltrane. Diker shook his head. They've shown themselves now. Aye, and showed as well they were ready to lay down their lives to protect the citizens of Hissar. Had Coltane been here, I doubt he would have ordered those warriors forward, Culp. Those Wiccans were eager for a fight. Defending the market mob had nothing to do with it. The mage rubbed his face. Best hope the Hisari believe otherwise. Come, Diker said. Let us take wine. I know a place in Imperial Square, and on the way you can tell me how the Seventh has warmed to their new fist. Culp barked a laugh as they began walking. Respect, maybe, but not warmth. He's completely changed the drills. 
We've done one battlefield formation since he arrived, and that was the day he took command. Diker frowned. I've heard that he was working the soldiers to exhaustion, that he didn't even need to enforce the curfew, since everyone was so eager for sleep, and the barracks were silent as tombs by the eighth bell. If not practicing wheels and turtles and shield walls, then what? The ruined monastery on the hill south of the city. You know the one? Just foundations left, except for the central temple, but the chest-high walls cover the entire hilltop like a small city. The sappers have built them up, roofed some of them over. It was a maze of alleys and cul-de-sacs to begin with, but Coltane had the sappers turn it into a nightmare. I'd wager their soldiers still wandering around lost in there. The Wiccan has us there every afternoon. Mock battles, street control, assaulting buildings, breakout tactics, retrieving wounded. Coltane's warriors act the part of rioting mobs and looters. And I tell you, historian, they were born to it. He paused for breath. Every day, we bake under the sun on that bone-bleached hill, broken down to squad level, each squad assigned impossible objectives. He grimaced. Under this new fist, each soldier of the Seventh has died a dozen times or more in mock battle. Corporal List has been killed in every exercise so far. The poor boy's hood addled. And through it all, those Wiccan savages hoot and howl. Dyker said nothing as they continued on their way to Imperial Square. When they entered the Malazan Quarter, the historian finally spoke. Something of a rivalry, then between the 7th and the Wiccan Regiment. Oh, aye, that tactic's obvious enough, but it's going too far, I think. We'll see in a few days' time, when we start getting Wiccan Lancer support. They'll be double-crossing, mark my words. They strode into the square. And you? Diker asked. What task has Coltane given the 7th last cadre mage? Folly. I conjure illusions all day until my skull's ready to burst. Illusions? In the mock battles? Aye, and it's what makes the objective so impossible. Believe me, there's been more than one curse thrown my way, Diker. More than one. What do you conjure? Dragons? I wish. I create Malazan refugees, historian, by the hundred... A thousand weighted scarecrows for the soldiers to drag around aren't sufficient for Coltane. The ones he has me create flee the wrong way, or refuse to leave their homes, or drag furniture and other possessions. Coltane's orders. My refugees create chaos, and so far cost more lives than any other element in the exercises. I'm not a popular man, Diker. What of Sormo Enath? the historian asked, his mouth suddenly dry. The warlock? Nowhere to be seen. Tyker nodded to himself. He'd already guessed Culp's answer to that question. You're busy reading the stones in the sand, Sormo, aren't you? He thought. While Coltane hammers the seventh into shape as guardians to Malazan refugees. Mage, he said. Aye. Dying a dozen times in mock battle is nothing. When it's for real, you die but once. Push the seventh gulp, any way you can. Show Coltane what the seventh's capable of. Talk it over with the squad leaders. Tonight. Come tomorrow, win your objectives, and I'll talk to Coltane about a day of rest. Show him, and he'll give it. What makes you so certain? Because... Time's running out, he thought, and he needs you. He needs you sharp. Win your objectives. Leave the fist to me. Very well. I'll see what I can do. Corporal List died within the first few minutes of the mock engagement. Bolt, commanding a howling mob of Wiccans rampaging down the ruin's main avenue, had personally clouted the hapless Malazan on the side of his head, hard enough to leave the boy scrawled unconscious in the dust. The veteran warrior had then thrown List over one shoulder and carried him from the battle. 
Grinning, Balt jogged up the dusty track to the rise from which the new fist and a few of his officers observed the engagement, and dropped the corporal into the dust at Coltane's feet. Diker sighed. Coltane glanced around. Healer, attend the boy. One of the seventh cutters appeared, crouching at the corporal's side. Coltane's slitted eyes found Diker. I see no change in this day's proceedings, historian. It is early yet, Fist. The Wiccan grunted, returning his attention to the dust-filled ruins. Soldiers were emerging from the chaos, fighters from the Seventh, and Wiccans staggering with minor wounds and broken limbs. Readying his cudgel, Balt scowled. You spoke too soon, Coltane, he said. This one's different. There were, Dyker saw, more Wiccans among the victims than soldiers of the Seventh and the ratio was widening with every passing moment. Somewhere in the chaotic clouds of dust, the tide had turned. Coltane called for his horse. He swung himself into the saddle and shot Bull to glare. Stay here, uncle. Where are my lancers? He waited impatiently as forty horsemen rode onto the rise. Their lances were blunted with bundled strips of leather. For all that, Dyker knew, Anything more than a glancing blow from them was likely to break bones. Coltane led them at a canter toward the ruins. Balt spat dust. It's about time, he said. What is? Diker asked. The Seventh's finally earned Lancer support. It's been a week overdue, historian. Coltane had expected a toughening, but all we got was a wilting. Who's given them new spines, then? You? Careful, or Coltane will make you a captain. As much as I'd like to take credit, Diker said, this is the work of Culp and the squad sergeants. Culp's making things easier, then. No wonder they've turned the battle. The historian shook his head. Culp follows Coltane's orders, Bolt. If you're looking for a reason to explain your Wiccan's defeat, you'll have to look elsewhere. You might start with the Seventh, showing their true mettle. Perhaps I shall, the veteran mused, a glint in his small, dark eyes. The Fist called you uncle. I. Well, are you? Am I what? Diker gave up. He was coming to understand the Wiccan sense of humour. No doubt there would be another half a dozen or so brisk exchanges before Balt finally relented with an answer. I could play it through, he thought, or I could let the bastard wait. Wait forever, in fact. From the dust clouds a score of refugees appeared, wavering strangely as they walked, each of them burdened with impossible possessions. Massive dressers, chests, larder-packed cupboards, candlesticks and antique armour. Flanking the move in a protective cordon were soldiers of the Seventh, laughing and shouting and beating swords on shields as they made good their withdrawal. Bolt barked a laugh. Heh, <laughs> my compliments to Culp when you see him, historian. The Seventh's earned a day of rest, Diker said. The Wiccan raised his hairless brows. For one victory? They need to savour it, Commander. Besides, the healers will be busy enough mending bones. You don't want them with exhausted warrens at the wrong time. And the wrong time is soon, is it? I am sure, Diker said slowly. Somo Enath would agree with me. Bolt spat again. My nephew approaches. Coltane and his lancers had appeared, providing cover for the soldiers, many of whom dragged or carried the scarecrow refugees. The sheer numbers made it clear that victory for the Seventh had been absolute. Is that a smile on Coltane's face? Diker asked. Just for a moment, I thought I saw mistaken. No doubt, Bolt growled. But Diker was coming to know these Wiccans, and he detected a hint of humour in the veteran's voice. After a moment, Bolt continued. 
take word to the seventh historian. They've earned their day. Fiddler sat in darkness. The overgrown garden had closed in around the well and its crescent-shaped stone bench. Above the sapper, only a small patch of starlit sky was visible. There was no moon. After a moment, he cocked his head. You move quietly, lad. I'll give you that. Crocus hesitated behind Fiddler, then joined him on the bench. Guess you've never expected him to pull rank on you like that, the young man said. Is that what it was? That's what it seemed like. Fiddler made no reply. The occasional risen flitted through the clearing in pursuit of the cape moths hovering above the well mouth. The cool night air was rank with rotting refuse from beyond the back wall. She's upset, Crocus said. The sapper shook his head. Upset. It was an argument. We weren't torturing prisoners. Absalar doesn't remember any of that. I do, lad, and those are hard memories to shake. She's just a fisher girl. Most of the time, Fiddler said, but sometimes. He shook his head. Crocus sighed, then changed the subject. So it wasn't part of the plan, then, Kalam going off on his own. Old blood calls, lad. Kalam's seven cities born and raised. Besides, he wants to meet this sheikh, this desert witch, the Hand of Dreijna. Now you're taking his side, Crocus said in quiet exasperation. A tenth of a bell ago, you nearly accused him of being a traitor. Fiddler grimaced. Confusing times for us all. We've been outlawed by Lassine, but does that make us any less soldiers of the Empire? Malaz isn't the Empress, and the Empress isn't Malaz. A moot distinction, I'd say. The sapper glanced over. Would you now? Ask the girl. Maybe she'll explain it. But you're expecting the rebellion. In fact, you're counting on it. Don't mean we have to be the ones who trigger the whirlwind, though, does it? Kalam wants to be at the heart of things. It's always been his way. This time, the chance literally fell into his lap. The Book of Dreijna holds the heart of the whirlwind goddess. To begin the apocalypse, it needs to be opened by the seeress and no one else. Kalam knows it might well be suicidal, but he'll deliver that hood-cursed book into Shaikh's hands and so add another crack in Lassine's crumbling control. Give him credit for insisting on keeping the rest of us out of it. There you go again, defending him. The plan was to assassinate Lassine, not get caught up in this uprising. It still doesn't make any sense coming to this continent. Fiddler straightened, eyes on the stars glittering overhead. Desert stars, sharp diamonds that ever seemed eager to draw blood. There's more than one road to Unter, lad. We're here to find one that's probably never been used before and may not even work. But we'll look for it anyway, with Kalam or without him. Who knows? It might be Kalam's taking the wiser path, overland, down to Aran, by mundane ship back to Quantali. Maybe dividing our paths will prove the wisest decision of all, increasing our chances that one of us, at least, will make it through. Right, Crocus snapped. And if Kalam doesn't make it, you'll go after Lassine yourself? A glorified ditch digger and long in the tooth at that? You hardly inspire confidence, Fiddler. We're still supposed to be taking Absalar home. Fiddler's voice was cold. Don't... Push me, lad. A few years pilfering purses on Darugistan streets don't qualify you to cast judgment on me. Branches thrashed in the tree opposite the two men, and Moby appeared, hanging one-armed, a risen struggling in its jaws. The familiar's eyes glittered as bones crunched. Fiddler grunted. Back in Quantali, he said slowly, We'll find more supporters than you might imagine. No one's indispensable, nor should anyone be dismissed as useless. Like it or not, lad, you've some growing up to do. You think me stupid, but you're wrong. 
You think I'm blind to the fact that you're thinking you've got another shaved knuckle in the hole. And I don't mean quick, Ben. Kalam's an assassin who just might be good enough to get to Lacine. But if he doesn't, there's another one who just might still have in her the skills of a god. But not any old god, no. The patron of assassins, the one you call the rope. So you keep prodding her. You're taking her home because she isn't what she once was. But the truth is, you want the old one back. Fiddler was silent for a long time, watching Moby eating the risen. When it finally swallowed down the last of the winged lizard, the sapper cleared his throat. I don't think that's deep, he said. I run on instinct. Are you telling me that using Absalar didn't occur to you? Not to me, no. But Kilam? Fiddler resisted, then shrugged. If he didn't think of it, Quick Ben would have. Crocus's hiss was triumphant. I knew it. I'm no fool. Oh, Hood's breath, lad, that you're not. I won't let it happen, Fiddler. This Bokoral of your uncle's, the sapper said, nodding at Moby. It's truly a familiar, a servant to a sorcerer. But if Mammoth is dead, why is it still here? I'm no mage, but I thought such familiars were magically fused to their masters. I don't know, Crocus admitted, his tone retaining an edge that told Fiddler the lad was entirely aware of the sapper's line of thinking. Maybe he's just a pet. You'd better pray it so. I said I wouldn't let you use Absalar. If Moby's a true familiar, it won't just be me you'll have to get past. I won't be trying anything, Crocus, Fiddler said. But I still say you've some growing up to do. Sooner or later, it will occur to you that you can't speak for Absalar. She'll do what she decides, like it or not. The possession may be over, but the god's skills remain in her bones. He slowly turned and faced the boy. What if she decides to put those skills to use? She won't, Crocus said, but the assurance was gone from his voice. He gestured and Moby flapped sloppily into his arms. What did you call him? A boca... Bokaral. They're native to this land. Oh, get some sleep, lad. We're leaving tomorrow. So is Kalam. Aye, but we won't be in each other's company. Parallel paths southward, at least to start with. He watched Crocus head back inside, Moby clinging to the lad like a child. Hood's breath. I'm not looking forward to this journey. A hundred paces inside the caravan gate was the square in which the land traders assembled before leaving Erlitan. Most would strike south along the raised coastal road, following the line of the bay. Villages and outposts were numerous on this route, and the Malazan-built cobble road itself was well patrolled, or rather would have been had not the city's fist recalled the garrisons. As far as Fiddler could learn in speaking with various merchants and caravan guards, Few bandits had yet to take advantage of the troop withdrawal, but from the swollen ranks among the mercenary guards accompanying each caravan, it was clear to the sapper that the merchants were taking no chances. It would have been fruitless for the three Malazans to disguise themselves as merchants on their journey south. They had neither the coin nor the equipment to carry out such a masquerade. With travel between cities as risky as it now was, they had chosen to travel in the guise of pilgrims. To the most devout, the path of the seven, pilgrimage to each of the seven holy cities, was a respected display of faith. Pilgrimage was at the heart of this land's tradition, impervious to the threat of bandits or war. Fiddler retained his growled disguise, playing the role of guardian and guide to Crocus and Absalar, two young, newly married believers embarking on a journey that would bless their union under the seven heavens. Each would be mounted, Fiddler on a gruel bred horse, disdainful of the sapper's imposture and viciously tempered. Crocus and Absala on well-bred mounts, purchased from one of the better stables outside Erlitan. 
Three spare horses and four mules completed the train. Kalam had left with the dawn, offering Fiddler and the others only a terse farewell. The words that had been exchanged the night before sullied the moment of departure. The sapper understood Kalam's hunger to wound Lassine through the blood spilled by rebellion, but the potential damage to the Empire, and to whoever assumed the throne following Lassine's fall, was, to Fiddler's mind, too great a risk. They'd clashed hard then, and Fiddler was left feeling nicked and blunted by the exchange. There was pathos in that parting, Fiddler belatedly realised, for it seemed that the duty that once bound him and Kalam together, to a single cause which was as much friendship as anything else, had been sundered. And for the moment, at least, there was nothing to take its place within Fiddler. He was left feeling lost, more alone than he had been in years. They would be among the last of the trains to leave through Caravan Gate. As Fiddler checked the girth straps on the mules one final time, the sound of galloping horses drew his attention. A troop of six red blades had arrived, slowing their mounts as they entered the square. Fiddler glanced over to where Crocus and Absalar stood beside their horses. Catching the lad's eye, he shook his head, resumed adjusting the mule's girth strap. The soldiers were looking for someone. The troops split, a rider each heading for one of the remaining trains. Fiddler heard hoofs clumping on cobbles behind him, forced himself to remain calm. Crawl! Pausing to spit as the tribesman would at the accosting of a Malazan lapdog, he slowly turned. Beneath the helm's rim, the red blade's dark face had tightened in response to the gesture. One day the red blades will cleanse the hills of Grawl, he promised, his smile revealing dull grey teeth. Fiddler's only reply was a snort. If you have something worthy of being said, red blade, speak. Our shadows are already too short for the leagues we travel this day. A measure of your incompetence, Grawl. I have but one question to ask. Answer truthfully, for I shall know if you lie. We would know if a man on a Rowan stallion rode out alone this morning, through Caravan Gate. I saw no such man, Fiddler replied, but I now wish him well. May the seven spirits guard him for all his days. The red blade snarled. I warn you, your blood is no armour against me, Grawl. You are here with the dawn? Fiddler returned to the mules. One question, he grated. You pay for more with coin, red blade. The soldier spat at Fiddler's feet, jerked his mount's head around, and rode to rejoin the troop. Beneath his desert veil, Fiddler allowed himself a thin smile. Crocus appeared beside him. What was that about? he demanded in a hiss. The sapper shrugged. The Red Blades are hunting someone. Not anything to do with us. Get back to your horse, lad. We're leaving. Kalam? His forearms resting on the mule's back, Fiddler hesitated, squinting against the glare bouncing back from the bleached cobbles. It may have reached them that the holy tome's no longer an Aaron, and someone's delivering it to Shark. No one knows Kalam is here. Crocus looked unconvinced. He met someone last night, Fiddler. An old contact who owes him. Giving him reason to betray Kalam. No one likes being reminded of debts. Fiddler said nothing. After a moment, he patted the mule's back, raising a faint puff of dust, then went to his horse. The growl gelding showed its teeth as he reached for the reins. He gripped the bridle under the animal's chin. It tried tossing its head, but he held firm, leaned close. Show some manners, you ugly bastard, or you'll live to regret it. Gathering the reins, he pulled himself up into the high-backed saddle. Beyond Caravan Gate, the coastal road stretched southward, level despite the gentle rise and fall of the sandstone cliffs that overlooked the bay on the west side. On their left and a league inland ran the Arifal Hills. The jagged serrations of Arifal would follow them all the way to the Ebb River, thirty-six leagues to the south. Barely tamed tribes dwelt in those hills, preeminent among them the Graal. 
Fiddler's greatest worry was running into a real Grohl tribesman. The chance of that was diminished somewhat, given the season, for the Grohl would be driving their goats deep into the range, where both shade and water could be found. They nudged their mounts into a canter and rode past a merchant's train to avoid the trailing dust clouds. Then Fiddler settled them back into a slow trot. The day's heat was already building. Their destination was a small village called Salik, a little over eight leagues distant, where they would stop to eat the midday meal and wait out the hottest hours before continuing on to the Trob River. If all went well, they would reach Gadanisban in a week's time. Fiddler expected Kalam to be two, maybe even three days ahead of them by then. Beyond Gadanisban was the Panpotsen Odin, a sparsely populated wasteland of desiccated hills, the skeletal ruins of long-dead cities, poisonous snakes, biting flies, and, he recalled the spirit walker Kimlock's words, the potential of something far deadlier. A convergence, he thought. Tog's feet. I don't like that thought at all. He thought about the conch shell in his leather pack. Carrying an item of power was never a wise thing. Probably more trouble than it's worth. What if some soul taken sniffs it out, decides it wants it for its collection? He scowled. A collection easily built on with one conch shell and three shiny skulls. The more he thought on it, the more uneasy he became. Better to sell it to some merchant in Gdanishban. The extra coin could prove useful. The thought settled him. He would sell the conch, be rid of it. While no one would deny a spirit walker's power, it was likely dangerous to lean too heavily on it. The Tarno priests gave up their lives in the name of peace. Or worse, Kimlock surrendered his honour. Better to rely on the Moranth incendiaries in my pack than on any mysterious shell. A flamer will burn a soul taken as easily as anyone else. Crocus rode up alongside the sapper. What are you thinking, Fiddler? Nothing. Where's that bokeral of yours? The young man frowned. I don't know. I guess he was just a pet, after all. Went off last night and never came back. He wiped the back of his hand across his face, and Fiddler saw smeared tears on his cheeks. I sort of felt Mammoth was with me, with Moby. Was your uncle a good man, before the jackhat's tyrant took him? Crocus nodded. Fiddler grunted. Then he's with you still. Moby probably sniffed kin in the air. More than a few highborn keep Bokorala as pets in the city. Just a pet, after all. I suppose you're right. For most of my life I thought of Mammoth as just a scholar, an old man always scribbling on scrolls. My uncle but then I found out he was a high priest, important, with powerful friends like Baruch. But before I could even come to terms with that, he was dead, destroyed by your squad. Hold on there, lad. What we killed wasn't your uncle. Not any more. I know. In killing him, you saved Arujistan. I know, Fiddler. It's done, Crocus. And you should realise an uncle who took care of you and loved you is more important than his being a high priest. And he would have told you the same, I imagine, if he'd had the chance. But don't you see? He had power, Fiddler, but he didn't do a damn thing with it. Just hid in his tiny room in a crumbling tenement. He could have owned an estate, sat on the council, made a difference. Fiddler wasn't ready to take on that argument. He'd never had any skill with counsel. Got no advice worth giving anyway, he thought. Did she kick you up here for being so moody, lad? Crocus's face darkened, then he spurred forward, taking point position. Sighing, Fiddler twisted in the saddle and eyed Absala, riding a few paces behind. Lover's spat, is it? She blinked owlishly. Fiddler swung back. Settling in the saddle. Hood's balls, he muttered under his breath. Iskaral passed, poked the broom farther up the chimney, and frantically scrubbed. Black clouds descended onto the hearthstone and settled on the high priest's grey robes. 
You have wood? Mappo asked from the raised stone platform he had been using as a bed and was now sitting on. Iskaral paused. Wood? Wood's better than a broom? For a fire, the troll said, to take out the chill of this chamber. Wood? No, of course not. But dung? Oh, yes. Plenty of dung. A fire? Excellent. Burn them into a crisp. <laughs> a trail known for cunning? No recollection of that. None among the rare mention of trail this, trail that. Finding writings on an illiterate people, very difficult. Hmm. Trell are quite literate, Mappo said. Have been for some time. Seven, eight centuries, in fact. Must update my library. An expensive proposition. Raising shadows to pillage great libraries of the world. He squatted down at the fireplace, frowning through the soot covering his face. Mappo cleared his throat. A burn what into a crisp, high priest? Spiders, of course. This temple is rotten with spiders. Kill them on sight, Trell. Use those thick-soled feet, those leathery hands. Kill them all. Do you understand? Nodding, Mappo pulled a fur blanket closer around him, wincing only slightly as the hide brushed the puckered wounds on the back of his neck. The fever had broken, as much due to his own reserves as, he suspected, the dubious medicines applied by Iskaral's silent servant. The fangs and claws of divers and soul-taken bred a singularly virulent sickness, often culminating in hallucinations, bestial madness, then death. For many who survived, the madness remained, reappearing on a regular basis for one or two nights nine or ten times each year. It was a madness, often characterised, by murder. Iskaral passed to believe Mappo had escaped that fate, but the trail would not himself be confident of that until at least two cycles of the moon had passed without sign of any symptoms. He did not like to think what he would be capable of when gripped in a murderous rage. Many years ago, among the war band ravaging the Jag Odhan, Mappo had willed himself into such a state, as warriors often did and his memories of the deaths he delivered remained with him and always would. If the soul taken's poison was alive within him, Mappo would take his own life rather than unleash its will. Iskaral Pust stabbed the broom into each corner of the small mendicant's chamber that was the Trell's quarters, then reached up to the ceiling corners to do the same. Kill what bites! Kill what stings! This sacred precinct of shadow must be pristine! Kill all that slithers, all that scuttles. You were examined for vermin, the both of you. Oh, yes. No unwelcome visitors permitted. Lie baths were prepared, but nothing on either of you. Mm, I remain suspicious, of course. Have you resided here long, High Priest? No idea. Irrelevant. Importance lies solely in the deeds done, the goals achieved. Time is preparation, nothing more. One prepares for as long as is required. To do this is to accept that planning begins at birth. You are born, and before all else, you are plunged into shadow, wrapped inside the holy ambivalence, there to suckle sweet sustenance. I live to prepare, Trell, and the preparations are nearly complete. Where is Icarium? A life given for a life taken, Tell him that. In the library. The nuns left but a handful of books. Tomes devoted to pleasuring themselves. Best read in bed, I find. The rest of the material is mine. A scant collection, dreadful paucity. I am embarrassed. Hungry? Mappo shook himself. The high priest's rambles had a hypnotic quality. Each question the troll voiced was answered with a bizarre rambling monologue that seemed to drain him of will beyond the utterance of yet another question. True to his assertions, his corral past could make the passing of time meaningless. Hungry? Aye. A servant prepares food. Can he bring it to the library? The high priest scowled. Collapse of etiquette. But if you insist. The trail pushed himself upright. Where is the library? Turn right, 
Proceed 34 paces, turn right again, 12 paces, then through door on the right, 35 paces, through archway on right, another 11 paces, turn right one last time, 15 paces, enter the door on the right. Mappo stared at Iskaral past. The high priest shifted nervously. Or, the trell said, eyes narrowed, turn left, 19 paces. I, Iskaral muttered. Mappo strode to the door. I shall take the short route then. If you must, the high priest growled as he bent to close examination of the broom's ragged end. The breach of etiquette was explained when, upon entering the library, Mappo saw that the squat chamber also served as kitchen. Icarium sat at a robust, black-stained table a few paces to the trell's right, while Servant hunched over a cauldron suspended by chain over a hearth a pace to Mappo's left. Servant's head was almost invisible inside a cloud of steam, drenched in condensation and dripping into the cauldron as he worked, a wooden ladle in slow, turgid circles. I shall pass on the soup, I think, Mappo said to the man. These books are rotting, Ikarium said, leaning back and eyeing Mappo. You are recovered? So oh, it seems. Still studying the trell, Ikarium frowned. Soup. Ah. His expression cleared. Not soup. Laundry. You will find more palatable fare on the carving table. He gestured to the wall behind Servant, then returned to the mouldering pages of an ancient book opened before him. This is astonishing, Mappo. Given how isolated those nuns were, Mappo said as he approached the carving table, I'm surprised you're astonished. Not those books, friend. Iskaral's own. There are works here whose existence was but the faintest rumour, and some, like this one, that I have never heard of before. A treatise on irrigation planning in the fifth millennium of Arakal, by no fewer than four authors. Returning to the library table with a pewter plate piled high with bread and cheese, Mappo leaned over his friend's shoulder to examine the detailed drawings on the book's vellum pages, then the strange braided script. The trell grunted. Mouth suddenly dry, he managed to mutter, What is so astonishing about that? Ikarim leaned back. The sheer frivolity, Mappo. The materials alone for this tome are a craftsman's annual wage. No scholar in their right mind would waste such resources, never mind their time, on such a pointless, trite subject. And this is not the only example. Look, seed dispersal patterns of the puerile flower on the Scar Archipelago. And here, diseases of white-rimmed clams of Lacour Bay. And I'm convinced that these works are thousands of years old. Thousands. And in a language I never knew you would recognize, much less understand, Mappo thought. He recalled when he had last seen such a script, beneath the hide canopy on a hill that marked his tribe's northernmost border. He'd been among a handful of guards escorting the tribe's elders to what would prove a fateful summons. Autumn rains drumming overhead, they had squatted in a half-circle facing north and watched as seven robed and hooded figures approached. Each held a staff, and as they strode beneath the canopy and stood in silence before the elders, Mappo saw with a shiver how those staves seemed to writhe before his eyes, the wood like serpentine roots, or perhaps those parasitic trees that entwined the boles of others, choking the life from them. Then he realized that the twisted madness of the shafts was in fact runic etching, ever-changing, as if unseen hands continually carved words anew with every breath span. Then one among them withdrew its hood, and so began the moment that would change Mappo's future path. His thoughts jerked away from the memory. Trembling, the trell sat down, clearing a space for his plate. 
Is all of this important, Ikarim? Significant, Mapo. The civilization that brought forth these works must have been appallingly rich. The language is clearly related to modern Seven Cities dialects, although in some ways more sophisticated. And see this symbol, here in the spine of each such tome? A twisted staff. I have seen that symbol before, friend. I am certain of it. Rich, you said. The Trell struggled to drag the conversation away from what he knew to be a looming precipice. More like mud in minutia. Uh, probably explains why it's dust and ashes. Arguing over seeds in the wind while barbarians batter down the gates. Indolence takes many forms, but it comes to every civilization that has outlived its will. You know that as well as I. In this case, it was an indolence characterized by a pursuit of knowledge, a frenzied search for answers to everything, no matter the value of such answers. A civilization can as easily drown in what it knows as in what it doesn't know. Consider, he continued, Gothos's folly. Gothos's curse was being too aware of everything, every permutation, every potential, enough to poison every scan he cast on the world. It availed him naught, and worse, he was aware of even that. You must be feeling better, Ikarium said wryly. Your pessimism has revived. In any case, these works support my belief that the many ruins in Raraku and the Panpotsen Odhan are evidence that a thriving civilization once existed here. Indeed, perhaps the first true human civilization from which all others were born. Leave this path of thought, Ikarium, Mapo thought. Leave it now. And how does this knowledge avail us in our present situation? Ikarim's expression soured slightly. My obsession with time, of course. Writing replaces memory, you see, and the language itself changes because of it. Think of my mechanisms, in which I seek to measure the passage of hours, days, years. Such measurings are by nature cyclic, repetitive, Words and sentences once possessed the same rhythms, and could thus be locked into one's mind, and later recalled with absolute precision. Perhaps, he mused after a moment, if I was illiterate, I would not be so forgetful. He sighed, forced a smile. Besides, I was but passing time, Mappo. The trail tapped one blunt, wrinkled finger on the open book. I imagine the authors of this would have defended their efforts with the same words, friend. I have a more pressing concern. The jag's expression was cool, not completely masking amusement. And that is? Mappo gestured. This place. Shadow does not list among my favorite cults. Nests of assassins and worse. Illusion and deceit and betrayal. Iskaral past affects a harmless facade, but I am not fooled. He was clearly expecting us, and anticipates our involvement in whatever schemes he plans. We risk much in lingering here. But, Mappo, Ikarium said slowly, it is precisely here, in this place, that my goal shall be achieved. The Trell winced. I feared you would say that. Now you shall have to explain it to me. I cannot, friend. Not yet. What I hold are suspicions. Nothing more. When I am certain, I shall feel confident enough to explain. Can you be patient with me? In his mind's eye, he saw another face. This one human, thin and pale. Raindrops tracking runnels down the withered cheeks. Flat grey eyes reaching up, finding Mappo's own beyond the rim of elders. Do you know us? The voice was a rasp of rough leather. An elder had nodded. We know you as the Nameless Ones. It is well, the man replied, eyes still fixed on Mappo's own. The Nameless Ones. 
We think not in years, but in centuries. Chosen warrior, he continued, addressing Mappo. What can you learn of patience? Like rooks bursting from a corpse, the memories fled. Staring at Icarium, Mappo managed to smile, revealing his gleaming canines. Patient, I can be nothing else with you. Nonetheless, I do not trust Iskarav Pust. Servant began removing sopping clothes and bedding from the cauldron, using his bare hands as he squeezed steaming water from the bundles. Watching him, the trell frowned. One of Servant's arms was strangely pink, unweathered, almost youthful. The other more befitted the man's evident age, thickly muscled, hairy and tanned. Servant? The man did not look up. Can you speak? Mappo continued. It seems, Ikarium said when Servant made no response, that he's turned a deaf ear to us by his master's command, I'd warrant. Shall we explore this temple, Mappo? Bearing in mind that every shadow is likely to echo our words as a whisper in the high priest's ears. Well, the troll growled as he rose, it is of little concern to me that Iskaral knows of my distrust. He surely knows more of us than we do of him, Ikarium said, also rising. As they left, Servant was still twisting water from the cloth with something like savage joy, the veins thick on his massive forearms. Chapter 4 in a land where seven cities rose in gold, even the dust has eyes. De Braal saying, A crowd of dusty, sweat-smeared men gathered around as the last of the bodies were removed. The dust cloud hung unmoving over the mine entrance, as it had for most of the morning, since the collapse of the reach at the far end of Deep Mine. Under Beneth's command, the slaves had worked frantically to retrieve the thirty-odd companions buried in the fall. None had survived. Expressionless, Felicin watched with a dozen other slaves from the rest ramp at Twisting's mouth while they awaited the arrival of refilled water casks. The heat had turned even the deepest reaches of the mines into sweltering, dripping ovens. Slaves were collapsing by the score every hour below ground. On the other side of the pit, Heboric tilled the parched earth of deep soil. It was his second week there, and the cleaner air and the relief from pulling stone carts had improved his health. A shipment of limes delivered at Beneth's command had helped as well. Had she not seen to his transfer, Heboric would now be dead, his body crushed under tons of rock. He owed her his life. The realization brought Felice in little satisfaction. They rarely spoke to each other any more. Head clouded with Durhang smoke, it was all Felice could do to drag herself home from Beulah's each night. She slept long hours but gained no rest. The days working in twistings passed in a long, numb haze. Even Beneth had complained that her lovemaking had become torpid. The thuds and grunts of the water carts on the pitted work road grew louder. But Felicin could not pull her gaze from the rescuers as they laid out the mangled corpses to await the body wagon. A faint residue of pity clung to what she could see of the scene, but even that seemed too much of an effort, never mind pulling away her eyes. For all her dulled responses, she went to Beneth, wanting to be used more and more often. She sought him out when he was drunk, weaving and generous, when he offered her to his friends to Beulah and to other women. You're a numb girl, Ibarak had said one of the few times he'd addressed her. Yet your thirst for feeling grows, until even pain will do. But you're looking in the wrong places. Wrong places? What did he know of wrong places? The far reach of Deep Mime was a wrong place. The shaft, where the bodies would be dumped, that was a wrong place. Everywhere else is just a shade of good enough. She was ready to move in with Beneth, 
punctuating the choices she'd made. In a few days, perhaps. Next week. Soon. She'd made such an issue of her own independence, but it was proving not so great a task to surrender it, after all. Lass! Blinking, Felison looked up. It was the young Malazan guard, the one who'd warned Beneth once. Long ago. The soldier grinned. Find the quote yet? What? From Kellen Ved's writings, girl. The boy was frowning now. I suggested you find someone who knew the rest of the passage I quoted. I don't know what you're talking about. He reached down, the calluses ridging the index finger and thumb of his sword hand scraping her chin and jawline as he raised her face. She winced in the bright light when he pushed her hair back. Duh, hang, he whispered. Queen's heart, girl. You look ten years older than the last time I saw you. And when was that? Two weeks back? Ask Beneth, she mumbled, pulling her head away from his touch. Ask him what? For me, in your bed. He'll say yes, but only if he's drunk. He'll be drunk tonight. He grieves for the dead with a jug or two. Touch me then. He straightened. Where's Hiboric? Hiboric? Deep soil. She thought to ask why he wanted him instead of her, but the question drifted away. He could touch her tonight. She'd grown to like calluses. Beneth was paying Captain Sarwark a visit, and he decided to take her with him. He was looking to make a deal, Felicen belatedly realized, and he'd offered her to the captain as an incentive. They approached Rathole Round from Work Road, passing Bueller's Inn, where half a dozen off-duty docile guards lounged around the front door, their bored gazes tracking them. Walk a straight line, lass, Beneth grumbled, taking her arm. And stop dragging your feet. It's what you like, isn't it? Always wanting more. An undercurrent of disgust had come to his turn when he spoke to her. He'd stopped making promises. I'll make you my own, girl. Move in with me. We won't need anyone else. Those gruff, whispered assurances had vanished. The realization did not bother Felicin. She'd never really believed Beneth anyway. Directly ahead, Sarwark's keep rose squat from the center of Rat Hole Round, its huge, rough-cut blocks of stone stained from the greasy smoke that never really left Skullcup. A lone guard stood outside the entrance, a pike held loosely in one hand. Hard luck, he said once they were near. What is? Beneth demanded. The soldier shrugged. This morning's caving, what else? We might have saved some, Beneth said, if Sawa could send us some help. Saved some? What's the point? Sawa's not in the mood if you come here to complain. The man's flat eyes flicked to Felicin. If you're here with a gift, that would be another matter. The guard opened the heavy door. He's in the office. Beneth grunted. Tugging at Felicin's arm, he dragged her through the portal. The ground floor was an armory, weapons lining the walls in locked racks. A table and three chairs were off to one side, the leavings of the guard's breakfast crowding the small tabletop. Up from the room's centre rose an iron staircase. They ascended a single flight to Sarwark's office. The captain sat behind a desk that seemed cobbled together from driftwood. His chair was plushly padded with a high back. A large, leather-bound tally book was opened before him. Sarwak set down his quill and leaned back. Felicin could not recall ever having seen the captain before. He made a point of remaining aloof, isolated here within his tower. The man was thin, devoid of fat, the muscles on his bared forearms like twisted cables under pale skin. Against the present fashion, he was bearded, the wiry black ringlets oiled and scented. The hair on his head was cut short. Watery green eyes glittered from a permanent squint above high cheekbones. His wide mouth was bracketed in deep downturned lines. 
He stared steadily at Beneth, ignoring Felician as if she was not there. Beneth pushed her down in a chair close to one wall, on Sarwark's left, then sat himself down in the lone chair directly facing the captain. Ugly rumours, Sarwark. Want to hear them? The captain's voice was soft. What will that cost me? Nothing. These are free. Go on, then. The docile are talking loud at Beulah's, promising the whirlwind. Sarwark scowled. More of that nonsense. No wonder you give me this news free, Beneth. It's worthless. So I too thought at the beginning, but what else have you to tell me? Beneth's eyes dropped to the ledger on the desk. You've tallied this morning's dead. Did you find the name you sought? I sought no particular name, Beneth. You think you've guessed something, but there's nothing there. I'm losing patience. There were four mages among the victims. Enough. Why are you here? Beneth shrugged, as if tossing away whatever suspicions he held. A gift, he said, gesturing to Felician. Very young. Docile, but ever eager. No spirit to resist. Do whatever you want, Sawak. The captain's scowl darkened. In exchange, Beneth continued, I wish the answer to a single question. The slave Boda was arrested this morning. Why? Felician blinked. Boda? She shook her head, trying to clear it of the fog that marked her waking hours. Was this important? Arrested in Whipcord Lane after curfew. He got away, but one of my men recognised him, and so the arrest was effected this morning. Sarwark's watery gaze finally swung to Felicin. Very young, you said. Eighteen? Nineteen? You're getting old, Beneth, if you call that very young. She felt his eyes exploring her like ghost hands. This time, the sensation was anything but pleasing. She fought back a shiver. She's fifteen, Sarwark, but experienced. Arrived but two transports ago. The captain's eyes sharpened on her, and she watched, wondering, as all the blood drained from his face. Beneth surged to his feet. I'll send another. Two young girls from the last shipment. He stepped close to Felicin and pulled her upright. I guarantee your satisfaction, Captain. They'll be here within the hour. Beneth? Sarwag's voice was soft. Bodow works for you, does he not? An acquaintance, Sarwark. Not one of my trusted ones. I asked because he's on my reach crew. One less strong man will slow us if you're still holding him tomorrow. Live with it, Beneth. Neither one believes the other. The thought was like a glimmer of long-lost awareness in Felicin. She drew a deep breath. Something's happening. I need to think about it. I need to be listening. Listening. Right now. In answer to Sarwak's suggestion, Beneth sighed heavily. I shall have to do just that, then. Until later, Captain. Felicin did not resist as Beneth propelled her toward the stairs. Once outside, he pulled her across the round, not answering the keep guard as the man said something in a sneering tone. Breathing hard, Beneth dragged her into the shadows of an alley, then swung her around. His voice was a harsh rasp. Who are you, girl? His long-lost daughter? Hood's breath, clear your wits! Tell me what happened just now in that office. Bodan! What's Bodan to you? Answer me! He's... he's nothing. The back of his hand when it struck her face was like a sack of rocks. Light exploded behind Felicin's eyes as she sprawled sideways. Blood streamed from her nose as she lay unmoving in the alley's rotting refuse. Staring dumbly at the ground six inches away, she watched the red pool spread in the dust. Beneth dragged her upright and threw her up against a wood-slatted wall. Your full name, lass! Tell me! Felicin, she mumbled. Just that! Snarling, he raised his hand again. She stared at the marks her teeth had left just above the knuckles. 
No, I swear it. I was the foundling. Disbelief crazed his eyes. A what? Found outside the Fainer Monastery on Malas Island. The Empress made accusations. Followers of Fainer. Hiboric. Your ship came from Unter, lass. What do you take me for? You're noble-born. No, only well cared for. Please, Benneth, I'm not lying. I don't understand, Sarwak. Maybe Bodan spun a tale, a lie, to save his own skin. Your ship sailed from Unter. You've never even been to Marla's island. This monastery, near which city? Jakarta. There's only two cities on the island. The other's Malas City. I was sent there for a summer, schooling. I was in training to be a priestess. Ask Hiboric, Benneth, please. Name me the poorest quarter of Malas City. Poorest? Name it! I don't know. The Fena Temple is in Dockfront. Is it the poorest? There were slums outside the city, lining the Jakarta Road. I was there for but a season, Benneth. And I hardly saw Jakarta. We weren't allowed. Please, Benneth, I don't understand any of this. Why are you hurting me? I've done everything you wanted me to do. I slept with your friends. I let you treat me. I made myself valuable. He struck her again, no longer seeking answers or a way through her frantic lies. A new reason had appeared in his eyes, birthing a bright rage. He beat her systematically, in silent, cold fury. After the first few blows, Felice curled herself tight around the pain, the shadow-cooled alley dust feeling like a balm where her flesh lay upon it. She struggled to concentrate on her breathing, closing in on that one task, drawing the air in, fighting the waves of agony that came with the effort, then releasing it slowly, a steady stream that carried the pain away. Eventually she realized that Benneth had stopped, that perhaps he'd only struck her a few times, and that he had left. She was alone in the alley, the thin strip of sky overhead darkening with dusk. She heard occasional voices in the street beyond, but no one approached the narrow aisle she huddled in. She woke again later. Apparently she had passed out while crawling toward the alley mouth. The torch-lit work road was a dozen paces away. Figures ran through her line of sight. Through the constant ringing in her ears, she heard shouts and screams. The air stank of smoke. She thought to resume crawling, then consciousness slipped away again. Cool cloth brushed her brow. Felicin opened her eyes. Haborek was bending over her and seemed to be studying her pupils, each in turn. You with us, lass? Her jaw ached. Her lips were crusted together with scabs. She nodded, only now realizing that she was lying in her own bed. I'm going to rub some oil on your lips. See if we can prise them open without it hurting too much. You need water. She nodded again and steeled herself against the pain of his ministrations as he dabbed at her mouth with the oil-soaked cloth strapped onto the stub of his left arm. He spoke as he worked. Eventful night for us all. Boda escaped the jail, lighting a few buildings to flame for diversion. He's hiding somewhere here in Skullcup. No one tried the cliff walls or Sinker Lake. The cordon of guards lining Beetle Road up top reported no attempts to breach in any case. Sarwax posted a reward, once the bastard alive. Not least because Boda went and killed three of his men. I suspect there's more to the tale. What do you think? Then Beneth reports you missing from the Twisting's work line this morning. Starts me wondering. So I go to talk to him at the midday break. Says he last saw you at Bueller's last night. Says he's cut you loose because you're all used up, sucking more smoke into your lungs than air. As if he ain't to blame for that. But all the while he's talking, I'm studying those cut marks on his knuckles. Benneth was in a fight last night, I see. And the only damage he's sporting is what was done by somebody's teeth. 
Well, the weeding's done, and nobody's keeping an eye on old Hibaric, so I spend the afternoon looking, checking alleys, expecting the worst, I admit. Felicin pushed his arm away. Slowly she opened her mouth, wincing at the pain, and feeling the cool prick of reopened gashes. Beneth, she managed. Her chest hurt with every breath. Hibaric's eyes were hard. What's of him? Tell him. From me. Tell him. I'm sorry. The old man slowly leaned back. I want him to take me back. Tell him, please. Hibaric rose. Get some rest, he said in a strangely flat voice as he moved out of a line of sight. Water. Coming up, then you sleep. Can't, she said. Why not? Can't sleep without a pipe. Can't. She sensed him staring at her. Your lungs are bruised. You've some cracked ribs. Will tea do? Dang tea. Make it strong. Hearing him fill a cup of water from the cask, she closed her eyes. Clever story, lass, Hiboric said. A foundling. Lucky for you, I'm quick. I'd say there's a good chance Beneath believes you now. Why? Why do you tell me this? To put you at ease. I guess what I mean is... He approached with the cup of water between his forearms. He just might take you back, lass. Oh, I... I... I don't understand you, Hiboric. He watched her raise the clay cup to her lips. No, he said. You do not. Like an enormous wall, the sandstorm descended down the west slope of Istara Hills and approached the coastal road with a deathly moan. While such inland storms were rare on the peninsula, Kalam had faced their wrath before. His first task was to leave the road. It ran too close to the sea cliff in places, and such cliffs were known to collapse. The stallion complained as he angled him down the road's scree bank. For a thick-muscled, vicious beast, the horse was over-fond of comforts. The sands were hot, the footing treacherous with hidden sinkholes. Ignoring the stallion's neck tugs and head tossing, he drove him down and onto the basin, then kicked the animal into a canter. A league and a half ahead was Ladro Landing, and beyond that, on the banks of a seasonal river, Ladro Keep. Kalam did not plan on staying there if he could help it. The Keep's commander was Malazan, and so too were his guards. If he could, the assassin would outrun the worst of the storm, hoping to regain the coastal road beyond the Keep, then continue on south to the village of Intazam. Keening, the ochre wall drew the horizon on Kalam's left ever closer. The hills had vanished. A turgid gloom curtained the sky. The flap and skitter of fleeing reason surrounded him. Hissing a curse, the assassin spurred the stallion into a gallop. As much as he detested horses in principle, the animal was magnificent when in full stride, seeming to flow effortlessly over the ground with a rhythm forgiving of Kalam's modest skills. He would come no closer to admitting a growing affection toward the stallion. As he rode, he glanced to see the edge of the storm less than a hundred paces away. There would be no outrunning it. A swirling breaker of whipped sand marked where the wind met the ground. Kalam saw fist-sized rocks in that rolling surf. The wall would crash over them within minutes. Its roar filled the air. Slightly ahead and on a course that would intercept them, Kalam saw within the ochre cloud a grey stain. He threw himself back in the saddle, sawing the reins. The stallion shrilled, broken out of its rhythm, slewing with his hooves as he stumbled to a stop. You'd thank me if you had half a brain, Kalam snarled. The grey stain was a swarm of chigger fleas. The voracious insects waited for storms like this one, then rode the winds in search of prey. The worst of it was, one could not see them straight on. Only from the side were they visible. As the swarm swept past ahead of them, the storm struck. 
The stallion staggered when the wall rolled over them. The world vanished inside a shrieking, whirling ochre haze. Stones and gravel pelted them, drawing flinches from the stallion and grunts of pain from Kalam. The assassin ducked his hooded head and leaned into the wind. Through the slit in his Talaba scarf, he squinted ahead, nudging his mount forward at a walk. He leaned over the animal's neck, reached out one gloved hand, and cupped it over the stallion's left eye to shield it from flying stones and grit. For being out here, the assassin owed him that much. They continued on for another ten minutes, seeing nothing through the cloak of flying sand. Then the stallion snorted, rearing. Snapping and crunching sounds rose from beneath them. Kalam squinted down. Bones on all sides. The storm had blown out a graveyard, a common enough occurrence. The assassin regained control of his mount, then tried to pierce the ochre gloom. Ladro Landing was nearby, but he could see nothing. He nudged the stallion forward, the animal stepping daintily around the skeletal clumps. The coastal road appeared ahead, along with guardhouses flanking what had to be the bridge. The village must be on his right, if the damned thing hasn't blown away. Beyond the bridge, then, he would find Ladro Keep. The single-person guardhouses both gaped empty, like sockets in a massive geometric skull. His horse stabled, Kalam crossed the compound, leaning against the wind and wincing at the ache in his legs as he approached the keep's gatehouse entrance. Ducking within the alcove, he found himself beyond the storm's howl for the first time in hours. Drifts of fine sand filled the gatehouse's corners, but the dusty air was calm. No guardsman held the post. The lone stone bench was vacant. Kalam raised the heavy iron ring on the wood door, slamming it down hard. He waited. Eventually he heard the bars being drawn on the other side. The door swung back with a grating sound. An old kitchen servant regarded him with his one good eye. Inside, then, he grumbled. Join the others. Kalam edged past the old man and found himself in a large common room. Faces had turned with his entrance. At the far end of the main table, which ran the length of the rectangular chamber, sat four of the keep's guardsmen, Malazans, looking foul-tempered. Three jugs squatted in puddles of wine on the tabletop. To one side, next along the table, was a wiry, sunken-eyed woman, her face painted in a style best left to young maidens. At her side was an Erli merchant, probably the woman's husband. Kalam bowed to the group, then approached the table. Another servant, this one younger than the doorman by only a few years, appeared with a fresh jug and a goblet, hesitating until the assassin settled on where he would sit, opposite the merchant couple. He set the goblet down and poured Kalam a half-measure, then backed away. The merchant showed Durhang-stained teeth in a welcoming smile. Down from the north, then? The wine was some kind of herbal concoction, too sweet and cloying for the climate. Kalam set the goblets down, scowling. No beer in this hold? The merchant's head bobbed. Aye, and chilled at that. Alas, only the wine is free, courtesy of our host. Not surprised it's free, the assassin muttered. He gestured to the servant. A tankard of beer, if you please. Costs a sliver, the servant said. Highway robbery, but my thirst is master. He found a clipped jakarta and set it on the table. Has the village fallen into the sea, then? the merchant asked. On your way down from Erlitan, how stands the bridge? Kalam saw a small velvet bag on the tabletop in front of the merchant's wife. Glancing up, he met her pitted eyes. She gave him a ghastly wink. He'll not add to your gossip, Verkru, darling. A stranger coming from the storm is all you'll learn from this one. One of the guardsmen raised his head. Got something to hide, have you? Not guarding a caravan, just riding alone? Deserting the Erlitan guard? Or maybe spreading the word of Drijna? Or both? And now here you come, expecting the hospitality of the master. Malazan born and bred. Kalam eyed the men, 
four belligerent faces. Any denial of the sergeant's accusations would not be believed. The guards had decided he belonged in the dungeon for the night at least, something to break the boredom. Yet the assassin was not interested in shedding blood. He laid his hands flat on the table, slowly rose. A word with you, sergeant, he said. In private. The man's dark face turned ugly. So you can slit my throat? You believe me capable of that? Kalam asked in surprise. You wear chain? You've a sword at your belt? You've three companions, who no doubt will stay close, if only to eavesdrop on the words we exchange between us. The sergeant rose. I can handle you well enough on my own, he growled. He strode to the back wall. Kalam followed. He withdrew a small pendant from under his talaba and held it up. Do you recognize this, sergeant? he asked softly. Cautiously, the man leaned forward to study the symbol etched on the pendant's flat surface. Recognition paled his features as he involuntarily mouthed, Claw master. An end to your questions and accusations, sergeant. Do not reveal what you know to your men, at least until after I am gone. Understood. The sergeant nodded. Pardon, sir, he whispered. Kalam hooked a half-smile. Your unease is earned. Hood's about to stride this land, and you and I both know it. You erred today, but do not relax your mistrust. Does the Keep Commander understand the situation beyond these walls? Aye, he does. The assassin sighed. Makes you and your squad among the lucky ones, Sergeant. Aye. Shall we return to the table now? The sergeant simply shook his head in answer to his squad's querying expressions. As Kalam returned to his beer, the merchant's wife reached for the velvet bag. The soldiers have each requested a reading of their futures, she said, revealing a deck of dragons. She held the deck in both hands, her unblinking eyes on the assassin. And you... Would you know of your future, stranger? Which gods smile upon you? Which gods frown? The gods have little time or inclination to spare us any note, Kalam said with contempt. Leave me out of your games, woman. So you cow the sergeant, she said, smiling, and now seek to cow me. See the fear your words have wrought in me. I shake with terror. With a disgusted snort, Kalam slid his gaze away. The common room boomed as the front door was assailed. More mysterious travellers, the woman cackled. Everyone watched as the doorman reappeared from a side chamber and shuffled toward the door. Whoever waited outside was impatient. Thunder rang imperiously through the room, even as the old man reached for the bar. As soon as the bar cleared the latch, the door was pushed hard. The doorman stumbled back. Two armoured figures appeared, the first one a woman. Metal rustled and boots thumped as she strode into the centre of the chamber. Flat eyes surveyed the guards and the other guests, held briefly on each of them before continuing on. Kalam saw no special attention accorded him. The woman had once held rank. Perhaps she still did, although her accoutrements and colours announced no present status. And always the man behind her wearing anything like a uniform. Kalam saw wheels on both their faces and smiled to himself. They'd run into chigger fleas, and neither looked too pleased about it. The man jerked suddenly as one bit him somewhere beneath his hauberk, cursing. He began loosening the armor's straps. No! the woman snapped. The man stopped. She was Padu, a southern plains tribe. Her companion had the look of a northerner, possibly Erlai. His dusky skin was a shade paler than the woman's and bare of any tribal tattooing. Hood's breath, the sergeant snarled at the woman. Not another step closer. You're both crawling with chiggers. Take the far end of the table. One of the servants will prepare a cedar chip bath, though that will cost you. For a moment, the woman seemed ready to resist, but then she gestured to the unoccupied end of the table with one gloved hand, 
and her companion responded by pulling two chairs back before seating himself stiffly in one of them. The Pardu took the other. A flagon of beer, she said. The master charges for that, Kalam said, giving her a wry smile. The seven's fate, the cheap bastard. You, servant, bring me a tankard, and I'll judge if it's worth any coin. Quickly now. The woman thinks this is a tavern, one of the guards said. The sergeant spoke. You're here by the grace of this keep's commander. You'll pay for the beer, you'll pay for the bath, and you'll pay for sleeping on this floor. And this is grace? The sergeant's expression darkened. He was Malazan, and he shared the room with a claw master. The four walls, the ceiling, the hearth, and the use of the stables are free, woman. Yet you complain like a virgin princess. Accept the hospitality or be gone. The woman's eyes narrowed. Then she removed a handful of jakartas from a belt pouch and slammed them on the tabletop. I gather, she said smoothly, that your gracious master charges even you for beer, sergeant. So be it. I've no choice but to buy everyone here a tankard. Generous, the sergeant said with a stiff nod. The future shall now be prized loose, the merchant's wife said, trimming the deck. Kalam saw the Pardu flinch upon seeing the cards. Spare us, the assassin said. There's nothing to be gained from seeing what's to come, assuming you've any talent at all, which I doubt. Save us all from the embarrassment of your performance. Ignoring them, the old woman angled herself to face the guardsman. All your fates rest upon this. She laid out the first card. Kalam barked a laugh. Which one is that? One of the guards demanded. Obelisk, Kalam said. The woman's a fake. As any seer of talent would know, that card's inactive in seven cities. An expert in divination, are you? The old woman snapped. I visit a worthy seer before any overland journey, Galam replied. It would be foolish to do otherwise. I know the deck, and I've seen when the reading was true, when power showed the hand. No doubt you intended to charge these guardsmen once the reading was done, once you'd told them how rich they were going to become, how they'd live to ripe old ages, fathering heroes by the score. Her expression unveiling the charade's end, the old woman screamed with rage and flung the deck at Kalam. It struck him on the chest, cards clattering on the tabletop in a wild scatter, which settled into a pattern. The breath hissed from the Padu woman, the only sound to be heard within the common room. Suddenly sweating, Kalam looked down at the cards. Six surrounded a single, and that single card he knew with certainty, was his. The rope, assassin of shadow. The six cards encircling it were all of one house. King, herald, mason, spinner, knight, queen. High house death, hood's house all arrayed, around the one who carries the holy book of Dreijna. Ah, oh, well... Kalam sighed, glancing up at the party woman. I guess I sleep alone tonight. The Red Blade Captain Lostara Yill and her companion soldier were the last to leave Ladro Keep, over an hour after their target had departed on his stallion, riding south through the dusty wake of the sandstorm. The forced proximity with Kalam had been unavoidable, but just as he was skilled at deception, so too was Lostara. Bluster could be its own disguise, arrogance a mask hiding an altogether deadly assurance. The deck of dragons' unexpected fielding had revealed much to Lustara, not only about Kalam and his mission. The keep sergeant had shown himself by his expression to have been a co-conspirator, yet another Malazan soldier prepared to betray his empress. Evidently, Kalam's stop at the keep had not been as accidental as it appeared. Checking their horses, Lestara turned as her companion emerged from the keep. The red blade grinned up at her. 
You were thorough as always, he said. The commander led me a merry chase, however. I found him in the crypt, struggling to climb into a fifty-year-old suit of armor. He was much thinner in his youth, it seems. Lestara swung herself into the saddle. None still breathing? You're certain you checked them all? What of the servants in the back hallway? I went through them, perhaps too quickly. You left not a single heart still beating, Captain. Very good. Mount up. That horse of the assassins is killing these ones. We shall acquire fresh horses in Intersam. Assuming Baralta got around to arranging them. Lestara eyed her companion. Trust Baralta, she said coolly, and be glad that this time I shall not report your skepticism. Tight-lipped, the man nodded. Thank you, Captain. The two rode down the keep road, turning south on the coastal road. The entire main floor of the monastery radiated in a circular pattern around a single room that was occupied by a circular staircase of stone leading down into darkness. Mappo crouched beside it. This would, I imagine, lead down to the crypt. If I recall correctly, Ikarium said from where he stood near the room's entrance, when nuns of the Queen of Dreams die, the bodies are simply wrapped in linen and placed on recessed ledges in the crypt walls. Have you an interest in perusing corpses? Not generally, no, the Trell said, straightening with a soft grunt. It's just that the stone changes as soon as the stairs descend below floor level. Ikarium raised a brow. It does? The level we're on is carved from living rock. The cliff's limestone. It's rather soft, but beneath it there are cut granite blocks. I believe the crypt beneath us is an older construct. Either that, or the nuns and their cult hold that a crypt's walls and approach must be dressed, whereas living chambers need not be. The jag shook his head, approaching. I would be surprised. The Queen of Dreams is life-aspected. Very well. Shall we explore? Mappo descended first. Neither had much need for artificial light, the darkness below offering no obstacle. The spiral steps showed the vestiges of marble tiling, but the passage of many feet long ago had worn most of them away. Beneath, the hard granite defied all evidence of erosion. The stairs continued down and down. At the seventieth step, they ended in the center of an octagonally walled chamber. Friezes decorated each wall, the colors hinted at in the many shades of gray. Beyond the staircase's landing, the floor was honeycombed with rectangular pits, cut down through the tiles and the granite blocks beneath removed. These blocks were now stacked over what was obviously a portal way. Within each pit was a shrouded corpse. The air was dry, scentless. These paintings do not belong to the cult of the Queen, Mappo said, stating the obvious, for the scenes on the walls revealed a deep mythos. Thick fir trees reared black, moss-stained bowls on all sides. The effect created was of standing in a glade deep in an ancient forest. Between the trunks here and there was the hint of hulking four-legged beasts, their eyes glowing as if in reflected moonlight. Ikarium crouched down, running a hand over the remaining tiles. This floor held a pattern, he said, before the nun's workers cut graves in it. Pity. Mappo glanced at the blocked doorway. If answers to the mysteries here exist... They lie beyond that barricade. Recovered your strength, friend? Well enough. The trail went to the barrier, pulled down the highest block. As he tipped it down into his arms, he staggered, voicing a savage grunt. Ikarium rushed to help him lower the granite block to the floor. Hood's breath! Heavier than I'd expected. I'd gathered that. Shall we work together, then? Twenty minutes later, they had cleared sufficient blocks to permit their passage into the hallway beyond. 
The final five minutes, they had an audience, as a squall of Bokoral appeared on the staircase, silently watching their efforts from where they clung from the railings. When first Mapo and then Ikarium clambered through the opening, however, the Bokorala did not follow. The hallway stretched away before them, a wide colonnade lined by twin columns that were nothing less than the trunks of cedars. Each bowl was at least an arm span in diameter. The shaggy, gouged bark remained, although most of it had fallen away and now lay scattered over the floor. Mapo laid a hand on one wooden pillar. Imagine the effort of bringing these down here. Warren, Ikarium said, sniffing. The residue remains, even after all these centuries. After centuries? Can you sense which Warren, Ikarium? Korald Galen, Elder, the Warren of Darkness. Tister Andy, in all the histories of seven cities that I am aware of, I've never heard mention of Tister Andy present on this continent, nor in my homeland on the other side of the Jag Odhan. Are you certain? This does not make sense. I am not certain, Mappo. It has the feel of Korald Galen. That is all. The feel of dark. It is not Omtos Felak, nor Telan, not Starvald Demelane. I know of no other Elder Warrens. Nor I. Without another word, the two began walking. By Mappo's count, the hallway ended 330 paces later, opening out into another octagonal chamber, this one with its floor raised a hand's width higher than that of the hallway. Each flagstone was also octagonal, and on each of them, images had been intricately carved, then defaced with gouges and scoring in what seemed entirely random, frenzied destruction. The Trell felt his hackle stiffening into a ridge on his neck as he stood at the room's threshold. Ikarium was beside him. I do not, the Jag said, suggest we enter this chamber. Mappo grunted agreement. The air stank of sorcery, old, stale and clammy and dense with power. Like waves of heat, magic bled from the flagstones, from the images carved upon them and the wounds many of those images now bore. Ikarium was shaking his head. If this is Kurald Galen, its flavor is unknown to me. It is... corrupted. By the defilement? Possibly. Yet the stench from those claw marks differs from what rises from the flagstones themselves. Is it familiar to you? By Decembre's mortal tears, it should be, Mappo. The trail squinted down at the nearest flagstone bearing scars. His nostrils flared. Soul taken! Divers! The spice of shapeshifters! Of course! He barked out a savage laugh that echoed in the chamber. The path of hands, Icarium! The gate! It's here! More than the gate, I think, Icarium said. Look upon the undamaged carvings. What do they remind you of? Mappo had an answer to that. He scanned the array with growing certainty, but the realization it offered held no answers, only more questions. I see the likeness, yet there is an unlikeness as well. Even more irritating, I can think of no possible linkage. No such answers here, Ikarium said. We must go to the place we first intended to find, Mappo. We approach comprehension. I am certain of that. Ikarium, do you think Iskaral Past is preparing for more visitors? Soul taken and divers, the imminent opening of the gate? Is he, and by extension Shadow Realm, the very heart of this convergence? I do not know. Let's ask him. They stepped back from the threshold. We approach comprehension. Three words evoking terror within Mappo. He felt like a hare in a master archer's sights each direction of flight so hopeless as to leave him frozen in place. 
He stood at the side of powers that staggered his mind, power past and powers present. The nameless ones, with their charges and hints and visions, their cowled purposes and shrouded desires. Creatures of fraught antiquity, if the trellish legends held any glimmer of truth. And, Icarium, oh dear friend, I can tell you nothing. My curse is silenced your every question, and the hand I offer as a brother will lead you only into deceit. In love's name I do this, at my own cost. And such a cost. The Bokarala awaited them at the stairs, and followed the two men at a discreet distance up to the main level. They found the high priest in the vestibule he had converted into his sleeping chamber. Muttering to himself, Iskaral Past was filling a wicker rubbish container with rotted fruit, dead bats, and mangled risen. He threw Mappo and Ikariam a scowl over one shoulder as they stood at the room's entrance. If those squalid apes are following you, let them wear my wrath, Iskaral hissed. No matter which chamber I choose, they insist on using it as repository for their foul leavings. I have lost patience. They mock a high priest of shadow at their peril. We have found the gate, Mappo said. Iskaral did not pause in his cleaning. Oh, you have, have you? Fools! Nothing is as it seems. A life given for a life taken. You have explored every corner, every cranny, have you? Idiots! Such overconfident bluster is the banner of ignorance. Wave it about and expect me to cower. Ah! I have my secrets, my plans, my schemes. Iskaral Pust's maze of genius cannot be plumbed by the likes of you. Look at you two, both ancient wanderers of this mortal earth. Why have you not ascended like the rest of them? I'll tell you. Longevity does not automatically bestow wisdom. Oh, no, not at all. I trust you are killing every spider you spy. You had better be, for it is the path to wisdom. Oh, yes, indeed, the path. Pokerala have small brains, tiny brains inside their tiny round skulls. Cunning as rats, with eyes like glittering black stones. Four hours once, I stared into one's eyes, he into mine. Never once pulling gaze away. Oh no, this was a contest and one I would not lose. Four hours, face to face, so close, I could smell his foul breath and he mine. Who would win? It was in the lap of the gods. Mappo glanced at Icarium, then cleared his throat. And who, Iskaral Pust, won this, uh, this battle of wits? Iskaral Pust fixed a pointed stare on Mappo. Look upon him who does not waver from his cause, no matter how insipid and ultimately irrelevant, and you shall find in him the meaning of dull-witted. The Bokoral could have stared into my eyes forever, for there was no intelligence behind them. Behind his eyes, I mean. It was proof of my superiority that I found distraction elsewhere. Do you intend to lead the divers and soul taken to the gate below? Iskaral pussed. Blunt are the trell, determined in headlong stumbling and headlong in stumbling determination. As I said, you know nothing of the mysteries involved, the plans of Shadow Throne, the many secrets of the Grey Keep the shrouded house where stands the throne of shadow. Yet I do. I, alone among all mortals, have been shown the truth arrayed before me. My God is generous, my God is wise, as cunning as a rat. Spiders must die. The Bokarala have stolen my broom, and this quest I set before you two guests. Ikarium, and Mappo Trell, famed wanderers of the world, I charge you with this perilous task. Find me my broom. Out in the hallway, Mappo sighed. Well, that was fruitless. What shall we do now, friend? 
Ikarim looked surprised. It should be obvious, Mapo. We must take on this perilous quest. We must find Iskaral Pust's broom. We have explored this monastery, Ikarium, the troll said wearily. I noticed no broom. The jag's mouth quirked slightly. Explored? Every corner? Every cranny? I think not. Our first task, however, is to the kitchen. We must outfit ourselves for our impending explorations. You are serious? I am. The flies were biting in the heat, as foul-tempered as everything else beneath the blistering sun. People filled Hissar's fountains until midday, crowded shoulder to shoulder in the tepid, murky waters, before retiring to the cooler shade of their homes. It was not a day for going outside, and Diker found himself scowling as he drew on a loose, thinly woven talaba, while Bult waited by the door. Why not under the moon? the historian muttered. Cool night air, stars high overhead, with every spirit looking down. Now that would ensure success. Bult's sardonic grin did not help matters. Strapping on his rope belt, Diker turned to the grizzled commander. Very well. Lead on, uncle. The Wiccan's grin widened, deepening the scar until it seemed he had two smiles instead of one. Outside, Culp waited with the mounts, astride his own small, sturdy-looking horse. Diker found the Cardra Mage's glum expression perversely pleasing. They rode through almost empty streets. It was Maroc, early afternoon, when sane people retired indoors to wait out the worst of the summer heat. The historian had grown accustomed to napping during Maroc. He was feeling grumpy, all too out of sorts to attend Sormo's ritual. Warlocks were notorious for their impropriety, their deliberate discombobulating of common sense. For their defense of decency alone, the Empress might be excused the executions. He grimaced, clearly not an opinion to be safely voiced within hearing range of any Wiccans. They reached the city's northern end and rode out on a coastal track for half a league before swinging inland, into the wastes of the Odan. The oasis they approached an hour later was dead, the spring long since dried up. All that remained of what had once been a lush, natural garden amidst the sands was a stand of withered, gnarled cedars rising from a carpet of tumbled palms. Many of the trees bore strange projections that drew Diker's curiosity as they led their horses closer. Are these horns in the trees? Culp asked. Bedarin, I think, the historian replied. Jammed into a fork, then grown past, leaving them embedded deep in the wood. These trees were likely a thousand years old before the water vanished. The mage grunted. You'd think they'd be cut down by now, this close to Hissa. The horns are warnings, Bolt said. Holy ground. Once long ago, memories remain. As well they should, Diker muttered. Somo should be avoiding hallowed sand, not seeking it out. If this place is aspected, it's likely an inimical one to a Wiccan warlock. I've long since learned to trust Somo Inath's judgment, historian. You'd do well to learn the like. It's a poor scholar who trusts anyone's judgment, Diker said. Even, and perhaps especially his own. You walk shifting sands, Bolt sighed, then gave him another grin, as the locals would say. What would you Wiccan say? Culp asked. Bolt's eyes glittered with mischief. Nothing. Wise words are like arrows flung at your forehead. What do you do? Why? You duck, of course. This truth a Wiccan knows from the time he first learns to ride, long before he learns to walk. They found the warlock in a clearing. The drifts of sand had been swept aside, revealing a heaved and twisted brick floor, all that remained of a structure of some sort. Chips of obsidian glittered in the joins. Culp dismounted, eyeing Sormo who stood in the center, hands hidden within heavy sleeves. He swatted at a fly. What's this, then? Some lost, forgotten temple? 
The young Wiccan slowly blinked. My assistants concluded it had been a stable. They then left without elaborating. Culp scowled at Dyker. I despise Wiccan humour, he whispered. Sormo gestured them closer. It is my intention to open myself to the sacred aspect of this Keror, which is the name Wiccans give to holy places open to the skies. Are you mad? Culp's face had gone white. These spirits will rip your throat out, child. They are of the seven. They are not, the warlock retorted. The spirits in this Keror were raised in the time before the seven. They are the land's own, and if you must liken them to a known aspect, then it must be Telan. Hood's mercy, Dyker groaned. If it is indeed Telan, then you will be dealing with Telan I mass, Sormo. The undead warriors have turned their backs on the Empress and all that is the Empire, ever since the Emperor's assassination. The warlock's eyes were bright. And have you not wondered why? The historian's mouth snapped shut. He had theories in that regard, but to voice them to anyone would be treason. Culp's dry question to Sormo broke through Dyker's thoughts. And has Empress Lassine tasked you with this? Are you here to seek a sense of future events, or is that just a feint? Bolt had stood a few paces from them, saying nothing, but now he spat. We need no seer to guess that, mage. The warlock raised his arms out to his sides. Stay close, he said to Culp. Then his eyes slid to the historian. And you, see and remember all you will witness here. I am already doing so, warlock. Sormo nodded, closed his eyes. His power spread like a faint, subtle ripple, sweeping over Dyker and the others to encompass the entire clearing. Daylight faded abruptly, replaced by a soft dusk, the dry air suddenly damp and smelling of marshlands. Ringing the glade like sentinels were cypresses. Mosses hung from branches and curtains, hiding what lay beyond in impenetrable shadow. Dyker could feel Sormo Enath's sorcery like a warm cloak. He had never before felt a power such as this one. Calm and protective, strong yet yielding. He wondered at the Empire's loss in exterminating these warlocks. An error she's clearly corrected, though it might well be too late. How many warlocks were lost in truth? Sormo loosed an ululating cry that echoed as if they stood within a vast cavern. The next moment the air was alive with icy winds, arriving in warring gusts. Sormo staggered, his eyes now open and widening with alarm. He drew a breath, then visibly recoiled at the taste, and Dyker could not blame him. Bestial stench rode the winds, growing fouler by the moment. Taut violence filled the glade, a sure promise announced in the sudden thrashing of the moss-laden branches. The historian saw a swarming cloud approach Bolt from behind and shouted a warning. The Wiccan whirled, long knives in his hands. He screamed as the first of the wasps stung. Divers! Kelp bellowed, one hand grasping Dyker's talaba and pulling the historian back to where Sormo stood as if dazed. Rats scampered over the soft ground, shrilly screaming as they attacked a writhing bundle of snakes. The historian felt heat on his legs, looked down. Fire ants swarmed him up to his thighs. The heat rose to agony. He screamed. Swearing, Culp unleashed his warren in a pulse of power. Shriveled ants fell from the historian's legs like dust. The attacking swarm flinched back, the divers retreating. The rats had overrun the snakes and now closed in on Sormo. The Wiccan frowned at them. Off where Bolt crouched, slapping futilely at the stinging wasps, Liquid fire erupted in a swath, the flames tumbling over the veteran. Tracking back to the fire's source, Dyker saw that an enormous demon had entered the clearing. Midnight skinned and twice the height of a man, the creature voiced a roar of fury and launched a savage attack on a white-furred bear. 
The glade was alive with divers and soul taken, the air filled with shrieks and snarls. The demon landed on the bear, driving it to the ground with a snap and crunch of bones. Leaving the animal twitching, the black demon leaped to one side and roared a second time, and this time Dyker heard meaning within it. It's warning us, he shouted at Culp. Like a lodestone, the demon's arrival drew the divers and soul taken. They fought each other in a frenzied rush to attack the creature. We have to get out of here, Dyker said. Pull us out, Culp, now! The mage hissed in rage. How? This is so most ritual, you damned book grub! The demon vanished beneath a mob of creatures, yet clearly remained upright, as the divers and soul taken clambered up what seemed a solid pillar of stone. Black-skinned arms appeared, flinging away dead and dying creatures. But it could not last. Who oh, take you, Culp! Think of something! The mage's face tightened. Drag bolts to Sormo! Quickly! Leave the warlock to me! With that, Culp bolted to Sormo, shouting in an effort to wake the youth from whatever spell held him. Dyker spun to where Bolt lay huddled five paces away. His legs felt impossibly heavy beneath the prickling pain of the ant bites as he staggered to the Wiccan. The veteran had been stung scores of times. His flesh was misshapen with fiery swelling. He was unconscious, possibly dead. Dyker gripped the man's harness and dragged him to where Culp continued accosting Sormo Enath. As the historian arrived, the demon gave one last shriek, then disappeared beneath the mound of attackers. The divers and soul taken then surged toward the four men. Sormo Enath was oblivious, his eyes glazed, unheeding of the mage's efforts to shout him into awareness. Wake him, or we're dead, Dyker gasped, stepping over Bolt to face the charging beasts with naught but a small knife. The weapon would little avail him as a seething cloud of hornets swiftly closed the distance. The scene was jolted, and Dyker saw they were back in the dead oasis. The divers and soul taken were gone. The historian turned to Culp. You did it. How? The mage glanced down at a sprawled, moaning Sormo Enath. I'll pay for it, he muttered, then met Dyker's eyes. I punched the lad. Damn near broke my hand doing it, too. It was his nightmare, wasn't it? The historian blinked, then shook himself and crouched down beside Bolt. The poison will kill him long before we can get help. Culp squatted, ran his good hand over the veteran's swollen face. Not poison. More like an infecting warren. I can deal with this, Dyker, as with your legs. He closed his eyes in concentration. Sorma Enath slowly pushed himself into sitting position. He looked around, then tenderly touched his jaw, where the ridged imprint of Culp's knuckles stood like puckered islands in a spreading flush of red. He had no choice, Dyker told him. The warlock nodded. Can you talk? Any loose teeth? Somewhere, he said clearly, a crow flaps broken-winged on the ground. There are but ten left. What happened there, warlock? Sormo's eyes flicked nervously. Something unexpected, historian. A convergence is underway. The path of hands. The gate of the soul taken and the divers. An unhappy coincidence. Dyker scowled. You said Telan. And so it was, the warlock cut in. Is there a blending between shape-shifting and Elder Telan? Unknown. Perhaps the divers and soul taken are simply passing through the warren. Imagining it unoccupied by Telan I mass, and therefore safer. Indeed, no Talan I mass to take umbrage with the trespass, leaving them with only each other to battle. They are welcome to annihilate each other, then, the historian grumbled, his legs slowly giving way beneath him until, like Sormo, he sat on the ground, 
I shall help you in a moment, Culp called over. Nodding, Diker found himself watching a dung beetle struggle heroically to push aside a fragment of palm bark. He sensed something profound in what he watched, but was too weary to pursue it. Chapter 5 Bokarala seemed to have originated in the wastes of Raraku. Before long, these social creatures spread outward and were soon seen throughout seven cities. As efficacious rat control in settlements, the Bokarala were not only tolerated, but often encouraged. It was not long before a lively trade in domesticated breeds became a major export. The usage and demonic investment of this species among mages and alchemists is a matter for discussion within treatises more specific than this one. Baruch's 321st treatise offers a succinct analysis for interested scholars. Denizens of Raraku, Imrigin Talobant with the exception of the sandstorm, which they had waited out in Trobe, and the unsettling news of a massacre at Ladro Keep, told to them by an outrider from a well-guarded caravan bound for Erlitan, the journey to within sight of Gadanispan had proved uneventful for Fiddler, Crocus, and Absalar. Although Fiddler knew that the risks that lay ahead, south of the small city out in the Panpots and Odan, were severe enough to eat holes in his stomach, he had anticipated a lull in the final approach to Gadanisban. What he had not expected to find was a ragtag renegade army encamped outside the city walls. The army's main force straddled the road but was shielded by a thin line of hills on the north side. The canal road led the three unsuspecting travellers into the camp's perimeter lines. There had been no warning. A company of footmen commanded the road from flanking hills and oversaw diligent questioning of all who sought entry to the city. The company was supported by a score of Arak tribal horse warriors, who were evidently entrusted with riding down any traveller inclined to flee the approach to the makeshift barricade. Fiddler and his charges would have to ride on through and trust to their disguises. The sapper was anything but confident, although this lent a typically growl scowl to his narrow features, which elicited a wholly proper wariness in two of the three guards who stepped forward to intercept them at the barricade. The city is closed, the unimpressed guard nearest them said, punctuating his words by spitting between the hooves of Fiddler's mount. It would later be said that even a Graal's horse knew an insult when it saw one. Before Fiddler could react, his mount's head snapped forward, stripping the reins from the sapper's hands and bit the guardsman in the face. The horse had twisted its head so that the jaws closed around the man's cheeks and tore into cheeks, upper lip and nose. Blood gushed. The guardsman dropped like a sack of stones, a piercing, keening sound rising from him. For lack of anything else to grip, Fiddler snagged the gelding's ears and pulled hard, backing the beast away, even as it prepared to stomp on the guard's huddled form. Hiding his shock behind an even fiercer frown, the sapper unleashed a stream of growl curses at the two remaining men, who had both backed frantically clear before lowering their pikes. Foul snot of rabid dogs! Anal crust of dysentery goats! Such a sight for two young newlyweds to witness! Will you curse their marriage but two weeks since the blessed day? Shall I loose the fleas on my head to rend your worthless flesh from your jellied bones? As Fiddler roared every growl utterance of disgust he could recall, in an effort to keep the guards unbalanced, a troop of the Arak horse warriors rode up with savage haste. Growl, ten jakatas for your horse. Twelve growl to me. Fifteen and my youngest daughter. Five jakatas for three tail hairs. Fiddler turned his fiercest frown on the riders. Not one of you is fit to smell my horse's farts. But he grinned, unstrapping a beer-filled bladder and tossing it one-handed to the nearest Arak. But let us camp with your troop this night, and for a sliver, you may feel its heat with your palms. Once only. For more, you must pay. With wild grins, the Arak's passed the skin between them, each taking deep swigs to finalise the ritual exchange. 
By sharing beer, Fiddler had granted them status as equals, the gesture stripping the cutting barb from the insult he had thrown their way. Fiddler glanced back at Crocus and Absalar. They looked properly shaken. Biting back his own nausea, the sapper winked. The guards had recovered, but before they could close in, the tribesmen drove their mounts to block them. Ride with us! One of the Arachs shouted to Fiddler. As one, the troop wheeled about. Regaining the reins, Fiddler spurred the gelding after them, sighing when he heard behind him the newlyweds following suit. It was to be a race to the Arach camp, and true to its sudden legendary status, the Grawl horse was determined to burst every muscle in its body to win. Fiddler had never before ridden such a game beast, and he found himself grinning in spite of himself, even as the image of the guardsman's ravaged face remained like a chill knot in the pit of his stomach. The Arak teepees lined the edges of a nearby hill's windswept summit, each set wide apart so that no shade from a neighbor's could cast insult. Women and children came to the crest to watch the race, screaming as Fiddler's mount burst through the leading line, swerving to throw a shoulder into the fastest competitor. That horse stumbled, almost pitching its rider from his wooden felt saddle, then righted itself with a furious scream at being driven from the race. Unimpeded, Fiddler leaned forward as his horse reached the slope and surged up its grassy side. The line of watchers parted as they reached the crest and reined in amidst the teepees. As any plains tribe would, the Arak chose hilltops rather than valley floors for their camps. The winds kept the insects to a minimum. Boulders held down the teepee edges to prevent the high tents from blowing away, and the rising and setting of the sun could be witnessed to mark ritual thanksgiving. The camp's layout was a familiar one to Fiddler, who had ridden with Wiccan scouts over these lands during the Emperor's campaigns. Marking the centre of the ring of teepees was a stone-lined hearth. Four wooden posts off to one side, between two teepees, and joined together with a single hemp rope, provided the corral for the horses. Bundles of rolled felt lay drying nearby, along with tripods bearing stretched hides and strips of meat. The dozen or so camp dogs surrounded the snapping gelding as Fiddler paused in the saddle to take his bearings. The scrawny, yipping mongrels might prove a problem, he realized, but he hoped that their suspicions would apply to all strangers, Graal included. If not, then his disguise was over. The troop arrived moments later, the horse warriors shouting and laughing as they reined in and threw themselves from their saddles. Appearing last on the summit's crest were Crocus and Absalar, neither of whom seemed ready to share in the good humour. Seeing their faces reminded Fiddler of the mangled guardsman on the road below. He regained his scowl and slipped from the saddle. The city is closed, he shouted. Another Mesla folly? The Arak rider who'd spoken before strode up, a fierce grin on his lean face. Not Mesla! Gadanisban has been liberated. The southern hares have fled the whirlwind's promise. Then why was the city closed to us? Are we Mesla? A cleansing growl. Mesla merchants and nobles infest Gadanisban. They were arrested yesterday, and this day they are being executed. Tomorrow morning you shall lead your blessed couple into a free city. Come, this night we celebrate. Fiddler squatted in growl fashion. Has Shaikh raised the whirlwind, then? He glanced back at Crocus and Absalar, as if suddenly regretting having taken on the responsibility. Has the war begun, Arak? Soon, he said. We were cursed with impatience, he added with a smirk. Crocus and Absalar approached. The Arak went off to assist in the preparations for the night's festivities. Coins were flung at the gelding's hooves, and hands cautiously reached out to rest lightly on the animal's neck and flanks. For the moment, the three travellers were alone. That was a sight I will never forget, Crocus said, though I wish to hood I could. Will the poor man live? Fiddler shrugged. If he chooses to. We're camping here tonight? Absalar asked, looking around. Either that, or insult these Arak and risk disemboweling. We will not fool them for much longer, Absalar said. 
Crocus doesn't speak a word of this land's tongue, and mine is a Malazan's accent. That soldier was my age, the Daru thief muttered. Frowning, the sapper said, Our only other choice is to ride into Gdanisban, so that we may witness the whirlwind's vengeance. Another celebration of what's to come? Crocus demanded. This damned apocalypse you're always talking about? I get the feeling that this land's people do nothing but talk. Fiddler cleared his throat. Tonight's celebration in Gdanisban, he said slowly, will be the flaying alive of a few hundred Malazans, Crocus. If we show eagerness to witness such an event, these Arak may not be offended by our leaving early. Absalar turned to watch half a dozen tribesmen approach. Try it, Fiddler, she said. The sapper came close to saluting. He hissed a curse. You giving me orders, recruit? She blinked. I think I was giving orders when you were still clutching the hem of your mother's dress, Fiddler. I know, the one who possessed me. It's his instincts that are ringing like steel on stone right now. Do as I say. The chance for a retort vanished as the Arak arrived. You are blessed, Graal, one of them said. Our Graal clan is on its way to join the apocalypse. Let us hope that, like you, they bring their own beer. Fiddler made a kin gesture, then soberly shook his head. It cannot be, he said, mentally holding his breath. I am outcast. More, these newlyweds insist we enter the city to witness the executions in further blessing of their binding. I am their escort, and so must obey their commands. Absalar stepped forward and bowed. We wish no offence, she said. It wasn't going well. The Arak faces arrayed before them had darkened. Outcast? No kin to honour your trail, Grawl? Perhaps we shall hold you for your brother's vengeance, and in exchange they leave us your horse. With exquisite perfection, Absalar stamped one foot to announce the rage of a pampered daughter and new wife. I am with child. Defy me and be cursed. We go to the city, now. Hire one of us for the rest of your journey, blessed lady. But leave the riven Grawl. He is not fit to serve you. Trembling, Absalar prepared to lift her veil, announcing the intention to voice her curse. The Araks flinched back. You covered the gelding. This is nothing more than greed. I shall now curse you all. Forgive! We bow down, blessed lady. Touch not your veil. Ride on, then! To the city below, ride on! Absalar hesitated. For a moment, Fiddler thought she would curse them anyway. Instead, she spun about. Escort us once more, Grau, she said. Surrounded by worried, frightened faces, the three mounted up. An Arak who had spoken earlier now stepped close to the sapper. Stay only the night, then ride on hard, Grawl. Your kin will pursue you. Tell them, Fiddler said. I won the horse in a fair fight. Tell them that. The Arak frowned. Will they know the story? Which clan? Seabark. The sapper shook his head. Then they shall ride you down for the pleasure of it. But I shall tell them your words anyway. Indeed, your horse was worth killing for. Fiddler thought back to the drunken growl he'd bought the gelding from in Erlitan. Three Jakarta. The tribesmen who moved into the cities lost much. Drink my beer this night, Arak. We shall, before the growl arrive. Ride on. As they rode onto the road and approached Gadanisban's north gate, Absalar said to him, We are in trouble now, aren't we? Is that what your instincts tell you, lass? She grimaced. Aye, Fiddler sighed. That we are. I made a mistake with that outcast story. I think now, given your performance back there, that the threat of your curse would have sufficed. Probably. Crocus cleared his throat. Are we going to actually watch these executions, Fid? The sapper shook his head. Not a chance. We're riding straight through if we can. He glanced at Absalar. 
Let your courage falter, lass. Another temper tantrum, and the citizens will rush you out the south gate on a bit of gold. She acknowledged him with a wry smile. Don't fall in love with this woman, Fid, old friend. Else you loosen your guard of the lad's life and call it an accident of fate. Spilled blood stained the worn cobbles under the arched north gate, and a scatter of wooden toys lay broken and crushed to either side of the causeway. From somewhere close came the screams of children dying. We can't do this, Crocus said, all the colour gone from his face. He rode at Fiddler's side, Absala holding her mount close behind them. Looters and armed men appeared now and then farther down the street, but the way into the city seemed strangely open. A haze of smoke hung over everything, and the burned-out shells of merchant stores and residences gaped desolation on all sides. They rode amidst scorched furniture, shattered pottery and ceramics, and bodies twisted in postures of violent death. The children's dying screams, off to their right, had mercifully stopped, but other, more distant screams rose eerily from Gadanisban's heart. They were startled by a figure darting across their paths, a young girl, naked and bruised. She ran as if oblivious to them, and clambered under a broken-wheeled cart not fifteen paces from Fiddler and his party. They watched her scramble under cover. Six armed men approached from a side street. Their weapons were haphazard, and none wore armour. Blackened blood stained their ragged talaban. One spoke. Grawl, you see a girl? We're not done with her. Even as he asked his question, another of them grinned and gestured to the cart. The girl's knees and feet were clearly visible. A mesler? Fiddler asked. The group's leader shrugged. Well enough. Fear not, Grawl. We'll share. The sapper heard Absalar draw a long, slow breath. He eased back in his saddle. The group split in passing around Fiddler, Crocus, and Absalar. The sapper casually leaned after the nearest man and thrust the point of his long knife into the base of his skull. The growl gelding pivoted beneath Fiddler and kicked out with both rear hooves, shattering another man's chest and propelling him backward, sprawling on the cobbles. Regaining control of the gelding, Fiddler drove his heels into its flanks. They bolted forward, savagely riding down the group's generous leader. From under the horse's stamping hooves came the sound of snapping bones and the sickening crushing of his skull. Fiddler twisted in the saddle to find the remaining three men. Two of them writhed in keening pain near Absala, who sat calm in the saddle, a thick-bladed Kethra knife in each gloved hand. Crocus had dismounted and was now crouching over the last body, removing a throwing knife from a blood-drenched throat. They all turned at a griding of potsherds to see the girl claw her way clear of the cart, scramble to her feet, then race into the shadows of an alley, disappearing from view. The sound of horsemen coming from the north gate reached them. Ride on, Fiddler snapped. Crocus leaped onto his mount's back. Absalar sheathed her blades and gave the sapper a nod as she gathered up the reins. Ride through to the south gate. Fiddler watched the two of them gallop on. Then he slipped from the gelding's back and approached the two men Absalar had wounded. Ah, he breathed when he came close and saw their slashed open crotches. That's the lass I know. The troop of horsemen arrived. They all wore ochre sashes diagonally across their chain-covered chests. Their commander opened his mouth to speak, but Fiddler was first. Is no man's daughter safe in this seven-cursed city? She was no mesler by my ancestors. Is this your apocalypse? Then I pray the pit of snakes awaits you in the seven hells. The commander was frowning. Well, you say these men were rapists? A mesler slut gets what she deserves, but the girl was no mesler. So you killed these men? All six of them. Aye. Who were the other two riders with you? The pilgrims I am sworn to protect. And yet they ride into the city's heart without you at their side. Fiddler scowled. The commander scanned the victims. Two yet live. May they be cursed with a hundred thousand more breaths before Hood takes them. 
the commander leaned on his saddle horn and was silent a moment. Rejoin your pilgrims, Grawl. They have need of your services. Growling, Fiddler remounted. Who rules Gadanisban now? None. The army of the Apocalypse holds but two districts. We shall have the others by the morrow. Fiddler pulled the horse around and kicked it into a canter. The troop did not follow. The sapper swore under his breath. The commander was right. He should not have sent Crocus and Absalar on. He knew himself lucky in that his remaining with the rapists could so easily be construed as typically Graal. The opportunity to brag to the red-swathed riders. The chance to voice curses and display a tribesman's unassailable arrogance. But it risked offering up to contempt his vow to protect his charges. He'd seen the mild disgust in the commander's eyes. In all, he'd been too much of a Grawl horse warrior. If not for Absalar's frightening talents, those two would now be in serious trouble. He rode hard in pursuit, noting belatedly that the gelding was responding to his every touch. The horse knew he was no Grawl, but it evidently decided he was behaving in an approved manner, well enough to accord him some respect. It was, he reflected, this day's lone victory. Gadanisban's central square was the site of past slaughter. Fiddler caught up with his companions when they had just begun walking their horses through the horrific scene. They both turned upon hearing his approach, and Fiddler could only nod at the relief in their faces when they recognized him. Even the Graal gelding hesitated at the square's edge. The bodies covering the cobbles numbered several hundred. Old men and old women, and children for the most part. They had all been savagely cut to pieces, or in some cases burned alive. The stench of sun-warmed blood, bile, and seared flesh hung thick in the square. Fiddler swallowed back his revulsion, cleared his throat. Beyond this square, he said, all pretenses of control cease. Crocus gestured shakily. These are Malazan. Aye, lad. During the conquest, did the Malazan armies do the same to the locals here? You mean, is this just reprisal? Absalar spoke with an almost personal vehemence. The Emperor warred against armies, not civilians. Except at Aaron, Fiddler sardonically interjected, recalling his words with the Tarno spirit walker. When the Talani mass rose in the city, not by Kelenved's command, she retorted. Who ordered the Talani mass into Aaron? I shall tell you. Surly, the commander of the Claw, the woman who took upon herself a new name. Lassine. Fiddler eyed the young woman quizzically. I have never before heard that assertion, Absalom. There were no written orders, none found in any case. I should have killed her there and then, Absalar muttered. Astonished, Fiddler glanced at Crocus. The Daru shook his head. Absalar, the sapper said slowly, you were but a child when Aaron rebelled, then fell to the Talani mass. I know that, she replied, yet these memories, they are so clear. I was sent to Aaron to see the slaughter. To find out what happened, I... I argued with Surly. No one else was in the room, just Surly and... and me. They reached the other end of the square. Fiddler reined in and regarded Absalar for a long moment. Crocus said, It was the rope, the patron god of assassins who possessed you, yet your memories are... Dancers. As soon as he said it, Fiddler knew it was true. The rope has another name, Cotillion. Hood's breath so obvious. No one doubted that the assassinations occurred. Both Dancer and the Emperor, murdered by Lassine and her chosen clawmasters. What did Lassine do with the bodies? No one knows. So Dancer lived, Crocus said with a frown, and ascended became a patron god in the Warren of Shadow. Absalar said nothing, 
watching and listening with a carefully controlled absence of expression on her face. Fiddler was cursing himself for a blind idiot. What house appeared in the deck of dragons shortly afterward? Shadow. Two new ascendants. Cotillion. And Shadow Throne. Crocus's eyes widened. Shadow Throne is Kellenved, he said. They weren't assassinated, either of them. They escaped by ascending into the Shadow Realm. Fiddler smiled wryly. To nurse their thoughts of vengeance, leading eventually to Cotillion possessing a young fisher girl in it go can to begin what would be a long, devious path to Lassine, which failed. Absala? Your words are true, she said without inflection. Then why, the sapper demanded, didn't Cotillion reveal himself to us? To Whiskey Jack, to Kalam, to Dujek. Damn it, Dancer knew us all. And if that bastard understood the notion of friendship at all, then those I've just mentioned were his friends. Absalar's sudden laugh rattled both men. <laughs> I could lie and say he sought to protect you all. Do you really wish the truth, Bridgeburner? Fiddler felt himself flushing. I do, he growled. Dancer trusted but two men. One was Kellenved. The other was Dasem Ultur, the first sword. Dasem is dead. I am sorry if this offends you, Fiddler. Thinking on it, I would suggest that Cotillion trust no one. Not even Shadow Throne. Emperor Kellenved, well, enough. Ascendant Kellenved, Shadow Throne. Ah, that is something wholly different. He was a fool. Fiddler pronounced, gathering up his reins. Absalar's smile was strangely wistful. Enough words, Crocus said. Let's get out of this damned city. Aye. The short journey from the square to the south gate was surprisingly uneventful, for all the commander's warnings. Dusk shrouded the streets, and smoke from a burning tenement block spread an acrid haze that made breathing tortured. They rode through the silent aftermath of slaughter, when the rage has passed and awareness returns with shock and shame. The moment was a single indrawn breath in what Fiddler knew would be an ever-burgeoning wildfire. If the Malazan legions had not been withdrawn from nearby Panpotsen, there would have been the chance of crushing the life from this first spark, with a brutality to match the renegades. When slaughter is flung back on the perpetrators, the thirst for blood is quickly quenched. The Emperor would have acted swiftly, decisively. Hood's breath! He would never have let it slide this far! Fiddler thought. Less than a tenth of a bell after leaving the square, they passed beneath the smoke-blackened arch of an unguarded south gate. Beyond stretched the Panpotsen Odhan, flanked to the west by the ridge that divided the Odhan from the holy desert Raraku. The night's first stars flickered a light overhead. Fiddler broke the long silence. There is a village a little over two leagues to the south. With luck, it won't be a carrion feast. Not yet, anyway. Crocus cleared his throat. Fiddler, if Kalam had known... About Dancer, I mean, Cotillion. The sapper grimaced, glanced at Absala. She'd be with him right now. Whatever response Crocus intended was interrupted by a squealing, flapping shape that dropped down out of the darkness to collide with the lad's back. Crocus let out a shout of alarm as the creature gripped his hair and clambered onto his head. It's just Moby, Fiddler said, trying to shake off the jitters the familiar's arrival had elicited. He squinted. Looks like he's been in a scrap, he observed. Crocus pulled Moby down into his arms. He's bleeding everywhere. Nothing serious, I'd guess, Fiddler said. What makes you so sure? The sapper grinned. Ever seen Bokarala, mate? Fiddler. Absalar's tone was tight. We are pursued. Reining in, Fiddler rose in the stirrups and twisted around. In the distant gloom was a cloud of dust. He hissed a curse. 
the Graal clan. We ride weary mounts, Absalar said. Aye. Queen grant us there's fresh horses to be had in New Velar. At the base of three converging gorges, Kalam left the false path and carefully guided his horse through a narrow drainage channel. The old memories of the ways into Raraku felt heavy in his bones. Everything's changed, yet nothing has changed. Of the countless trails that passed through the hills, all but a few led only to death. The false routes were cleverly directed away from the few waterholes and springs. Without water, Raraku's son was a fatal companion. Kalam knew the holy desert, the map within his head, decades old, was seared anew with every landmark he recognized. Pinnacles, tilted rocks, the wind of a flood channel. He felt as if he had never left, for all his new loyalties, his conflicting allegiances. Once more, a child of this desert. Once more, servant to its sacred need. As the wind and sun did to the sand and stone, Raraku shaped all who had known it. Crossing it had etched the souls of the three companies that would come to be called the Bridge Burners. We could imagine no other name. Raraku burned our pasts away, making all that came before a trail of ashes. He swung the stallion onto a scree, rocks and sand skittering and tumbling as the beast scrambled up the slope, regaining the true path along the ridgeline that would run in a slow descent westward to Raraku's floor. Stars glittered like knife points overhead. The bleached limestone crags shone silver in the faint moonlight, as if reflecting back memories of the day just past. The assassin led his horse between the crumbled foundations of two watchtowers. Potsherds and fractured brick crunched under the stallion's hooves. Risen darted from his path with a soft flit of wings. Kalam felt he had returned home. No, father, a rasping voice warned. Smiling, Kalam reined in. A bold announcement, the voice continued. A stallion, the color of sand, red to laba. I announce what I am, Kalam replied casually. He had pinpointed the source of the voice in the deep shadows of a sinkhole just beyond the left-hand watchtower. There was a crossbow trained on the assassin, but Kalam knew he could dodge the quarrel, rolling from the saddle with the stallion between him and the stranger. Two well-thrown knives into the darker shape amidst the shadows would punctuate the exchange. He felt at ease. Disarm him, the voice drawled. Two massive hands closed on his wrists from behind and savagely pulled both his arms back until he was dragged, cursing with rage, over the stallion's rump. As soon as he cleared the beast, the hands twisted his body around and drove him hard, Face first into the stony ground. The air knocked from his lungs. Kalam was helpless. He heard the one who'd spoken rise up from the sinkhole and approach. The stallion snapped his teeth, but was swiftly calmed at a soft word from the stranger. The assassin listened as the saddlebags were lifted away and set on the ground. Flaps opened. Ah, he's the one then. The hands released Kalam. Groaning, the assassin managed to roll over. A giant of a man stood over him, his face tattooed like shattered glass. A long single braid hung down the left side of his chest. The man wore a cloak of Bedouin hide over a vest of armor that seemed made of clamshells. The wooden handle and stone pommel of a bladed weapon of some kind jutted from just under his left arm. The broad belt over the man's loincloth was oddly decorated with what looked to Kalam like dried mushroom caps of various sizes. He was over seven foot tall, yet muscled enough to seem wide, and his flat, broad face gazed down without expression. Regaining his breath, the assassin sat up. A sorcerous silence, he muttered, mostly to himself. The man who now held the Book of the Apocalypse heard the gruff whisper and snorted. 
You fancy no mortal could get that close to you without your hearing him. You tell yourself it must have involved magic. You are wrong. My companion is Toblakai, an escaped slave from the Laderon Plateau of Genabacus. He's seen seventeen summers and has personally killed forty-one enemies. Those are their ears on his belt. The man rose, offering Kalam his hand. You are most welcome to Raraku, Deliverer. Our long vigil is ended. Grimacing, Kalam accepted the man's hand and felt himself pulled effortlessly to his feet. The assassin brushed the dust from his clothes. You are not bandits, then. The stranger barked a laugh. <laughs> no, we are not. I am Leoman, captain of Shaikh's bodyguard. My companion refuses his name to strangers, and we shall leave it at that. We are the two she chose. I must deliver the book into Shaikh's hands, Kalam said. Not yours, Leoman. The squat warrior, by his colour and clothing a child of this desert, held out the book. By all means. Cautiously, the assassin retrieved the heavy, battered term. A woman spoke behind him. You may now give it to me, deliverer. Kalam slowly closed his eyes, struggling to gather the frayed ends of his nerves. He turned. There could be no doubting. The small, honey-skinned woman standing before him radiated power in waves. The smell of dust and sand whipped by winds. The taste of salt and blood. Her rather plain face was deeply lined, giving her an appearance of being around forty years old, though Kalam suspected she was younger. Raraku was a harsh home. Involuntarily, Kalam dropped to one knee, he held out the book. I deliver unto you, Shaikh, the Apocalypse. And with it, a sea of blood, he thought. How many innocent lives shattered to bring Lassim down? Hood, take me. What have I done? The book's weight left his hands as she accepted it. It is damaged. The assassin looked up slowly rose. Shaikh was frowning, one finger tracing a torn corner of the leather cover. Well, one should not be surprised, given that it is a thousand years old. I thank you, Deliverer. Will you now join my band of soldiers? I sense great talents in you. Kalam bowed. I cannot. My destiny lies elsewhere. Flee, Kalam, he thought, before you test the skills of these bodyguards. Flee, before uncertainty kills you. Her dark eyes narrowed on his searchingly, then widened. I sense something of your desire, though you shield it well. Ride on, then. The way south is open to you. More, you shall have an escort. I need no escort, seer but you shall have one in any case. She gestured, and a bulky, ungainly shape appeared from the gloom. Holy one, Leoman hissed warningly. You question me, Shaikh snapped. The Toblakai is as an army, nor are my skills lacking, holy one. Yet, since I was a child, Shaikh cut in, her voice brittle, one vision has possessed me above all others. I have seen this moment, Leoman, a thousand times. At dawn I shall open the book, and the whirlwind shall rise, and I shall emerge from it, renewed. Blades in hands and unhanded in wisdom, such are the wind's words, young yet old. One life whole, another incomplete. I have seen, Leoman. She paused, drew a breath. 
I see no other future but this one. We are safe. Shaik faced Kalam again. I acquired a, a pet recently, which I now send with you, for I sense possibilities in you, Deliverer. She gestured again. The huge, ungainly shape moved closer, and Kalam took an involuntary step backward. His stallion voiced a soft squeal and stood trembling. Leoman spoke. An Aptorian deliverer from the realm of Shadow, sent into Raraku by Shadow Throne to spy. It belongs to Shaikh now. The beast was a nightmare, close to nine feet tall, crouching on two thin hind limbs. A lone foreleg, long and multi-jointed, jutted down from its strangely bifurcated chest. From a hunched angular shoulder blade, the demon's sinuous neck rose to a flat, elongated head. Needle fangs ridged its jawline, which was swept back and naturally grinning like a dolphin's. Head, neck, and limbs were black, while its torso was a dun grey. A single flat black eye regarded Kalam with appalling awareness. The assassin saw barely healed scarring on the demon. It's been in a fight, Shaik scowled. A diver's desert wolves. She drove them off. More like a tactical withdrawal, Leoman added dryly. The beast does not eat or drink, so far as we've seen. And though the Holy One believes otherwise, it appears to be entirely brainless. That look in its eye is likely a mask hiding very little. Leoman plagues me with doubts, Shaik said. It is his chosen task, and I grow increasingly weary of it. Doubts are healthy, Kalam said, then snapped his mouth shut. The Holy One only smiled. I sensed you two were alike. Leave us then. The Seven Holies know one Leoman is enough. With a final glance at the young Toblakai, the assassin vaulted back into the saddle, swung the sally into the south trail, and nudged him into a trot. The Aptorian evidently preferred some distance between them. It moved parallel to Kalam at over twenty paces away, a darker stain in the night, striding awkwardly yet silently on its three bony legs. After ten minutes of riding at a fast trot, the assassin slowed the stallion to a walk. He had delivered the book, personally seen to the rise of the whirlwind. Answered his blood's call, no matter how stained the motivation. The demands of his other life lay ahead. He would kill the Empress to save the Empire. If he succeeded, Shaikh's rebellion was doomed. Control would be restored. And if I fail, they will bleed each other to exhaustion. Shaikh and Lassine, two women of the same cloth. Could they even look alike? It was not a far reach then for Kalam to see in his shadow a hundred thousand deaths. And he wondered if, throughout seven cities, readers of the Deck of Dragons now held a newly awakened herald of death in their trembling hands. Queen's blessing, it's done. Minutes before dawn, Shaik sat down cross-legged before the Book of the Apocalypse. Her two guards flanked her, each in the ruins of a watchtower. The Toblakai youth leaned on his two-handed ironwood sword. A battered bronze helmet, missing a cheek guard, was on his head, his eyes hidden in the shadow of a slitted half-visor. His companion's arms were crossed. A crossbow leaned against one hide-wrapped leg. Two one-handed morning stars were thrust through his broad leather belt. He wore a colorless talaba scarf over a peaked iron helm. Below it, his smooth-shaven face showed latticed by thirty years of sun and wind. His light blue eyes were ever restless. The dawn's ray swept over Shaikh. The Holy One reached down and opened the book. The quarrel struck her forehead an inch above her left eye. 
The iron head shattered the bone, plunging inward a moment before the spring-driven barbs opened like a deadly flower inside her brain. The quarrel's head then struck the inside of the back of her skull, exiting explosively. Shaikh toppled. Tene Baralta bellowed and watched with satisfaction as Arald Arpat and Lostara Yil led the twelve red blades in a charge toward the two hapless bodyguards. The desert warrior had dropped and rolled a moment after Shaikh's death. The crossbow now in his hands bucked. Harold Arpat's chest visibly caved inward as the quarrel drove through his breastbone. The tall sergeant was knocked backward, sprawling in the dust. The commander bellowed in fury, drew his talwars and joined the attack. Lostara's squad threw lances in staggered succession when but fifteen paces from the Toblakai. Tene Baralta's eyes widened in astonishment as not one of the six lances struck home. Impossibly lithe for one of such bulk, the Toblakai seemed to simply step through them, shifting weight and dipping a shoulder before springing to close, his archaic wooden sword sweeping across in a backswing that connected with the leading red blade's knees. The man went down in a cloud of dust, both legs shattered. Then the Toblakai was in the squad's midst. As Tene Baralta sprinted to reach them, he saw Lostara yield reel back, blood spraying from her head, her helmet spinning away to bounce across the potsherd gravel. A second soldier fell, his throat crushed by a thrust from the wooden sword. Arpat's squad attacked the desert warrior. Chains snapped as the morning stars lashed out and struck with deadly accuracy. There was no more difficult a weapon to parry than a morning star. The chain wrapped over any block, sending the iron ball unimpeded to its target. The weapon's greatest drawback was that it was slow to recover. But in the instant that Tene Baralta glanced over to gauge the battle, he saw that the desert warrior fought equally well with either hand and was staggering his attacks, resulting in a perpetual sequence of blows that none of the soldiers facing him could penetrate. A helmed head crumpled under the impact in the momentary span of the commander's glance. In an instant, Tene Baralta's tactics shifted. Shaikh was dead. The mission was a success. There would be no whirlwind. It was pointless throwing lives away against these two appalling executioners, who had, after all, failed in guarding Shaikh's life and now sought naught but vengeance. He barked out the recall and watched as his soldiers battled to extricate themselves from the two men. The effort proved costly as three more fell before the remaining fighters cleared a space in which to turn and run. Two of Lestara Yil's soldiers were loyal enough to drag the dazed captain with them in their retreat. Bristling at the sight of the routed red blades, Tene Baralta swallowed down a stream of bitter curses. Talwas held out, he shielded the soldiers' withdrawal, his nerves on fire at the thought of either bodyguard accepting the challenge. But the two men did not pursue resuming their positions at the watchtowers. The desert warrior crouched to reload his crossbow. The sight of the weapon readied was the last Tene Baralta had of the two killers, as the commander then ducked out of sight and jogged with his soldiers back to the small canyon where the horses were tethered. In the high-walled arroyo, the red blades stationed their lone surviving crossbowmen on the south-facing crest, then paused to staunch wounds and regain their breaths. Behind them, their horses nickered at the smell of blood. A soldier splashed water on Lestara's red-smeared face. She blinked, awareness slowly returning to her eyes. Tane Baralta scowled down at her. Recover yourself, Captain, he growled. You are to regain Kalam's trail, at a safe distance. She nodded, reaching up to probe the gash on her forehead. That sword was wood! Yet as hard as steel, aye. Who'd take the Toblakai and the other one at that? We'll leave them be. A slightly wry expression coming to her face, Lestara Yil simply nodded again. Tane reached down a gauntleted hand and pulled the sergeant to her feet. A fine shot, Lestara Yil. You killed the god-cursed witch and all that went with her. The Empress shall be pleased. More than pleased. Weaving slightly, Lossara went to her horse, pulled herself into the saddle. We ride to Pan Potsen, 
Tene Baralta told her. To spread the word, he added with a dark grin. Do not lose Kalam, Captain. I've yet to fail in that, she said. You know I'll count these losses as yours, don't you? He thought. Too clever, lass. He watched her ride away, then swung his glare on his remaining soldiers. Cowards! Lucky for you that I guarded your retreat. Mount up! Learman laid out the blanket on the flat ground between the two watchtower foundations and rolled Shaikh's linen-wrapped body onto it. He knelt beside it a moment, motionless, then wiped grimy sweat from his brow. The Toblakai stood nearby. She's dead. I see that, Learman said dryly, reaching to collect the blood-spattered book, which he slowly rewrapped in cloth. What do we do now? She opened the book. It was dawn. Nothing happened, except a quarrel going through her head. Damn you, I know. The Toblakai crossed his massive arms, fell silent. The prophecy was certain, Leoman said after a few minutes. He rose, wincing at his battle-stiffened muscles. What do we do now? The young giant asked again. She said she would be renewed. He sighed, the book heavy in his hands. We wait. The Toblakai raised his head, sniffed. There's a storm coming. Book Two Whirlwind I have walked old roads, this day, that became ghosts with coming night, and were gone to my eyes with dawn. Such was my journey leagues across centuries in one blink of the sun. Pardu Epitaph Chapter 6 Early in Kelenved's reign, cults proliferated among the imperial armies, particularly among the marines. It should be remembered that this was also the time of Dasam Ultor, first sword and supreme commander of the Malazan forces, a man sworn to hood. Malazan Campaigns, Volume 2, Dyka Beneth sat at his table in Beulah's, cleaning his nails with a dagger. They were immaculate, making the habit an affectation. Felicen had grown familiar with his poses and what they betrayed of his moods. The man was in a rage, shot through with fear. Uncertainties now plagued his life. Like bloodfly larvae, they crawled beneath his skin, growing as they gnawed on his flesh. His face, his forehead, and his thick, scarred wrists all glistened with sweat. The pewter mug of chilled Saltuan wine sat untouched on the battered tabletop, a row of flies marching round and round the mug's rim. Felice stared at the tiny black insects, memories of horror returning to her. Hood's acolyte, who was not there. A man-shaped swarm of death sprites, the buzz of wings shaping words. There's light in your eyes again, lass, Beneth said. Tells me you're realizing what you've become. An ugly light. He pushed a small leather pouch across the table until it sat directly before her. Kill it. Her hand trembled as she reached for the bag, loosened the ties, and removed a button of Durhang. He watched her crumbling the moist pollen into her pipe bowl. Six days, and Bodan was still missing. Captain Sarwak had called in Beneth more than once. Skullcup was very nearly dismantled during the search. Patrols on Beetle Road up on the rim were doubled, round and round, and sinker length was dredged. It was as if the man had simply vanished. Beneth took it personally. His control of Skull Cup was compromised. He'd called her back to his side, not out of compassion, but because he no longer trusted her. She knew something. Something about Bodin. And worse, he knew she was more than she pretended to be. 
Beneath and Sawak have spoken, Hebaric said the day she'd left, when his ministrations had done enough to allow her to fake her well-being sufficient to justify her leaving. Be careful, lass. Beneath is taking you back, but only to personally oversee your destruction. What was haphazard before is now precise, deliberate. He's been given guidelines. How do you know any of this? True, I'm just guessing, but Bodar's escape has given Beneth leverage over Sarwag, and he's likely to have used it to get the inside story on you. Sarwag's granted him more control. There won't be another Boda. Neither man can afford it. Sawak has no choice but to give Beneth more control, more knowledge. The Durhang tea had given her relief from the pain of her fractured ribs and her swollen jaw, but it had not been potent enough to dull her thoughts. Minute by minute, she'd felt her mind drag her ever closer to desperation. Leaving Haborik had been a flight, her journey back to Beneth a panicked necessity. He smiled as she set flame to the Durhang. Boda wasn't just a dockside thug, was he? She frowned at him through a haze of smoke. Beneth set the dagger down and gave it a spin. They both watched the blade's flashing turns. When it ceased, the point faced Beneth. He scowled, spun it a second time. As the point slowed to face him again... He picked up the dagger and slid it back into the sheath at his belt, then reached for the pewter mug. The flies scattered as he raised the mug to his lips. I don't know anything about Boda, Felicin said. His deep-set eyes studied her for a moment. You haven't figured anything out about anything, have you? Which makes you either thick or willfully ignorant. She said nothing. A numbness was spreading through her. Was it me, lass? Was it so much of a surrender becoming mine? I wanted you, Felicin. You were beautiful. Sharp. I could see that in your eyes. Am I to blame for you now? He saw her glance down at the pouch on the table and offered up a wry smile. Orders are orders. Besides, you could have said no. At any time, she said, looking away. Ah, not my fault, then. No, she replied. The faults are all mine, Beneth. Abruptly, he rose. There's nothing pleasant in the air tonight. The Shigai's begun. The hot wind. All your suffering until now has just been a prelude, lass. Summer begins with the Shigai, but tonight... He stared down at her, but did not finish the sentence, simply taking her by the arm and pulling her upright. Walk with me. Beneth had been granted the right to form a militia, consisting of his chosen slaves, each now armed with a clout. Throughout the night they patrolled the makeshift streets of Skullcup. The curfew's restriction would now be punctuated with beating, followed by execution, for anyone caught out in the open after nightfall. The guards would handle the execution. Beneth's militia took their pleasure in the beating. Beneth and Felicin joined the patrol squad, half a dozen men she knew well, as Beneth had brought their loyalty with her body. If it's a quiet night, he promised them, we'll take time for some relaxation come the dawn. The men grinned at that. They walked the littered aisles of sand, watchful but seeing no one else. Coming opposite a gambling establishment called Suruks, they saw a group of Dossai guardsmen. The Dossai captain, Gunip, was with them. Their knighthooded gazes followed the patrol as it continued on. Beneth hesitated, as if of a mind to speak with Gunip, then, with a loud sigh through his nostrils, resumed walking. One hand reached up to rest on the pommel of his knife. Felicin became dully aware of something, as if the hot wind breathed a new menace into the night air. 
The chatter of the militiamen, she noted, had fallen away, and signs of nervousness were evident. She extracted another button of Durhang and popped it into her mouth, where it rested cool and sweet between cheek and gum. Watching you do that, Beneth muttered, reminds me of Sarwak. She blinked. Sarwak? Aye. The worse things get, the more he shuts his eyes. Her words came out slurred. And what things are getting worse? As if in answer, a shout followed by harsh laughter sounded behind them, coming from the front of Suruk's. Beneth halted his men with a gesture, then walked back to the crossroads they had just passed. From there he could see Suruk's and Gunip's soldiers. Like a wraith rising up and stealing through Beneth, tension slowly filled the man's posture. As she watched, vague alarms rang in Felice's skull. She hesitated, then turned to the militiamen. Something's happened. Go to him. They were watching as well. One of them scowled, one hand sliding skittish along his belt to the cloud. He ain't given us no orders, he growled. The others nodded, fidgeting as they waited in the shadows. He's standing alone, she said, out in the open. I think there's arrows trained on him. Shut your face, girl, the militiaman snapped. We ain't going out there. Beneth almost backed up a step, then visibly steeled himself. They're coming for him, Felicin hissed. Gunnip and his docile soldiers wandered into view, closing a half-circle around Beneth. Cocked crossbows resting on forearms pointed toward him. Felicin spun to the militiaman. Back him up, damn you! I'll take you! One of the men spat back. The patrol was scattering, slipping back into the shadows and then into the dark alleyways beyond. You're all alone back there, lass! Captain Gunnip called out. His soldiers laughed. Come join Beneth here. We're just telling him some things. That's all. No worry, lass. Beneth tried to speak to her. A docile guardsman stepped up and struck him across the face with a gauntleted hand. Beneth staggered, swearing as he brought his hands up to his shattered nose. Felicin stumbled backward, then twisted and ran, even as crossbows thudded. Quarrels whipped past her on either side as she plunged into an alley mouth. Laughter echoed behind her. She ran on, the alley paralleling Rust Ramp. A hundred paces ahead waited Dark Hall in the barracks. She was out of breath when she stumbled into the open area surrounding the two Malazan buildings, her heart hammering in her chest as if she was fifty years old, not fifteen. Slowly the shock of seeing Beneth struck down, spread through her. Voices shouted from behind the barracks. Horse hooves pounded. A score of slaves appeared, running toward where Felicin stood with a half hundred mountain docile soldiers behind them. Lances took some men in the back, driving them down into the dust. Unarmed, the slaves tried to flee, but the docile had now completed the encirclement. Belatedly, Felicin realized that escape had been denied her as well. I saw Beneth bleed. From that thought followed another. Now we die. The docile horses trampled men and women. Talwar swung down. In hopeless silence, the slaves were dying. Two riders closed in on Felicin. She watched, wondering which of them would reach her first. One gripped a lance, angled down to take her in the chest. The other held his wide-bladed sword high, readied for a downward chop. In their faces she saw flushed joy, and was surprised at the inhumanity of the expression. When they were both but moments away, quarrels thudded into their chests. Reeling, both men toppled from the saddles. Felicin turned to see a troop of Malazan crossbowmen advancing in formation, the front line kneeling to reload while the second line slipped a few paces ahead, took aim, then, as one, loosed quarrels into the milling docile horsemen. Animals and men screamed in pain. 
A third volley broke the docile, scattering them back into the darkness beyond the barracks. A handful of slaves still lived. A sergeant barked an order and a dozen soldiers moved forward, checking the bodies, littering the area, then pushing the survivors back toward the troops' position. Come with me, a voice hissed beside Felicin. She blinked, slow to recognize Pella's face. What? We're quartering the slaves at the stables, but not you. He gently took her arm. We're badly outnumbered. Defending slaves isn't a high priority, I'm afraid. Sawa wants this mutiny crushed. Tonight. She studied his face. What are you saying? The sergeant had pulled his troop into a more defensible position at an alley mouth. The twelve detached soldiers were pushing the slaves down the side street that led to the stables. Pella guided Felicin in the same direction. Once out of sight of the sergeant, he addressed the other soldiers. Three of you, with me! One replied, As though Bond stirred your brains, Pella, I don't feel safe as it is. And do you want to split the squad? Another growled, Let's just get rid of these damned slaves and get back before the sergeant marches to rejoin the captain. This is Beneth's woman, Pella said. I don't think Beneth is still alive, Felicin said dully. He was, not five minutes ago, lass, Pella said, frowning. Bloodied a bit, nothing more. He's rallying his militia right now. He swung to the others. We'll need Beneth, Raborid, never mind Sawak's bluster. Now three of you, we're not going far. With a scowl, the one named Raborid gestured to two others. A fire had been started in Skullcup's western arm, somewhere on Spit Row. Unchecked, it was spreading fast, throwing a lurid orange glow up against the underbellies of billowing smoke. As Pella dragged Felicing along, Raborid talked unceasingly. Where in Hood's name is this Bethra garrison? You think they can't see the flames? There were Malazan squads up patrolling Beetle Road. A rider would have been sent. The troops should be here by now, damn it! There were bodies in the streets, huddled, motionless shapes. The small party went around them without pause. Hood knows what Cunip's thinking, the soldier went on. Sawak will see every damn docile within fifty leagues if he gutted and left out under the sun. This is the place, Pella said, tugging Felice into a halt. Defensive position, he ordered the others. I'll be but a moment. They were at Haborik's house. No light leaked from the shutters. The door was locked. Snorting with disgust, Pella kicked the flimsy barrier aside. His hand against her back, he pushed her into the darkness within, then followed. There's no one here, Felicin said. Pella did not reply, still pushing her along, until they reached the cloth divider behind which was the ex-priest's bedroom. Pull it aside, Felicin. She did, stepping into the small room. Pella followed. Heboric sat on his cot, staring up at them in silence. I wasn't sure, Pella said in a low voice, if you still wanted her along. The ex-priest grunted. What of you, Pella? We might manage. No, take her instead. I've got to rejoin the captain. We'll crush this mutiny, but the timing's perfect for you. Heboric sighed. Aye. That it is. Fain is Grant Bodin. Step out of them shadows. This lad's no risk to us. Pella started as a massive shape separated itself from behind the hanging. Bodin's narrow set eyes glittered in the dimness. He said nothing. Shaking himself, Pella stepped back to the entrance, gripping the grimy cloth with one hand. A finer guard you, Hiboric. Thank you, lad, for everything. Pella gave a curt nod, then was gone. Felicin frowned at Bodin. You're wet. Hiboric rose. Is all ready? He asked Bodin. The big man nodded. Are we escaping? Felicin asked. Aye. How? 
Hiboric scowled. You'll see soon enough. Bodan picked up two large leather packs from behind him and tossed one effortlessly to Hiboric, who trapped it deftly between his arms. The sound the pack made when the ex-priest caught it made it obvious to Felicin that it was in fact a sealed bladder, filled with air. We're going to swim Sinker Lake, she said. Why? There's nothing but a sheer cliff on the other side. There's caves, Hiboric said. You can reach them when the water level's low. Ask Boda, since he's been hiding in one for a week. We have to take Beneth, Felicin pronounced. Now, lass, no, you owe me, both of you. You wouldn't be alive to even do this, Hiboric, if it wasn't for me and for Beneth. I'll find him, meet you at the lakeshore. No, you won't, Bodar said. I'll get him. He handed Felicin the bladder. She watched him slip out through a back door she hadn't known was there, then slowly turned to regard Hiboric. He was crouched down, examining the loose netting wrapped around the packs. I wasn't part of your escape plan, was I, Hiboric? He glanced up, raised his brows. Until tonight, it seemed you'd made Skull Cup your paradise. I didn't think you'd be interested in leaving. Paradise? For some reason, the word shook her. She sat down on the cot. Eyeing her, he shrugged. Beneth provided. She held his gaze until, after a long moment, he finally pulled away, hefting the pack as he rose with a grunt. We should get going, he said gruffly. I'm not much in your eyes any more, am I, Hiboric? Was I ever? Felicin, house of Paran, she thought, whose sister was adjunct Devora, whose brother rode with adjunct Lorne, noble-born, a spoiled little girl, a whore. He did not reply making his way to the gap in the back wall. The western half of Skull Cup was in flames, lighting the entire bowl a grainy, wavering red. Hiboric and Felicin saw evidence of clashes as they hurried down Work Road toward the lake. Drowned horses, dead Malazan and Dossai guards. Beulah's Inn had been barricaded, then the barriers breached. From the darkness of the doorway as they passed came a faint moaning. Felician hesitated, but Hiboric hooked her arm. You don't want to go in there, lass, he said. Ganip's men hit that place early on, and hard. Beyond the town's edge, work road stretched empty and dark all the way to the Three Fates Fork. Through the rushes on their left was the glimmer of Sinker Lake's placid surface. The ex-priest led her down into the grasses, bade her crouch down, then did the same. We'll wait here, he said, wiping sweat from his wide, tattooed forehead. The mud under her knees was clammy, pleasantly cool. So we swim to the cave? Then what? It's an old mine shaft, leading up beyond the rim, well past Beetle Road. There will be supplies left for us at the other end. From there... It's out across the desert. Tossin Pali. He shook his head. Straight west to the inside coast. Nine, ten days. There's hidden springs. Bodar has memorized their locations. We'll get picked up by a boat and taken across to the mainland. How? Who? The ex-priest grimaced. An old friend with more loyalty than is probably good for him. Good knows, I'm not complaining. And Pella was the contact. Aye, some obscure connection to do with friends of fathers and uncles and friends of friends or something like that. He first approached you, you know, but you didn't catch on. So he found me himself. I don't remember anything like that. A quote attributed to Kellenved and recorded by the man arranging our escape, Dyker. 
a familiar name. The Imperial Historian. He spoke on my behalf at the trial, then afterward arranged to be sent to Hissar by Warren. He fell silent, slowly shook his head. To save a bitter old man who more than once denounced his written histories as deliberate lies. If I live to stand face to face with Dyker, I think I owe the man an apology. A buzzing, frenzied sound reached them, coming from the smoky air above the town. The sound grew louder. Sinker Lake's smooth surface vanished beneath what seemed a spray of hailstones. Felicin crouched lower in fear. What is it? What's happening? Hibaric was silent a moment, then he hissed. Blood flies, drawn, then driven by the fires. Quickly, lass, scoop up mud, cover yourself, and then me, hurry. Glittering clouds of the insects swept into view, racing like gusts of fog. Frantic, Felicin dug her fingers into the cool mud between the red stems, slapping handfuls against her neck, arms, face. As she worked, she crawled forward on her knees until she sat in the lake water. Then she turned to Oborik. Come closer! He scrambled to her side. They'll dive through the water, girl. You need to get out of here. Cover your legs in mud. Once I'm done with you, she said. But it was too late. All at once the air was almost unbreathable, as a cloud engulfed them. Bloodflies shot down into the water like darts. Pain lanced through her thighs. Hibaric pushed her hands away, then ducked down. Mind yourself, lass! The command was unnecessary, as all thoughts of helping Hibaric had vanished with the first savage bite. Felicin leaped from the water, clawed gouges of mud free, and slapped them down on her blood-smeared thighs. She quickly added more down to her calves, her ankles and feet. Insects crawled through her hair. Whimpering, she clawed them away, then covered her head with mud. Bloodflies rode her drawn gasps into her mouth, biting as she gagged and spat. She found herself biting down, crunching them, and their bitter juices burned like acid. They were everywhere, blinding her as they gathered in frenzied clumps around her eyes. Screaming, she scraped them away, then reached down and found more mud. Smoothing darkness, yet her screaming did not stop, would not stop. The insects were at her ears. She filled them with mud. Silence. Handless arms wrapped tight around her, Hibaric's voice reaching her as if from a great distance away. It's all right, lass. It's all right. You can stop screaming, Felicin. You can stop. She had curled into a ball amidst the reeds. The pain of the bites was passing to numbness, on her legs, around her eyes and ears, and in her mouth. Cool, soft numbness. She heard herself fall silent. The swarm's passing, Hibaric said. Fainest blessing, too fierce a touch for them. We're all right, lass. Wipe clear your eyes. See for yourself. She made no move. It was too easy to lie still, the numbness spreading through her. Wake up! Hibaric snapped. There's an egg in every bite, each secreting a poison that deadens, turns your flesh into something soft and dead. Food for the larvae inside those eggs. You understanding me, lass? We need to kill those eggs. I've a tincture in the pouch at my belt. But you'll need to apply it yourself, right? An old man without hands can't do it for you. She moaned. Wake up, damn you! He struck her, pushed, then kicked. Cursing, Felicin sat up. Stop it, uh, I'm awake. Her words slurred, passing through her numbed mouth. Where is that pouch? Here, open your eyes. She could barely see through the puffed swelling, 
but a strange blue penumbra rising from Hiboric's tattoos illuminated the scene. He was unbitten. Venus blessing, too fierce a touch, she thought. He gestured at the pouch at his belt. Quickly, those eggs are about to hatch. Then the larvae will start eating you from the inside out. Open the pouch. There, the black bottle, the small one. Open it. She removed the stopper. A bitter smell made her recoil. One drop on your fingertip, then push that drop right into the wound. Push it hard. Then the next one, and the next. I... I can't feel the ones around my eyes. I'll guide you, lass. Harry! The horror did not end. The tincture, a foul, dark brown juice that stained her skin yellow, did not kill the emerging larvae but drove them out. Haboric directed her hands to the ones around her eyes and ears as each sluggishly wriggled free, and she plucked them from the holes made by the bites, each larvae as long as a nail clipping, limp with the soporific effect of the tincture. The bites she could see illustrated what was happening around her eyes and ears. In her mouth, the tincture's bitterness overrode the blood fire larvae's poison, making her head spin and her heart beat alarmingly fast. The larvae fell like grains of rice onto her tongue. She spat them out. I'm sorry, Felicin, Iboric said after she had done. He was examining the bites around her eyes, his expression filled with compassion. A chill ran through her. What's wrong? Will I go blind? Deaf? What is it, Haboric? He shook his head, slowly sat back. Blood fly bites. The deadening poison kills the flesh. You will heal, but there will be pock marks. I'm so sorry, lass. It's bad around your eyes. It's... it's bad. She almost laughed, her head reeling. Another shiver rippled through her, and she hugged herself. I've seen those. Locals, slaves, here and there. Aye, normally, bloodflies don't swarm. It must have been the flames. Now, listen, a good enough healer, someone with high denial, can remove the scarring. We'll find ourselves such a healer, Felicen. I swear it, by Fainer's tusks, I swear it. I feel sick. That's the tincture. Rapid heart, chills, nausea. It's the juice of a plant native to seven cities. If you drank down what's left in that tiny bottle, you'd be dead in minutes. This time she did laugh, the sound shaky and brittle. <laughs> I might welcome Hood's gates, Hiboric. She squinted at him. The blue glow was fading. Fainer must be very forgiving. He frowned at that. I can make no sense of it, to be honest. I can think of more than one high priest of Fainer who'd choke at the suggestion that the boar god was forgiving. He sighed. But it seems you're right. He might want to offer thanks, a sacrifice. I might he growled, looking away. It must have been a great offence that drove you from your guard, Hiboric. He did not reply. After a moment he rose, eyes on the flame-racked town. Riders coming! She sat up straighter, still too dizzy to stand. Beneth? He shook his head. Moments later a troop of Malazans rode up, halting directly opposite Hiboric and Felicin. At the head was Captain Sawag. A docile blade had laid open one cheek. His uniform was wet and dark with blood. Felicin involuntarily shrank back from his cold, lizard eyes as they fixed on her. He finally spoke. When you're up on the rim, look south. Hiboric cursed softly in surprise. You're letting us go? Thank you, Captain. 
His face darkened. Uh, not for you, old man. It's seditious bastards like you that are the cause of all this. I'd rather spit to you on a spear right now. He made as if to say something more, his eyes finding Felicin once again. But instead, he simply reined his mount around. The two fugitives watched the troop ride back into Skullcup. They were heading for a battle. Felicin knew this instinctively. Another sourceless certainty told her, in a whisper, that they would all die. Captain Sawak, Pella, every Malazan. She glanced over at Haborik. The man looked thoughtful as he watched the troop reach the edge of town, then vanish into the smoke. A moment later, Bodin rose from a bed of reeds nearby. Felicin clambered to her feet and stepped toward him. Where's Beneth? Dead, lass. You... you... Her words were drowned out in a flood of pain, rising up within her, an anguish more thorough in shattering her than anything she'd yet suffered. She staggered back a step. Bonas' small, flat eyes held steady on her. Heboric cleared his throat. We'd best hurry. Dawn's not far off. And while I doubt our crossing the lake is likely to be noticed, there's no point in making our intentions obvious. After all, we're Malazan. He strode down to the waiting bladders. The plan is to wait out the coming day at the other end of the reach, then set out after sunset. Less likely that any roving bands of docile will see us. Dully. Felicin followed the two men to the lake's edge. Bodas strapped one of the packs against Hiboric's chest. Felicin realized she would have to share the other bladder with Bodin. She studied the big man as he checked the netting one last time. Beneth's dead, so he says, she thought. He probably didn't even look for him. Beneth's alive. He must be. Nothing more than the bloodied face, Bodin's lying. Sinker Lake's water washed the last of the mud and tincture from Felicin's skin. It was not nearly enough. The cliff face bounced back the echoes of their harsh breaths. Chilled and feeling the water striving to pull her down, Felicin tightened her grip on the netting. I see no cave, she gasped. Bodin grunted. Surprised you can see anything at all, he said. She made no reply. The flesh around her eyes had swollen until only slits remained. Her ears felt like slabs of meat, heavy and huge, and the flesh inside her mouth had closed around her teeth. She was having difficulty breathing, constantly clearing her throat without effect. The discomforts left her feeling dislocated, as if she had no vanity left to sting, bringing an almost amused relief. Surviving this is all that counts, she thought. Let Tephora see all the scars she's given me the day we come face to face. I need say nothing then to justify my revenge. The opening is under the surface, Heboric said. We need to puncture these bladders and swim down. Bodin will go first with a rope tied to his waist. Hold on to that rope, lass, else you'll be pulled to the bottom. Boda handed her a dagger, then laid the rope over the bobbing pack. A moment later, he pushed himself toward the cliff wall and vanished beneath the lake's surface. Felicin snatched the rope, gripping it hard as she watched the coils play out. How far down? Seven, eight feet. Hiboric said, then about fifteen feet through the cave until you'll find your next breath. Can you manage it, lass? I will have to, she thought. Faint screams drifted across the lake. The burning town's last pitiful cries. It had happened so swiftly, almost quietly. A single night to bring Skullcup to a bloody end. It didn't seem real. 
She felt a tug on the rope. Your turn, Iboric said. Puncture the bladder, let it sink away from you, then follow the rope. She reversed her grip on the dagger and stabbed down. A gust of air whistled, the pack sagging. Like hands, the water pulled her down. She snatched a frantic breath before slipping under. In a moment, the rope no longer led down, but up. She came up against the slick face of the cliff. The dagger fell away as she clutched the rope with both hands and pulled herself along. The cave mouth was a deeper blackness, the water bitter cold. Already her lungs screamed for air. She felt herself blacking out, but savagely pushed the feeling away. A glimmer of reflected light showed ahead. Kicking out as her mouth filled with water, she clawed her way toward it. Hands reached down to grip her tunic's hemmed collar and pulled her effortlessly up into air, into light. She lay on hard, cold stone, racked with coughs. An oil wick lantern glowed beside her head. Beyond it, leaning against the wall, were two wood-framed travel packs and bladders swollen with water. You lost my damned knife, didn't you? Hood take you, Bodan. He grunted his laugh, then focused his attention on reeling in the rope. Hiboric's head broke the black surface moments later. Bodin pulled the ex-priest onto the rock shelf. Must be trouble up top, the big man said. Our supplies were brought down here. So, I see. Hiboric sat up, gasping as he recovered his breath. Best you two stay here while I scout, Bodin said. Aye? Off with you, then. As Bodan disappeared up the reach, Felicin sat up. What kind of trouble? Hiboric shrugged. No, she said. You've suspicions? He grimaced. Sawak said, look south. So? So just that, lass. Let's wait for Bodan, shall we? I'm cold. We spared no room for extra clothing, food and water, a few weapons, a fire kit. There's blankets, but best keep them dry. They'll dry out soon enough, she snapped, crawling over to one of the packs. Bodan returned a few minutes later and crouched down beside Hiboric. Shivering under a blanket, Felicin watched the two men. No, Bodan, she said, as he prepared to whisper something to the ex-priest. Loud enough for all of us. The big man glanced at Hipporic, who shrugged. Dossin Pali is thirty leagues away, Bodar said. Yet you can see its glow. Hipporic frowned. Even a firestorm wouldn't be visible at such a distance, Bodar. True enough. And it's no firestorm, it's sorcery, old man. A mage battle. Hood's breath, Hiboric muttered. Some battle. It's come, Bodan growled. What has? Felicin asked. Seven cities has risen, lass. Dreijna. The whirlwinds come. The hog boat was all of thirteen feet in length. Dyker paused a long moment before clambering down into it. Six inches of water sloshed beneath the two flat boards that formed the craft's deck. Rags stoppered a score of minor leaks in the hull, with various degrees of efficacy. The smell of rotting fish was almost overwhelming. Wrapped in his army issue rain cape, Culp had not moved from where he stood on the dock. And what, he asked tonelessly, did you pay for this boat? The historian sighed glancing up at the mage. Can you not repair it? What was your warren again, Culp? Boat repair, the man answered. Very well, Dyker said, climbing back onto the dock. I take your point. To cross the strait, you will need something more seaworthy than this. The man who sold me this craft seems to have exaggerated its qualities. A Harrell's prerogative. Better you had you hired a craft. Dyker grunted. Who could I trust? Now what? 
the historian shrugged. Back to the inn. This requires a new plan. They made their way up the rickety dock and entered the dirt track that passed for the village's main thoroughfare. The fisher shacks on either side displayed a paucity of pride common to small communities in the shadow of a large city. Dusk had fallen, and apart from a pack of three scrawny dogs taking turns rolling on the carcass of a fish, there was no one about. Heavy curtains blotted out most of the light coming from the shacks. The air was hot, an inland wind holding at bay the sea breeze. The village inn stood on stilts, a sprawling single-story structure of bleached wood frame, burlap walls, and thatched roof. Crabs scuttled in the sand beneath it. Opposite the inn was the stone blockhouse of a Malazan Coastal Guard detachment, four sailors from Corn and two marines whose appearance betrayed nothing of their origins. For them, the old national allegiances no longer held any relevance. The new imperial breed, Dyke amused, as he and Culp entered the inn and returned to the table they'd occupied earlier. The Malazan guards were crowded around another, close to the back wall where the burlap had been pulled aside, revealing the tranquil scene of withered grasses, white sand and glittering sea. Dyker envied the soldiers the fresh air that no doubt drifted in to where they sat. They'd yet to approach, but the historian knew it was only a matter of time. In this village, travellers would be rare, and one wearing the field cape of a soldier even rarer. Thus far, however, translating curiosity into action had proved too great an effort. Culp gestured to the barman for a jug of ale, then leaned close to Dyker. There's going to be questions. Soon. That's one problem. We don't have a boat. That's another. I'm a poor excuse for a sailor. That's a third. All right, all right, the historian hissed. Hood's breath. Let me think in peace. His expression sour, Culp leaned back. Moths danced clumsily between the sputtering lanterns in the room. There were no villagers present, and the lone barman's attention seemed close to obsessive on the Malazan soldiers, holding his thin, dark eyes on them, even as he set down the ale jug in front of Culp. Watching the barman leave, the mage grunted. This night's passing strange, Dyker. Aye. Where is everyone? he thought. The scrape of a chair drew their attention to the ranking Malazan, a corporal by the sigil on his surcoat, who had risen and now approached. Beneath the dull tin sigil was a larger stain, where the surcoat's dye was unweathered. The man had once been a sergeant. To match his frame, the corporal's face was flat and wide, evincing North Canese blood somewhere in his ancestry. His head was shaved, showing razor scars, some still blotted with dried blood. His gaze was fixed on Culp. The mage spoke first. What's your tongue, lest you keep walking backward? The soldier blinked. Backward? Sergeant, then corporal, you bucking for private now? You've been warned. The man seemed unaffected. I see no ranks showing, he growled. Only because you don't know what to look for. Go back to your table, corporal, and leave our business to us. You're a seventh army. He clearly had no intention of returning to his table. A deserter. Culp's wiry brows rose. Corporal, you've just come face to face with the seventh's entire mage cadre. Now back out of my face before I put gills and scales on yours. The corporal's eyes flickered to Dyker, then back to Culp. Wrong, the mage said. I'm the entire cadre. This man's my guest. Gills and scales, huh? The corporal set his wide hands down on the tabletop and leaned close to Culp. I get even a sniff of you, opening a warren. You'll find a knife in your throat. This is my guard post, Magica, and any business you got here is my business. Now, start explaining yourselves before I cut those big ears off your head and add them to my belt, sir. Dyker cleared his throat. 
before this goes any further. Shut your mouth, the corporal snapped, still glaring at Culp. Distant shouting interrupted them. Truth, the corporal bellowed. Go see what's happening outside. A young corn sailor leaped to his feet, checking a newly issued short sword, scabbarded at his hip as he crossed to the door. We are here, Diker told the corporal, to purchase a boat. A startled curse came from just outside, followed by a frantic scrabbling of boots on the rickety inn steps. The recruit, named Truth, tumbled back inside, his face white. An impressive stream of corn dockside curses issued from the youth's mouth, finishing with, Got an armed mob outside, Corporal, and they ain't interested in talking. Saw them split, about ten heading to the Ripeth. The other sailors were on their feet. One addressed the Corporal. They'll torture your Gessler. Then we'll be stuck on this stinking strip of beach. Arms out and form up, Gessler growled. He rose, turning to the other Marine. Front door, Stormy. Find out who's leading that group out there and stick a quarrel between his eyes. We have to save the boat, the sailor's spokesman said. Gessler nodded. That we will, Verid. The marine named Stormy took position at the door, his cocked assault crossbow appearing as if from nowhere. Outside, the shouting had grown louder, closer. The mob was working itself into the courage it needed to rush the inn. The boy Truth stood in the centre of the room, the short sword twitching in his hand, his face red with rage. Calm yourself, lad, Gessler said. His eyes fell to Culp. I'm less likely to cut off your ears if you open a warren now, mage. Dyker asked, You've made enemies in this village, Corporal? The man smiled. This has been coming for some time. Ripeth is fully provisioned. We can get you to Hissar, maybe. We got to get out of this first. Can you use a crossbow? The historian sighed, then nodded. Expect some arrows through the walls, Stormy said from the doorway. Found their leader yet? Aye, and he's keeping his distance. We can't wait. To the back door, everyone. The barman, who had been crouching behind the small counter on one side of the room, now stepped forward, hunched crab-like in expectation of the first flight of arrows through the burlap wall. The tab, Mesla. Many weeks now. Seventy-two jakartas. What's your life worth? Gessler asked, gesturing for truth to join the sailors as they slipped through the break in the rear wall. The barman's eyes went wide, then he ducked his head. Seventy-two Jakartas, Mesler. About right, the corporal nodded. Cool, damp air smelling of moss and wet stone filled the room. Dyker looked at Culp, who mutely shook his head. The historian rose. They've got a mage, corporal. A roar rushed from the street outside and struck the front of the inn like a wave. The wooden frame bowed, the burlap walls bellying. Culp loosed a warning shout, pitching from his chair and rolling across the floor. Wood split, cloth tore. Stormy lunged away from the front, and all at once, everyone left in the room was bolting for the rear exit. The floor lifted under them as the front stilts lost their footing, pitching everyone toward the back wall. Tables and chairs toppled, joining the headlong rush. Screaming, the barman vanished under a rack of wine jugs. Tumbling through the rent, Diker fell through the darkness to land on a heap of dried seaweed. Culp landed on him, all knees and elbows, driving the breath from the historian's lungs. The inn was still rising from the front as the sorcerous wave took hold of all it touched and pushed. Do something, Culp! Diker gasped. In answer, the mage pulled the historian upright, spun him around, then gave him a hard shove. Run! That's what we're going to do! The sorcery ravaging the inn abruptly ceased. Still balanced on its rear stilts, the building pitched back down. Crossbeams snapped. The inn seemed to explode, the wood frame shattering. 
The ceiling collapsed straight down, hitting the floor in a cloud of sand and dust. Stumbling beside Diker as they hurried down to the beach, Stormy grunted. Hood's just paid the barman's tab, eh? The Marine gestured with the crossbow he carried. I'm here to take care of you. Corporal's gone ahead. We're looking at a scrap getting to Ripper's dock. Where's Culp? Diker demanded. It all happened so fast, he was feeling overwhelmed with confusion. He was here beside me. Gone sniffing after that spellcaster is my guess. Who can figure majors, eh? Unless then he's run away. Who knows he ain't showed much so far, eh? They reached the strand. Thirty paces to their left, Gessler and the sailors were closing in on a dozen locals who had taken up positions in front of a narrow dock. A low, sleek patrol craft with a single mast was moored there. To the right, the beach stretched in a gentle curve southward to distant Hissar, a city in flames. Diker staggered to a halt, staring at the ruddy sky above Hissar. Dog's teats, Stormy hissed, following the historian's gaze. Dreidner's come. Guess we won't be taking you to the city after all, eh? Wrong, Diker said. I need to rejoin Coltane. My horse is in the stables. Never mind the damn boat. They're pitching her flanks right now, I bet. Around here people ride camels, eat horses. Forget it. He reached out, but the historian pulled away and began running up the strand, away from Ripeth and the scrap that had now started there. Stormy hesitated, then, growling a curse, set off after Diker. A flash of sorcery ignited the air above the front street, followed by an agonized shriek. Culp, Diker thought, delivering or dying. He stayed on the beach, running parallel to the village, until he judged he was opposite the stables. Then he turned inward, scrabbling through the weeds of the tide line. Stormy moved up beside the historian. I'll just see you safe on your way, eh? My thanks, Diker whispered. Who are you, anyway? Imperial historian. And who are you, Stormy? The man grunted. Nobody. Nobody at all. They slowed as they slipped between the first row of huts, keeping to the shadows. A few paces from the street, the air blurred in front of them, and Culp appeared. His cape was scorched, his face red from a fire flash. Why in Hood's name are you two here? he demanded in a hiss. There's a high mage out prowling around. Hood knows why he's here. Problem is, he knows I'm here, which makes me bad company to be around. I barely squeezed the last one. That scream we heard was yours? Diker asked. Ever had a spell roll onto you? My bones have been rattled damn near out of their sockets. I'll shat my pants, too. But I'm alive. So far, Stormy said, grinning. Thanks for the blessing, Culp muttered. Diker said, we need to. The night blossomed around them a coruscating flame-lit explosion that flung all three men to the ground. The historian's shriek of pain joined two others as the sorcery seemed to claw into his flesh, clutch icy cold around his bones, sending jolts of agony up his limbs. His scream rose higher as the relentless pain reached his brain, blotting out the world in a blood-misted haze that seemed to sizzle behind his eyes. Diker thrashed about and rolled across the ground, but there was no escape. This sorcery was killing him, a horrifyingly personal assault, invading every corner of his being. Then it was gone. He lay unmoving, one cheek pressed against the cool, dusty ground, his body twitching in the aftermath. He had soiled himself. He had pissed himself. His sweat was a bitter stink. A hand clutched the collar of his talaba, Culp's breath gusted hot at his ear as the mage whispered, I slap back. Enough to sting. We need to get to the boat. Gessler's. Go with Stormy, Diker gasped. I'm taking the horses. Are you mad? Biting back a scream, the historian pushed himself to his feet. He staggered as memories of pain rippled through his limbs. 
Go with Stormy, damn you! Go! Culp stared at the man, then his eyes narrowed. Aye, ride as a docile. Might work. Stormy, his face white as death, plucked the mage's sleeve. Gessler won't wait forever. Aye! With a final nod at Diker, the mage joined the marine. They ran hard back down to the beach. Gessler and the sailors were in trouble. Bodies lay sprawled in the churned-up sand around the dock. The first dozen locals and two of the corn sailors. Gessler, flanked by Truth and another sailor, was struggling to hold at bay a newly arrived score of villagers, men and women, who flung themselves forward in a spitting frenzy, using harpoons, mallets, cleavers, some with only their bare hands. The remaining two sailors, both wounded, were on Ripeth, feebly attempting to cast off the lines. Stormy led Culp to within a dozen paces of the mob. Then the Marine crouched, took aim, and fired a quarrel into the press. Someone shrieked. Stormy slung the crossbow over a shoulder and drew a short sword and gutting dagger. Got anything for this, mage? he demanded. Then, without waiting for a reply, he plunged forward, striking the mob on its flank. Villagers reeled. None was killed, but many were horribly maimed as the Marine waded into the press. The dead posed no burden. The wounded did. Gessler now held the dock alone, as Truth was pulling a downed comrade back toward the boat. One of the wounded sailors on Ripeth's deck had stopped moving. Culp hesitated, knowing that whatever sorcery he unleashed would draw down on them the High Mage. The Cardra Mage did not think it likely that he could withstand another attack. All his joints were bleeding inside, swelling the flesh with blood. By the morning, he would not be able to move. If I survive this night, he thought. Even so, more subtle ploys remained. Culp raised his arms, voicing a keening shriek. A wall of fire erupted in front of them, then rolled, tumbling and growing, rushing toward the villagers, who broke, then ran. Culp sent the flame up the beach in pursuit. When it reached the banked sward, it vanished. Stormy whirled. If you could do that... It was nothing, Culp said, joining the men. A wall of... I meant nothing. A hood-blinked illusion, you fool. Now, let's get out of here. They lost Vered twenty spans from the shore, a harpoon head buried deep in his chest, finally gushing the last of his blood onto the slick deck. Gessler unceremoniously rolled the man over the side. Remaining upright in addition to the corporal were the youth, Truth, Stormy, and Culp. Another sailor was slowly losing a battle with a slashed artery in his left thigh and was but minutes from Hood's gate. Everyone, stay quiet, Culp whispered. Show no lights. The high mage is on the beach. Breaths were held, including a pitiless hand clamped down over the dying sailor's mouth until the man's moaning ceased. With barely a storm sail rigged, Ripeth slipped slowly from the shallow bay, her keel parting water with a soft susurration. Loud enough, Culp knew. He opened his warren, threw sounds in random directions, a muted voice here, a creak of wood there. He cast a shroud of gloom over the area, holding the power of his warren back, letting it trickle forth to deceive, not challenge. Sorcery flashed sixty spans to their left, fooled by a throne sound. The gloom swallowed the magic's light. The night fell silent once again. Gessler and others seemed to grasp what Culp was doing. Their eyes held on him, hopeful, with barely checked fear. Truth held the tiller, motionless, not daring to do anything but keep the sail ahead of the soft breeze. It seemed they merely crawled on the water. Sweat dripped from Culp. He was soaked through with the effort of evading the High Mage's questing senses. He could feel those deadly probes, only now realizing that his opponent was a woman, not a man. 
Far to the south, Hissar's harbour was a glowing wall of black-smeared flames. No effort was made to angle toward it, and Culp understood as well as the others that there would be no succour found there. Seven cities had risen in mutiny. And we're at sea, Culp thought. Is there a safe harbour left to us? Gessler said this boat was provisioned, far enough to take us to Arran, through hostile waters at that. A better option would be Falar, but that was over six hundred leagues south of Dossin Pali. Then another thought struck him, even as the questing of the High Mage faded, then finally vanished. Eboric light touch, he thought. The poor bastard's heading for the rendezvous if all's gone as planned, crossing a desert to a lifeless coast. Breathe easy now, the mage said. She's abandoned the hunt. Out of range? Truth asked. No, just lost interest. I guess she has more important matters to attend to, lad. Corporal Gessler. Aye. We need to cross the strait, to the Ototaro coast. What in Hood's name for, mage? Sorry, this time I'm pulling rank. Do as I command. And what if we just push you over the side? Gessler inquired calmly. There's Denrabi out here, feeding along the edge of Saul's shelf. You'd be a tasty morsel. Culp sighed. We go to pick up a high priest of Fena, Corporal. Feed me to a Denrabi, and no one mourns the loss. Anger a high priest, and his foul-tempered god might well cock one red eye in your direction. Are you prepared for that risk? The Corporal leaned back and barked a laugh. Stormy and Truth were grinning as well. Culp scowled. You find this amusing? Stormy leaned over the gunwale and spat into the sea. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand, then said, It seems Fane has already cooked an eye in our direction, mage. We're ball company, of the disbanded First Army. Before Lassine crushed the cult, that is. Now we're just marines attached to a miserable coastal guard. Ain't stopped us from following Fainer, mage, Gessler said. Or even recruiting new followers to the warrior cult, he added, nodding towards Truth. So just point the way. Ototero Coast, you said. Angle her due east, lad, and let's get this sail up and ready the spinnaker for the morning winds. Slowly, Culp sat back. Anyone else need to wash out their leggings? he asked. Wrapped in his talaba, Diker rode from the village. There were figures to either side of the coastal road, featureless in the faint moon's light. The cool desert air seemed to carry in it the residue of a sandstorm, a desiccating haze that parched the throat. Reaching the crossroads, the historian reined in. Southward, the coastal road continued on, down to Hissar. A trader track led west, inland. A quarter mile down this track was encamped an army. There was no order evident. Thousands of tents were haphazardly pitched around a huge central corral shrouded in firelit clouds of dust. Tribal chants drifted across the sands. Along the track, no more than fifty long paces from Dyker's position, a hapless squad of Malazan soldiers writhed on what were locally called sliding beds. Four tall spears, each set upright, their victim set atop the jagged points at the shoulders and upper thighs. Depending on their weight and their strength of will in staying motionless, the impaling and the slow slide down to the ground could take hours. With Hood's blessing, the morrow's sun would hasten the tortured's death. The historian felt his heart grow cold with rage. He could not help them, Dyke knew. It was challenge enough to simply stay alive in a countryside aflame with murderous lust. But there would come a time for retribution. If the gods will it, he thought. Mage fires blossomed vast and, at this distance, silent over Hissar. Was Coltane still alive? Bolt? The seventh? Had Sormo divined what was coming in time? He tapped his heels against his mount's flanks, continued down the coastal road. 
The renegade army's appearance was a shock. It had emerged as if from nowhere, and for all the chaos of the encampment, there were commanders there, filled with bloodthirsty intent and capable of achieving what they planned. This was no haphazard revolt. Culp said a high mage. Who else is out there? Shaikh has had years in which to build her army of the apocalypse, dispatch her agents, plan this night. And all that will follow. We know it was happening. Lassine should have stuck Pormcall's head on a spike long ago. A capable high fist could have crushed this. Dosai Kimaral! Three cloaked shapes rose from the flood track on the inland side of the road. A night of glory, Dyka responded, not slowing as he rode past. Wait, Dasai! The apocalypse waits to embrace you! The figure gestured toward the encampment. I have kin in Hisari Arba, the historian replied. I go to share in the riches of liberation. Dyka reined in suddenly and pulled his horse around. Unless the Seventh has won back the city. Is this the news you have for me? The spokesman laughed. <laughs> ah, they are crushed! Destroyed in their beds, Dosai! Hissar has been freed of the Mesla curse! Then I ride. Dyker kicked the horse forward again. He held his breath as he continued on, but the tribesmen did not call after him. The seventh gone? Does Coltane ride a sliding bed right now? It was hard to believe, yet it might well be true. Clearly the attack had been sudden, backed by high sorcery. With me dragging Culp away, on this night of all nights, who would curse my bones? For all the lives within him, Sormo Enath was still a boy, his flesh hardly steel to such a challenge. He might well have bloodied a few noses among the enemy's mages. To expect or hope for more than that was being unfair. They would have fought hard, every one of them. Hissar's price would have been high. Nonetheless, Diker would have to see for himself. The Imperial Historian could do no less. More, he could ride among the enemy, and that was an extraordinary opportunity. Never mind the risks, he thought. He would gather all the information he could, anticipating an eventual return to the ranks of a Malazan punitive force, where his knowledge could be put to lethal use. In other words, a spy. So much for objectivity, Diker. The image of the Malazan soldiers lining the trader track, dying slowly on the sliding beds, was enough to sear away his detachment. Magic flared in the fishing village half a mile behind him. Diker hesitated, then rode on. Culp was a survivor, and by the look of that coastal guard, he had veterans at his side. The mage had faced powerful sorcery before. What he could not defeat, he could escape. Diker's soldiering days were long past, his presence more of an impediment than an asset. They were better off without him. But what would Culp do now? If there were any survivors among the Seventh, then the Kadra Mage's place was with them. What, then, of Hiboric's fate? Well, I've done what I could for the old, handless bastard. Fain guard you, old man. There were no refugees on the road. It seemed the fanatic call to arms was complete. All had proclaimed themselves soldiers of Drijna. Old women, fisherwives, children and pious grandfathers. Nonetheless, Dyke had been expecting to find Malazans, or at the very least signs of their passage, scenes where their efforts to escape came to a grisly end. Instead, the raised military road stretched bare, ghostly in the moon's silver light. Against the glare of distant Hissar appeared desert cape moths, wheeling and fluttering like flakes of ash as broad across as a splayed hand as they crossed back and forth in front of the historian. They were carrion eaters, and they were heading in the same direction as Dyker, in growing numbers. Within minutes, the night was alive with the silent spectral insects, whirling past the historian on all sides. Dyker struggled against the chill dread rising within him. 
the world's harbingers of death, are many and varied. He frowned, trying to recall where he'd heard those words. Probably from one of the countless dirges to Hood, sung by the priests during the season of rot in Unter, he thought. The first of the city's outlying slums appeared in the fading gloom ahead, a narrow cluster of shacks and huts clinging to the shelf above the beach. Smoke now rode the air, smelling of burning painted wood and scorched cloth, the smell of a city destroyed, the smell of anger and blind hatred. It was all too familiar to Diker, and it made him feel old. Two children raced across the road, ducking between shacks, one voiced a laugh that pealed with madness, too knowing by far to come with one so young. The historian rode past the spot, his skin crawling. He was astonished to feel the fear within him. Afraid of children? Old man, you don't belong here, he thought. The sky was lightening over the strait on his left. The cape moths were plunging into the city ahead, vanishing inside the roiling clouds of smoke. Diker reined in. The coastal road split here, the main track leading straight to become a main thoroughfare of the city. A second road, on the right, skirted the city and led to the Malazan barracks compound. The historian gazed down that road, squinting. Black columns of smoke rose half a mile away above the barracks, the columns bending high up where a desert wind caught hold and pushed them seaward. Butchered in their beds? The possibility suddenly seemed all too real. He rode toward the barracks. On his right, as shadows appeared with the rising sun, the city of Hissar burned. Support beams were giving way, mud brick walls tumbling, cut stone shattering explosively in the blistering heat. Smoke covered the scene with its deathly, bitter shawl. Every now and then a distant scream sounded from the city's heart. It was clear that the mutiny's destructive ferocity had turned on itself. Freedom had been won at the cost of everything. He reached the trampled earth where the trader encampment had once been, where he and the warlock Sormo had witnessed the divination. The camp had been hastily abandoned, possibly only hours earlier. A pack of dogs from the city now rooted through the rubbish left behind. Opposite the grounds, and on the other side of the Faladan Road, rose the fortified wall of the Malazan compound. Diker slowed his mount to a walk, then a halt. Streaks of black scarred the few sections of bleached stone remaining upright. The sorcery that had assailed the wall had breached it in four places that he could see, each one a sundering of stone wide enough to rush a phalanx through. Bodies crowded the breaches, sprawled amidst the tumbled blocks. None wore much in the way of armor, and the weapons Diker saw scattered about ranged from antique pikes to butcher's cleavers. The Seventh had fought hard, meeting their attackers at every breach. In the face of savage sorcery, they'd cut down their attackers by the score. No one had been caught asleep in his bed. The historian felt a trickle of hope seep into his thoughts. He glanced down the road, down to where the nut trees lined the cobbled street. There had been a cavalry sortie of some kind, close to the compound's inner city gate. Two horses lay among dozens of Hisari bodies, but no lancers that he could see. Either they'd been lucky enough to lose no one in the attack, or they'd had the time to retrieve their slain and wounded comrades. There was a hand of organization here, a strong one. Coltane? Bolt? Diker thought. He saw no one living down the length of the street. If battle continued, it had moved on. Diker dismounted and approached one of the breaches in the compound wall. He clambered over the rubble, avoiding the stones slick with blood. Most of the attackers he saw had been killed by quarrels. Many bodies were virtually pincushioned with the stubby arrows. The range had been devastatingly short, the effect lethal. A frenzied, disorganized rush by a mob of ill-equipped Isari stood no chance against such concentrated fire. Diker saw no bodies beyond the ridge of tumbled stone. The compound's training field was empty. 
Bulwarks had been raised here and there to establish murderous crossfire should the defence at the breaches fail. But there was no sign that that had occurred. He stepped down from the ridge of shattered stone. The Malazan headquarters and the barracks had been torched. Dyke now wondered if the Seventh had not done it to themselves. Announcing to all that Coltane had no intention of hiding behind walls, the Seventh and the Wiccans marched out in formation, he thought. How did they fare? He returned to his waiting horse. Back in the saddle he could see more smoke, billowing heavily from the Malazan Estates district. Dawn had brought a strange calm to the air. To see the city so empty of life made it all seem unreal, as if the bodies sprawled in the streets were but scarecrows left over from a harvest festival. The cape moths had found them, however, covering the forms completely, their large wings slowly fanning as they fed. As he rode toward the Malazan estates, he could hear the occasional shout and faint scream in the distance, barking dogs and braying mules. The roar of fires rose and fell like waves clawing a cliff face, carrying gusts of heat down the side streets, hissing and rustling through the litter. Fifty paces from the estates, Dyker found the first scene of true slaughter. The Hisari mutineers had struck the Malazan quarter with sudden ferocity, probably at the same time as the other force had hemmed in the seventh at the compound. The merchant and noble houses had thrown their own private guards forward in frantic defence, but they were too few, and lacking cohesion, had been quickly and savagely cut down. The mob had poured into the district, battering down estate posterns, dragging out into the wide street Malazan families. It was then Dicosaurus' his mount picked a careful path through the bodies that madness had truly arrived. Men had been gutted, their entrails pulled out, wrapped around women, wives and mothers and aunts and sisters, who had been raped before being strangled with the intestinal ropes. The historians saw children with their skulls crushed, babies spitted on tarpu skewers. However, many young daughters had been taken by the attackers as they plunged deeper into the district. If anything, their fates would be more horrific than those visited on their kin. Dyker viewed all he saw with a growing numbness. The terrible agony that had been unleashed here seemed to remain coiled in the air, poised, ready to snatch at his sanity. In self-defense, his soul withdrew deeper, ever deeper. His power to observe remained, however, detached completely from his feelings. The release would come later, the historian well knew, the shaking limbs, the nightmares, the slow scarification of his faith. Expecting to see more of the same, Dyker rode toward the first square in the district. What he saw instead jarred him. The Hisari mutineers had been ambushed in the square and slaughtered by the score. Arrows had been used and then retrieved, but some shattered shafts remained. The historian dismounted to pick one up. Wiccan. He believed he could now piece together what had occurred. The barracks compound had been besieged. Whoever commanded the Hisari had intended to prevent Coltane and his forces from striking out into the city, and, if the sorcery's level was any indication, had sought the complete annihilation of the Malazan army. In this, the commander had clearly failed. The Wiccans had sorted, broken through the encirclement, and had ridden directly to the estates, where they well knew the planned slaughter would have already begun. Too late to prevent the first attack at the district gates, they had altered their route, riding around the mob, and set up an ambush in the square. The Hisari, in their thirst for more blood, had plunged forward, crossing the expanse without the foresight of scouts. The Wiccans had then killed them all. There was no risk of reprisal to prevent them later retrieving their arrow shafts. The killing must have been absolute. Every escape closed off. Then the precise calculated murder of every Hisari in the square. Dyker swung about at the sound of approaching footsteps. A band of mutineers approached from the gates behind him. They were well armed, with pikes in their hands and talwars at their hips. Chain vests glinted from beneath the red talaban they wore. On their heads were the peaked bronze helmets of the city guard. 
terrible slaughter, Tyker wailed, drawing out the Dossai accent. It must be avenged. The sergeant leading the squad eyed the historian warily. You have the dust of the desert upon you, he said. Aye, I have ridden down from the High Mage's forces to the north. A nephew who dwelt in the harbour district. I seek to join him. If he yet lives, old man, you shall find him marching with Relo. We have driven the Mesla from the city, another soldier said. Outnumbered, already sorely wounded and burdened with ten thousand refugees. Silence, Kabura, the sergeant snapped. He narrowed his gaze on Dyker. We go to Relo now. Come with us. All of Hisari shall be blessed in joining in the final slaughter of the Mesla. Conscription, Dyker thought. No wonder there's no one about. They're in the Holy Army, whether they like it or not. The historian nodded. I shall. I have vowed to protect the life of my nephew, you see. The vow to scourge seven cities of the Mesla is greater, the sergeant growled. Dreijna demands your soul, Dossai. The apocalypse has come. Armies gather all across the land, and all must hearken to the call. Last night, I joined in spilling the blood of a Mesla coastal guard. My soul was given to her keeping then, Hisari. Dyker's tone held a warning to the young sergeant. Respect your elders, child, he thought. The man answered the historian with an acknowledging nod. Leading his horse by the reins, Dyker accompanied the squad as they made their way through the estates. Karmist Relo's army, the sergeant explained, was marshalling on the plain to the southwest of the city. Three Odhan tribes were maintaining contact with the hated Mesla, harrying the train of refugees and the too few soldiers trying to protect them. The Mesla were seeking to reach Sialk, another coastal city twenty leagues south of Hisar. What the fools did not know, the man added with a dark grin, was that Sialk had fallen as well, and even now thousands of Mesla nobles and their families were being driven up the north road. The Mesla commander was about to see a doubling of citizens he was sworn to defend. Camus Rilo would then encircle the enemy, his forces outnumbering them seven to one, and complete the slaughter. The battle was expected to take place in three days' time. Dyker made agreeable noises through all this, but his mind was racing. Karmist Rila was a high mage, one believed to have been killed in Raraku over ten years ago, in a clash with Shaikh over who was destined to lead the apocalypse. Instead of killing her rival, it was now apparent that Shaikh had won his loyalty. The hint of murderous rivalry, feuds and personality clashes had served Shaikh well in conveying to the Malazans an impression of internal weaknesses plaguing her cause. All a lie, Dyker thought. We were deceived, and now we are suffering the cost. The Mesler army is as a great beast, the sergeant said as they neared the city's edge. Wounded by countless strikes, Flanks streaming with blood. The beast staggers onward, blind with pain. In three days, Dossai, the beast shall fall. The historian nodded thoughtfully, recalling the seasonal boar hunts in the forests of northern Quantali. A tracker had told him that among the hunters who were killed in such hunts, most met their fate after the boar had taken a fatal wound. An unexpected final lashing out, a murderous lunge that seemed to defy Hood's grip on the beast. Seeing victory only moments away stripped caution from the hunters. Dyker heard something of that overconfidence in the mutineer's words. The beast streamed with blood, but it was not yet dead. The sun climbed the sky as they travelled south. The chamber's floor sagged like a bowl carpeted in thick, felt-like drifts of dust. Almost a third of a league into the hill's stone heart, the rough-cut walls had cracked like glass, fissures reaching down from the vaulted roof. 
In the center of the room lay a fishing boat, resting on one flank, its lone mast's unreached sail hanging like rotted webbing. The dry, hot air had driven the dowels from the joins, and the planks had contracted, splaying beneath the boat's own weight. This is no surprise, Mappo said from the portalway. Icarium's lips quirked slightly. Then he stepped past the trell and approached the craft. Five years, not longer. I can still smell the brine. Do you recognize the design? I curse myself for having taken no interest in such things, Mappo sighed. Truly, I should have anticipated moments like these. What was I thinking? I believe, Ikarium said slowly, resting a hand on the boat's prow. This is what Iskaral Past wished us to find. I thought the quest was for a broom, the Trell muttered. No doubt his broom will turn up of its own accord. It was not the goal of the search we were to value, but the journey. Mappo's eyes narrowed suspiciously on his friend, then his canine showed in an appreciative grin. That is always the way, isn't it? He followed the jag into the chamber. His nostrils flared. I smell no brine. Perhaps I exaggerated. I'll grant you, it does not look like it's been here for centuries. What are we to make of this Icarium? A fishing boat, found in a room deep within a cliff, in a desert thirty leagues from anything bigger than a spring. The high priest sets before us a mystery. Indeed. Do you recognize the style? Alas, I am as ignorant of watercraft and other things of the sea as you, Mappo. I fear we have already failed in Iskaral Pust's expectations. The Trell grunted, watching Ikarian begin examining the boat. There are nets in here, deftly made. A few withered things that might have been fish once. Ah. The jag reached down. Wood clattered. He straightened, faced Mappo, in his hands the high priest's broom. Do we now sweep the chamber? I think our task is to return this to its rightful owner. The boat or the broom? Ikarim's brows rose. Now that is an interesting question, friend. Mappo frowned, then shrugged. If there had been anything clever in his query, it was there purely by chance. He was frustrated. Too long underground, too long inactive, and at the whim of a madman's schemes. It was an effort to bend his mind to this mystery, and indeed he resented the assumption that it was worth doing at all. After a long moment, he sighed. Shadow swept down on this craft and its occupant, plucked them both away, and delivered them here. Was this Pust's own boat? He hardly strikes me as from Fisher bloodlines. I've not heard a single dockside curse pass his lips. No salty metaphors, no barbed catechisms. So, not Iskaral Pust's craft? No, a leaving. Well, either the mule or servant. Mappo nodded. He rubbed his bristled jaw. I'll grant you a mule in a boat dragging nets through shoals might be interesting enough to garner a god's curiosity, sufficient to collect the two for posterity. Ah, but what would be the value without a lake or pond to complete the picture? No, I think we must eliminate the mule. This craft belongs to servant. Recall his adept climbing skills. Recall the horrid soup. That was laundry, Mappo. Precisely my point, Ikarim. You are correct. Servant once plied waters in this boat. Then we are agreed. Aye. Hardly a move up in the world for the poor man. Ikarim shook himself. He raised the broom like a standard. More questions for Iskaral Pust. Shall we begin the return journey, Mappo? Three hours later, the two weary men found the High Priest of Shadow seated at the table in the library. Iskaral Pust was hunched over a deck of dragons. You're late, 
he snapped, not looking up. The deck keens with fierce energy. The world outside is in flux. Your love of ignorance is not worthy of these precipitous times. Attend this field, travellers, or remain lost at your peril. Snorting his disgust, Mappo strode to where the jugs of wine waited on a shelf. It seemed even Akarium had been brought short by the high priest's words, as he dropped the broom clattering on the floor and pulled back a chair opposite Iskaral Past. The frustrated air about the jag did not make likely an afternoon of calm conversation. Mappo poured two cups of wine, then returned to the table. The high priest raised the deck in both hands, closed his eyes, and breathed a silent prayer to Shadow Throne. He began a spiral field, laying the center card first. Obelisk! Iskaral squealed, shifting nervously on his chair. I knew it! Past, present, future! The here, the now, the then, the when! Hood's breath! Mappo breathed. The second card landed, its upper left corner overlapping Obelisk's lower right. The rope! Shadow patron of assassins! Ha ha ha! Subsequent cards followed in swift succession, Iskaral passed announcing their identities as if his audience were ignorant or blind. No pun, the male twin upright, the luck that pushes ill luck, terrible misfortune, miscalculation, poor circumstance. Scepter? Throne? Queen of High House Life? Spinner of High House Death. Soldier of High House Light. Knight of Life, Mason of Dark. A dozen more cards followed. Then the High Priest sat back, his eyes thin to slits, his mouth hanging open. The new will, a resurrection without the passage through Hood's gates. Renewal. He looked up, met Ikarium's eyes. You must begin a journey. Soon. Another quest. The jag asked so quietly that Mappo's hackles rose in alarm. Aye, can you not see, fool? See what? Ikarium whispered. Clearly ignorant that his life hung by a thread, his corral past rose, wildly gesturing at the field of cards. It's right here in front of you, idiot. As clear as my lord of shadow could make it. How have you survived this long? In his frenzy, the high priest snatched to the wispy patches of hair that remained on his head, yanking the tufts this way and that. He was fairly hopping in place. Obelisk! Can't you see? Mason, spinner, scepter, queens and knights, kings and fools! Ikarium moved lightning fast across the table, both hands closing around the high priest's neck, snatching him into the air and dragging him across the tabletop. Iskaral passed, gurgled, his eyes bulging as he kicked feebly. My friend, Mappo warned, fearing he would have to step in and pry Ikarium's hands from his victim's neck before lasting damage was done. The jag threw the man back down, shaken by his own anger. He drew a deep breath. Speak plainly, priest, he said calmly. Iskaral passed writhed for a moment longer on the tabletop, scattering the wooden cards to the floor. Then he stilled. He looked up at Akarium with wide, tear-filled eyes. You must venture forth, he said in a ravaged voice, into the holy desert. Why? 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 Shaikh is dead! We have to assume, Mappo said slowly, that the characteristic of never answering directly is bred into the man, as natural as breathing. They sat in the vestibule the trell had been given as his quarters. Iskaral Pust had vanished only a few minutes after voicing his pronouncement, and of servant, there had been no sign since their return from the cavern housing the fishing boat. Ikarium was nodding. He spoke of a resurrection. It must be considered. 
for this sudden death of Shaikh seems to defy every prophecy. Unless, indeed, the renewal marks a return from Hood's gates. And Iskaral Pust expects us to attend this rebirth? How effortlessly has he ensnared us in his mad web? For myself, I'm glad the witch is dead, and I hope she remains that way. Rebellion is ever bloody. If her death plucks this land back from the brink of mutiny, then to interfere would put us in great peril. You fear the wrath of the gods. I fear being unwittingly used by them, or their servants, Ikarium. Blood and chaos is the wine and meat of the gods, most of them anyway. Especially the ones most eager to meddle in mortal affairs. I will do nothing to achieve their desires. Nor I, friend, the jag said, rising from his chair with a sigh. Nonetheless, I would witness such a resurrection. What deceit has the power to wrest a soul from Hood's clasp? Every ritual of resurrection I have ever heard attempted inevitably resulted in a price beyond reckoning. Even as he relinquishes a soul, Hood ensures he wins in the exchange. Mappo closed his eyes, kneaded his broad, scarred brow. My friend, what are we doing here? he thought. I see your desperation, seeking every path in the hopes of revelation. Could I speak openly to you? I would warn you from the truth. This is an ancient land, he said softly. We cannot guess what powers have been invested in the stone, sand and earth, generation upon generation. He glanced up, suddenly weary. When we wanted the edge of Raraku, Ikarium, I always felt as if I was walking the narrowest strand, in a web stretching to every horizon. The ancient world but sleeps, and I feel its restless shifting more now than ever before. Do not awaken this place, friend, he thought, lest it awaken you. Well, Ikarium said after a long, thoughtful moment, I shall venture out in any case. Will you accompany me, Mapo Trell? His eyes on the heaved pavestones of the floor, Mapo slowly nodded. The wall of sand rose seamlessly into the sky's ochre dome. Somewhere in that fierce, swirling frenzy was the holy desert Raraku. Fiddler, Crocus, and Absalar sat on their lathered mounts at the top of a trail that led down the slope of the hills out onto the desert wastes. A thousand paces into Raraku, and the world simply disappeared. A faint, sibilant roar reached them. Not, Crocus said quietly, your average storm, I assume. His spirits had been low since awakening in the morning to find that Moby had once again disappeared. The creature was discovering its wild instincts, and Fiddler suspected they wouldn't see it again. When I heard mention of the whirlwind, the Daru thief continued after a moment, I assumed it was, well, figurative, a state of being, I suppose. So tell me, do we now look upon the true whirlwind, the wrath of a goddess? How can a rebellion be born in the heart of that? Absalar wondered. It would be a challenge to even open one's eyes in that storm, much less orchestrate a continent-wide uprising. Unless, of course, it's a barrier, and beyond there is calm. Seems likely, Crocus agreed. Fiddler grunted. Then we've no choice. We ride through. Their gruel hunters were less than ten minutes behind them, driving equally exhausted horses. They numbered at least a score, and even considering Absalar's god-given skills and the assortment of Maranth munitions in Fiddler's pack, the option of making a stand against the warriors was not a promising prospect. The sapper glanced at his companions. Sun and wind had burned their faces, leaving white creases at the corners of the eyes. Chapped, peeling, and split lips showed as straight lines, bracketed by deeper lines. Hungry, thirsty weaving in their saddles with exhaustion. 
He was in as bad a shape, he well knew. Worse, given he had not the reserves of youth to draw upon. Mind you, Raraku marked me once before, he thought. Long ago. I know what's out there. The other two seemed instinctively to understand Fiddler's hesitation, waiting with something like respect, even as the sound of thundering horse hooves rolled up the trail at their backs. Absalar finally spoke. I wish to know more of this desert, its power. You shall, Fiddler growled. Wrap up your faces. We go to greet the whirlwind. Like a wing sweeping them into its embrace, the storm closed around them. A savage awareness seemed to ride the spinning sand, reaching relentlessly past the folds of their talaban, a thousand abrasive fingers clawing paths across their skin. Loose cloth and rope ends spiked upward, whipping with urgent rhythm. The roar filled the air, filled their skulls. Raraku had awakened. All that Fiddler had sensed the last time he rode these wastes, sensed as an underlying relentlessness, the spectral promise of nightmares beneath the surface, was now unleashed, exultant with freedom. Heads ducked, the horses plodded onward, buffeted by wayward gusts of sand-filled air. The ground underneath was hard-packed clay and rubble. The once deep cloak of fine white sand had been lifted from the surface, now sang in the air, and with it were stripped away the patient, all-covering sentries. The group dismounted, hooded their mounts' heads, then led them on. Bones appeared underfoot. Rusting lumps of armor, chariot wheels, remnants of horse and camel tack, pieces of leather, the humped foundation stones of wall. What had been a featureless desert now showed its bones, and they crowded the floor in such profusion as to leave Fiddler in awe. He could not take a step without something crunching underfoot. A high stone-lined bank suddenly blocked their way. It was sloped, rising to well above their heads. Fiddler paused for a long moment, then he gathered his mount's reins and led the climb. Scrambling, stumbling against the steep bank, they eventually reached the top and found themselves on a road. The paving stones were exquisitely cut, evenly set, with the thinnest of cracks visible between them. Bemused, Fiddler crouched down, trying to hold his focus as he studied the road's surface, a task made more difficult by the streams of airborne sand racing over the stones. There was no telling its age. While he imagined that even buried beneath the sands there would be signs of wear, he could detect none. Moreover, the engineering showed skill beyond any masonry he had yet seen in seven cities. To his right and left, the road ran spear shaft straight as far as his squinting eyes could see. It stood like a vast breakwater that even this sorcerer's storm could not breach. Crocus leaned close. I thought there were no roads in Raraku, he shouted over the storm's keening wail. The sapper shook his head, at a loss to explain. Do we follow it? Crocus asked. The wind's not as bad up here. As far as Fiddler could judge, the road angled southwestward, deep into the heart of Raraku. To the northeast, it would reach the Panpotsen Hills within ten leagues. In that direction, they would come to the hills perhaps five leagues south of where they had left them. There seemed little value in that. He stared again down the road to his right. The house of Raraku, Fiddler thought. It is said an oasis lies there, where Shaikh and her renegades are encamped. How far to that oasis? Can water be found anywhere in between here and there? Surely a road crossing a desert would be constructed to intersect sources of water. It was madness to think otherwise, and clearly the builders of this road were too skilled to be fools. Tremolor, he thought. If the gods will it, this track will lead us to that legendary gate. Raraku has a heart, Quick Ben said. Tremolor, a house of the Azath. Fiddler mounted the Grawl gelding. We follow the road, he yelled to his companions, gesturing southwestward. 
they voiced no complaints, turning to their mounts. They had bowed to his command, Fiddler realized, because both were lost in this land. They relied on him completely. Hood's breath. They think I know what I'm doing. Should I now tell them that the plan to find Tremolor rests entirely on the faith that the fable place actually exists? And that Quickbend's suppositions are accurate, despite his unwillingness to explain the source of his certainty? Do I tell them we're more likely to die out here than anything else, if not from wasting thirst, than at the hands of Shaikh's fanatical followers? Fid! Crocus cried, pointing up the road. He spun around to see a handful of Grawl warriors ascending the bank, less than fifty paces away. Their hunters had split up into smaller parties, as dismissive of the sorcerer's storm as Fiddler's group had been. A moment later they saw their quarry and voiced faint war cries as they pulled their horses onto the flat top. Do we run? Absalar asked. The Graal had remounted and were now unslinging their lances. Looks like they're not interested in conversation, the sapper muttered. In a louder voice, he said, Leave them to me! You two ride on! What? Again? Crocus slid back down from his horse. What would be the point? Absalar followed suit. She stepped closer to Fiddler, her eyes meeting his. With you dead, what are our chances of surviving this desert? About as bad as with me leading you, Fiddler thought. He fought the temptation to give voice to his thought, simply shrugging in reply as he unlimbered his crossbow. I mean to make this a short engagement, he said, loading a cussa quarrel into the weapon's slot. The Grawl had pulled our mounts into position on the road. Lances lowered, they kicked the horses into motion. Despite himself, Fiddler's heart broke for those Grawl horses, even as he aimed and fired. The quarrel struck the road three paces in front of the charging tribesmen. The detonation was deafening. The blast, a bruised gout of flame that drove back the airborne sand and the wind carrying it, and flung the attackers and their mounts like a god's hand, backward onto the road and off the sides. Blood shot upward to pull sand down like hail. In a moment, the wind swept the flames and smoke away, leaving nothing but twitching bodies. A pointless pursuit, and now pointless deaths, Fiddler thought. I am not Graal. Would the crime of impersonation trigger such a relentless hunt? I wish I could have asked you, warriors. For all that they have twice saved us, Crocus said, those Maranth munitions are horrible, Fiddler. Silent, the sapper loaded another quarrel, slipped a leather thong over the bone trigger to lock it, then slung the heavy weapon over a shoulder. Climbing back into the saddle, he gathered the reins in one hand and regarded his comrades. Stay sharp, he said. We may ride into another party without warning. If we do, try to break through them. He lightly kicked the mare forward. The wind came as laughter to his ears, the sound seemingly stained with pleasure at witnessing senseless violence. It was eager for more. The world wind awakened, Fiddler thought. This goddess is mad, riven with insanity. Who is there that can stop her? Fiddler's slitted eyes stared down the road, the featureless march of stones leading ever leading into an ochre swirling moor, into nothingness. Fiddler growled an oath, pushing away the futility clawing at his thoughts. They would have to find Tremolor before the whirlwind swallowed them whole. The Aptorian was a darker shade thirty paces on Kalam's left, striding with relentless ease through the sand-filled wind. The assassin found himself thankful for the storm. His every clear sighting of his unwanted companion scraped his nerves raw. He had encountered demons before, on battlefields and in war-ravaged streets. Often they had been thrown into the fray by Malazan mages, and so were allies of a sort even as they went about exacting the wills of their masters with apparent indifference to all else. On thankfully rarer occasions, he'd come face to face with a demon unleashed by an enemy. At such times, 
survival was his only concern, and survival meant flight. Demons were flesh and blood, to be sure. He'd seen enough of one's insides once, after it had been blown apart by one of Hedge's cusser quarrels, to retain the unwelcome intimacy of the memory. But only fools would try to face down a demon's cold rage and singularity of purpose. Only two kinds of people die in battle, Fiddler once said. Fools and the unlucky. Trading blows with the demon was both unlucky and foolish. For all that, the Aptorian grated strangely on Kalam's eyes, like an iron blade trying to cut granite. Even to focus too long on the beast was to invite a wave of nausea. There was nothing welcome in Shaikh's gift. Gift, or oh, spy, Kalam thought. She's unleashed the whirlwind, and now the goddess rides her, as certain as possession. That's likely to trim short the wick of gratitude. Besides, even Dreidna would not so readily waste an Aptorian demon on something so mundane as escort. So, friend Apt, I cannot trust you. Over the past few days, he'd tried losing the beast, departing camp silently an hour before dawn, plunging into the thickest twists of spinning wind. Outracing the creature was a hopeless task. It could outpace any earthly animal in both speed and endurance, and for all his efforts, Apt held on to him like a well-heeled hound, although mercifully at a distance. The wind scoured the rock-scabbed hills with a voracious fury, carving into cracks and fissures as if hungering to spring loose every last speck of sand. The smooth, humped domes of bleached limestone lining the ridges on either side of the shallow valley he rode along seemed to age before his eyes, revealing countless wrinkles and scars. He had left the Panpotson Hills behind six days earlier, crossing the seamless border into another saw-backed ridge of hills called the Anibaj. The territory this far south of Raraku was less familiar to him. He'd come close on occasion, following the well-travelled trader tracks skirting the eastern edge of the range. The Anibaj were home to no tribes, although hidden monasteries were rumoured to exist. The whirlwind had rolled out of Raraku the night before, a star-blotting tidal wave of sorcery that left Kalam shaken despite his anticipating its imminent arrival. Dreijna had awakened with a hunger fierce enough to render the assassin appalled. He feared he would come to regret his role, and every sighting of Apt only deepened that fear. The Anibaj were lifeless to Kalam's eyes. He'd seen no sign of habitation, disguised or otherwise. The occasional stronghold ruin hinted at a more crowded past, but that was all. If ascetic monks and nuns hid in these wastelands, the blessing of their deities kept them from mortal eyes. And yet, as he rode hunched on his saddle, the wind pummeling his back, Kalam could not shake the sense that something was trailing him. The awareness had risen within him over the past six hours. A presence was out there, human or beast, beyond the range of his sight, following, somehow clinging to his trail. He knew his and his horse's scent only preceded them, driven south on the wind, and no doubt swiftly tattered apart before it had gone ten paces. Nor did any tracks his horse left last much beyond a few seconds. Unless the hunter's vision was superior to the assassin's, which he did not think likely, so that he was able to stay just beyond Kalam's own range, the only explanation he was left with was, Hood spawned sorcery. The last thing I need, Kalam thought. He glared to the left again, and could make out Apt's vast shape, its strangely mechanical flow as it kept pace with him. The demon showed no alarm. Mind you, how could one tell? But rather than drawing comfort from it, he felt instead a growing unease, a suspicion that the demon's role no longer included protecting him. Abruptly, the wind fell, the roar shifting to the hiss of settling sand. 
Grunting in surprise, Kalam reined in and looked back over his shoulder. The storm's edge was a tumbling stationary wall five paces behind him. Sand rained from it, forming scalloped dunes along a slightly curving edge that ran to the horizon's edge both east and west. Overhead, the sky had lightened to a faintly burnished copper. The sun, hanging an hour above the western horizon, was the color of beaten gold. The assassin walked his horse on another dozen paces, then halted a second time. Apt had not emerged from the storm. A shiver of alarm took hold, and he reached for the crossbow, hanging from its strap on the saddle horn. A jolt of sudden panic took his horse, and the beast shied sideways, head lifted and ears flattened. A strong, spicy smell filled the air. Kalam rolled from the saddle, even as something passed swiftly through the air over him. Relinquishing his grip on the unloaded crossbow, the assassin unsheathed both long knives, even as his right shoulder struck the soft sand, his momentum taking him over and onto his feet in a low crouch. His attacker, a desert wolf of startling mass, had failed in clearing the sidestepping horse and was now scrambling for purchase athwart the saddle, its amber eyes fixed on Kalam. The assassin lunged forward, thrusting with the narrow blade in his right hand. Another wolf struck him from the left, a writhing weight of thick muscle and snapping jaws, taking him to the ground. His left arm was pinned by the beast's weight. Long canines gouged into the metal links covering his shoulders. Rings popped and snapped, the teeth breaking through and pushing hard against his flesh. Kalam reached round and drove the point of his right long knife high into the animal's flank the blade slipping under the spine just four of the wolf's hip. The tightening jaws released his shoulder. Jerking back, the animal kicked to pull away from him. As the assassin struggled to pull the blade free, he felt the edge bite bone. The iron steel bent, then snapped. Howling in pain, the wolf leaped away, back hunched, spinning as if chasing its tail, in an effort to close its jaws on the jutting fragment of blade. Spitting sand, Kalam rolled to his feet. The first wolf had been thrown from its purchase across the saddle by the horse's frenzied bucking. It had then taken a solid kick to the side of the head. The beast stood dazed, half a dozen paces away, blood running from its nose. There were others, somewhere behind the storm wall, their growls, yips and snarls muted by the wind. They battled something, it was obvious. Kalam recalled Shaikh's mention of a divers that had attacked the Aptorian inconclusively some weeks earlier. It seemed the shapeshifter was trying again. The assassin saw his horse bolt away down the trail, southward, bucking as it went. He spun back to the two wolves, only to find them gone, twin spattered paths of blood leading back to the storm. From within the whirlwind, all sounds of battle had ceased. A moment later, Apt lumbered into view. Dark blood streamed from its flanks and dripped from its needle fangs, making the grin of its jawline all the more ghastly. It swung its elongated head and regarded Kalam with its black, knowing eye. Kalam scowled. I risk enough without this damned feud of yours, Apt. The demon clacked its jaws a snake-like tongue darting out to lick the blood from its teeth. He saw it was trembling. Some of the puncture wounds near its neck looked deep. Sighing, the assassin said, Treating you will have to await finding my horse. He reached for the small canteen at his belt. But at the very least I can clean your wounds. He stepped forward. The demon flinched back, head ducking menacingly. Kalam stopped. Perhaps not, then. He frowned. There was something odd about the demon, standing on a low hump of bleached bedrock, its head turned as its slitted nostrils flared to test the air. The assassin's frown deepened. Something, he thought. After a long moment, he sighed, glancing down at the grip of the broken long knife in his right hand. 
He'd carried the match pair for most of his adult life, like a mirror to the twin loyalties within him. Which of the two have I now lost? He thought. He brushed dust from his talaba, collected his crossbow, slinging it over a shoulder, then began the walk southward, down the trail toward the distant basin. Alongside him, and closer now, Apt followed, head sunk low, its single forelimb kicking up puffs of dust that glowed pink in the sun's failing light.